night is calling That's when I come out Crawling up from six feet under Buried underground Don't you try and fool me You can run and hide But I know you'll come running to me Cause I have what you like <laughs>
To there in spirit, Midsummer Scream. To start things off, please welcome your Midsummer Scream founders: Executive Director David Markland, Producer Claire Dunlap, Executive Producer Gary Baker, and Creative Director Rick West. Hey everyone, welcome to Midsummer Scream. There in spirit, our first ever live stream. This is live, entirely live, so things will probably go wrong, and I hope you enjoy it as much as we do. Um, we have a huge day ahead, a lot of things happening. Number one, we miss you guys. We're bummed we can't be with you in person. Uh, but we're, today we're going to be using the day to raise money uh, for a few different charities, United Way's Pandemic Relief Fund, Actors Fund, and the Angelino Campaign. Uh, if you can donate uh, throughout the day, just go to givebutter.com forward slash there in spirit. Um, and that's it for me right now. I'll be back in a second to tell you more about the day. But uh, Claire, what do you have going on? <laughs> I love how you look at me like you can see me. Hey, everybody. So glad you can join us. And um, thank you. Yeah, we miss you for sure. And we're so uh, we're so bummed, but we're also so very happy that we have this opportunity to kind of peek into your living rooms for a day. And I uh, just want to give a big shout out to David for coming up with this plan and uh, all of us uh, hopping on the bandwagon and all our help behind the scenes too. We got Chris Morrill, we got Ian Momi, we got Jackie Credderfield, um, and to our fabulous white bats who are out there, thank you for your support and for the shares and everything. And we miss we you. And despite Halloween happening, uh, the event's not happening. We are still going to have Halloween, no matter what they say. So keep quarantining and uh, let's do it. Gary? Oh, it's my turn. All right, it's here we go. David. Hey guys, uh, really happy you're all here joining us. This is a, a special adventure for us. Normally we would have been at the Long Beach Convention Center August 1st, 2nd. So uh, since this uh, is August 1st and 2nd this weekend, um, really happy to be part of this uh, There in Spirit event. Um, it is uh, the whole idea of this telethon is to support uh, people affected by COVID-19 and there have been so many of us affected in the long run, not only with Halloween, but also with different health issues too. So we want you all to be safe out there. Um, it's really hot today. This is a perfect day to stay in and watch this incredible telethon. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and please donate to it uh, if, if you can. 
So we have a, a whole day of incredible guests and experiences, and um, I will turn it over now to Rick West. Hey, everybody. First and foremost, we really miss you. What a year, right? So uh, here we are, we're not in Long Beach, but we are at our collective spooky places. So uh, thank you, first and foremost, for giving your time and being there with us in spirit today. Um, it's gonna be an exciting day, it's gonna be a fun day and an educational day, and at the end of the day, our community, right? So I'm gonna be back uh, probably every hour or so with some Haunter previews for you because that's what I do. We wanna keep the finger on the pulse of what's going on in the haunt community as Halloween encroaches on us. Um, love you guys so much, and uh, wish I was looking out at a sea of faces and awesome costumes, uh, but I will pretend. And we will see you soon, and uh, stay safe, and uh, buckle up. Here we go. All one right, guys, quick thing. Gonna... Wait, one quick thing. I just want to say we have a quick. <laughs> we have later through the day. We'll be having a few celebrity guests reading off the names of donors that have given at Give Butter. So, if you do want your name read by, say, Christine McConnell or Kimberly J. Brown or Kelly Maroney, then uh, start giving. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Um, so first up, we're going to start off with a video um, that wasn't really supposed to be released, but I, I twisted his arm. Eric Springer put together a video which I think really captures the spirit of what Midsummer Scream is all about, uh, and he allowed us to share it with you guys today. Um, so let's run it. Look around you. We have people here from all walks of life all shapes and sizes, all orientations, all colors, and we're all here because we like to look at the darkness and laugh and have fun. There's, there's nothing else like it in the world. I am Lady Phoenix. I am the Clown Cartel California chapter president. I have a sick obsession with Halloween. It, it, I came out like that at birth. I'm the only one in my family that likes it. We can't understand, um, but it's where I fit in. I, I'm weird. I'm not afraid to admit it, and yet everybody here in this community accepts me for my weirdness, and, and it makes me not so weird. It's a fun opportunity to bring everybody who loves horror and haunt and scary things, uh, put them into one big ass convention center, and um, have two uh, two days of just together. And that's what I love about it. All right, everyone. Thanks to Eric Springer and Sugar Skull Productions for putting that together. Um, we've got a huge day ahead. So much happening. We are going to be traveling around the country. We're going to go to Sleepy Hollow. This hour, we'll be talking with Vera Strange, author of a new line of books called Disney Chills. We're going to visit some furry beasts at Kitten Rescue. Uh, we're going to have an appearance by Halloween Town's Kimberly J. Brown, and we will all travel to Sleepy Hollow, New York. But first up, we have Paranormal Pixie and Buster Balloon. Midsummer Screams Dare and Spirit Livestream. I'm the Paranormal Pixie and welcome to my personal pumpkin patch. You guys are here just in time. I am going to make breakfast. So much fun. Uh, so I originally had all of these ingredients out to teach you guys how to make edible slime and then Mama Pixie called me up and told me that Jello already makes it and it's in two easy steps and I like easy in the morning because coffee's hard. Okay, so all you have to do, madam, Bring out a mixing bowl. All I gotta do is we're gonna put in three scoops of this. One, two, three. A little bit of water. You're gonna fill up another one of these with water. And then all we do is just mix it up with the spoon. So forgive me, I've already actually made a batch. I couldn't resist it this morning. So let's see here. Ooh, yeah. Get all that slime going. There we 
there. What, what are you eating? Slime. Slime? Uh huh. Is it edible? Yeah, tastes like lime. Want some? I'm good. Right. Well, I'm gonna go get Buster. Call see what he's up to. Barry recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet. Out of all the movies on my list, my absolute favorite horror movie is perfectly suited for the spooky season. It's called Halloween. It's a movie about a man who isn't afraid to wear a mask to protect himself, but everyone else around him dies because they aren't wearing masks. It's very timely. Hi, Buster! It's so good Hi, to see you. How are you holding up hey, this little box? <laughs> it's it's well, it's not a lot of space to be honest with you. And with the the COVID thirty five that I've put on, it's an even tighter space because cramped box, and I just keep getting bigger. But 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 it's given me lots of time to dig into my back stock of Halloween cereal. I've got Pennywise this morning. Did it float well? Well, toy between the box. So. Honestly, it's not a very good cereal. It tastes like old clown, and that's not really the breakfast flavor I was looking for. A little bit. Have of you been? Pretty good, pretty good. I moved in the middle of the pandemic, so welcome to my new house. <laughs> it's so pretty and colorful. Right. Welcome uh, to my old apartment. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, today, is our Midsummer Scream There in Spirit live stream. Yay! Yeah. We've been looking forward to doing Midsummer Scream all year long, but we're so sad that we won't get to have our pumpkin patch with all everybody there. Sad. But we've got a lot of fun things coming up to do today. You've got a bunch of things to show us. What are you I showing do. us about today? Um, I've got a swell balloon sculpture and a magic trick and special guest joining us in the pumpkin patch today, Elvira. Ooh. Look, that's actually ah. this is from the cereal I bought last year. That's life size, by the way. She's, she's <clears throat> Sorry, that was that was, that she's not really coming. That was that was me with the toy. That's she's not actually here. But I do have a cool balloon thing that I'm going to show you guys and a magic thing and and then I'll the fun stuff that Connor's going to show. What are you going to show him today, Connor? What are we doing? I've got a science experiment for us to try. I'm going to be making some slime that you can eat. And I got a craft project. And we've got a couple of surprises coming up that not even you and I know about. What? <laughs> Surprise surprises? Those are the best. Fine. I am so excited to see everybody and get to doing all of this. We'll check in with you again later. Bye, guys. Hey folks, Jeff DePaula here from the Disney Coast to Coast podcast. Welcome. Happy Halloween, everybody. I am so excited to be here. And today I have Jennifer Brody joining me, who is the author of a new series of Disney Chills books. Hello, Jennifer. What's going on? Happy Halloween. Hey, Jeff. Happy, happy Halloween in the middle of summer. How are you? Listen, this is this is an annual thing for me, Halloween and summer. So, so I love it. It always starts it's, in the summer. It's the best holiday. Let's just do it all year round. Not only the best holiday, the best day of the year. Hands down, no question. But Jennifer, thank you for joining us today because I got your book right here and I read it. I devoured it. Uh, you got one too. Oh my goodness. Disney chills. Tell me a little bit. I'm still getting used to the backwards camera opposite thing. But uh, tell me about Disney chills. How did this come about? Because this is a new Disney villain book series, right? Yeah, it's a whole new brand and book series that I'm launching in conjunction with Disney. And the idea originally came about when an editor approached me with the idea of how about Disney villains in the contemporary world haunting kids? And I was like, wait, Disney wants to pay me to scare children? Let's go, <laughs> right? And so it just started going back and forth. But the first thing they asked is, who do I want to do if I could choose any Disney villain? And let's be honest, they have the best villains 
hard choice, but Ursula. I had to do Ursula. I was like, yo, let's do some Ursula. She's a sea witch. She's a diva. She lives underwater. She wears makeup. I don't know. How do you do that underwater? So I was like, let's do some Ursula. So started going back and forth on ideas, pitching, breaking the story. And right now the first book just published and I'm about to write the fifth. So there's been a huge um, amount of support from Disney on the, the series. They're very excited. Totally, it's middle grade. It's like goosebumps. And it's just been so fun. We already sold France, Japan. The first three are going audiobook. So it can't get better than that. And they're just such a blast to write. I'm so happy to hear that you actually chose the first one. You chose mm -hmm. Ursula because I got right here just to show you. I'm not even kidding about this. My Little Mermaid VHS <gasps> from way back in 1990. Uh -huh. I can oh remember the day my grandparents gave this to me. Little Mermaid is my favorite. Mm -hmm. Ursula is my favorite Disney villain. And she, like, she ties with Mickey Mouse for me as far as favorite Disney characters. So uh, I'm a real mermaid fan. And I had fan. that. That is a piece of my childhood right there. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Same. I mean, how do you not love? I mean, and there was that great peak of those Disney movies. And everyone's like, Lion King. I'm like, the Lion King. I was like, yo, Little Mermaid. Come on. I don't think it's even <laughs> Little close. Mermaid. It's pretty fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. That's so funny. But, you know, of course, your name is Jennifer Brody. But if you look at the author's name on the cover of this book, it is Vera Strange. So yes. I want to know, who is Vera Strange? What is this? How did this come about? Yeah, it started out with um, this idea that, you know, at this age range of 8 to 12, kids still have this amazing ability to suspend disbelief. And we were like, wouldn't it be fun if they thought, like, this creepy mysterious author named Vera Strange wrote these books for them that were like giving them nightmares. Um, so we kind of went back and forth on what could be the pen name. And there were a lot of iterations and ideas. And I have to say, I'm in love with Vera Strange. It just, it, it helps me almost like have this persona. It's fun to sign as Vera Strange. And I think it helps to delineate and distinguish the series from my other work because I have a bunch of other books that I write um, and kind of gives this brand this like kind of special extra flair because I did write them to be very scary they you know i wrote them pretty hard considering they're for you know middle graders but yeah, i'm a huge horror fan i'm a huge horror buff i'm even got my little alien shirt on today um so yeah you know you wrote them to be scary and i, I just gotta say like when i finished the book i was like wait a second what this is how it yeah. ends because uh because this is not your happily ever after at all which no we I do unhappily ever after chills nothing good happens in disney chills every book is unhappily ever after i am so happy disney let me do that you know because i was writing them i even the scare sequences i was i'm gonna write these just like if they were for adults i've worked on a lot of movies i worked on the texas chainsaw massacre i helped write leatherface's backstory i was like let's rock and roll and i was like it's better for it to be too scary and then they pull it back than to not be scary in the first place because then you're in trouble and I never have gotten a single note on the scares or the endings, except that my editor loves them. She'll just be like, this is creepy. This is so creepy. Um, and every book, uh, you know, I really pay a lot of attention to crafting the endings. Um, I think the Captain Hook book is my favorite so far, but I'm pretty excited on my break for the fifth book. So, yeah, and it's been a collaboration. I've chosen a lot of the villains. Captain Hook, that was all me. He wasn't even on the list, really. But Nice. Yeah. Very cool. I, I also love some of the stuff on the cover here. It says, the dreams that you fear will come true. So we're still playing with that Disney brand of, you know, the dreams that you wish will come true, but now the dreams that you fear will come true. At the title of this is part of your nightmare, of course, part of your world, a very famous song from The Little Mermaid. So, it, you know, it's got the Disney, but it's got the fear, and it kind of plays with that whole... Uh, I know growing up for me, it was Are You Afraid of the Dark and Goosebumps mm, yes. were the things that brought me into that, that horror world. And this whole new book series is going to do that for a whole generation of kids. So I hope I so. It. Let's let's get them addicted because they're the most fun. I always say, if you scare someone, they'll remember you forever. The things that scared <laughs> me as a kid, I will you never forget. It's addictive too. It's such a fun gateway drug. And we think the book is going to be great for also reluctant readers, which are, you know, a lot of times it's younger boys. They're hard to reach. They're hard to get to read. But also we know reading is so important and so beautiful and can open up and lead to whole worlds for them. So we feel really excited about that, especially with kids at home right now, you know, and not having as much stimulation as they usually would in school. Um, we feel like it's a really important time to reach those kids right now. 
Fantastic. And of course, we got Ursula. You mentioned Captain Hook. Who are the other villains yeah. that you can announce? Um, the second book is Dr. Facilier, the shadow man from The Princess and the Frog, who of nice. the newer crop of Disney villains, I think is one of the greatest. Uh, he's a witch doctor. It's a, Every book has a totally different setting, characters, theme. And so for the first book, we're in Triton Bay, which is like the seaside, ta- seaside town for Ursula. And then we go to New Orleans where we're going to meet, you know, a kid and his twin brother and Dr. Facilier and how that comes in. And then Captain Hook again, we shift to like rocky, coastal kind of main area. So gosh, the cover designs are amazing. I mean, Disney has the greatest artists the greatest um i don't know if i can say books four or five i will say they are timed out to go with the live action films that are coming next year so if you know what movies because you know disney's been doing all these new movies so book four goes with one in the spring and book five i knew that as soon as they greenlit the movie i was like i know they're gonna make me do this guy and i'm so up for it so up for it um so that one will go in the summer of next year and i'm really hopeful that like serena valentino i'll get um to do more because it's like there's just all these villains i still want to write that i haven't i haven't done jafar i haven't done maleficent i could list more and more evil queen would be so fun but it's but if you listed the villains like disney has the best yeah, no, I so Disney fans, Disney villain fans, those were some major, major mm-hmm. hints she just dropped. So yes. do, your, do your research if you don't know. Those answers are out there, and you can quickly find out. Uh, You'll find them, and the books are on a very fast release schedule. So Facilier, um, which is, uh, the titles are so, so The, the hook good. one is amazing. That title, oh, Second Star of the Fright. Oh, my gosh. Great. Yeah, and I've always wanted to write a pirate book. I was like, heck yeah. He wasn't even on the list, but I hit Disney back when we we're trying to decide on book three. And I was like, who's popular with this age range? Like, what 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 villains are they into? And he came out of left field because apparently there was a show called Jake and the Neverland Pirates that was very yeah. big f- for that age range. And now they're the range of this book. And so they love Captain Hook. They grew up watching him. I guess he was a big character in the show. And so when they hit me with Hook, I was like, heck yeah, let's do a Captain Hook. And he's fun because he's he's not really a villain. And Peter Pan is kind of the villain. Peter Pan's kind of a dick. You know, it's not like, <laughs> well, think about it. If you call someone Peter Pan, that's not a compliment. If I'm like, you're like a Peter Pan, it's not good to not want to grow up. And I don't know. Hook has his reasons. Why doesn't he have a hand? I don't know. Because Peter Pan pranked him and fed it to a crocodile. He has reasons well, to be upset at these kids. <laughs> right? I've been told I have a Peter Pan complex many times, so I guess I should But yeah, it's take usually it. not a compliment. I was like, when I was, because, you know, I have to get into the headspace of the villains. I was like, yeah, kids are annoying. Like, they're the kids that don't want to grow up, that's not good. And they're always messing with him and, like, taking his stuff. And, like, you know, so Captain Hook to me is very sympathetic. He's got his reasons, you know. I mean, for me, honestly, Tinkerbell's the problem in Peter <gasps> Pan. She's the she, villain, if you ooh, ask me. She's a piece of work, isn't she? I say, yes. Yes, indeed. No, well, she, hey, yeah, she's bold. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to, you want to play some Disney villain games here? Yeah, real let's quickly? do it. We got a few oh, minutes yeah. left, I believe. The mm-hmm. people backstage will let me know when we're running out of time. But so you know the name, the game Password, right? Where you give one word clues and the person's supposed to guess who it is. I got some one word clues here related to Disney villains. You let me know who you think I'm talking about, all right? Oh no, what if I have to call a friend? Go ahead. <laughs> Clue number one, parrot. 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 Oh. Oh my gosh. Is this, um, can you give me more clues? Is this a uh, par- scepter? I don't know. Who is this? Tell me. Snake. Snake. Parrot, it's scepter, not- snake. If Jafar? anybody's playing along at is home, right? Jafar? Home. Jafar? Yes, it's Jafar is correct. Okay. Jafar Thank is correct. you. Eh. All right. It's a you parrot throwing for a minute. I was like, parrot, parrot. Oh, Yago. <laughs> Yago. How can you forget Gilbert Gottfried there? God, he's How the about. How about croquet? Oh, um, this is um, um, Alice in Wonderland. So that'd be the queen. The queen queen. of hearts, or what do we call her? Queen of hearts. Very, very good. There we go. Um, Oh, let's see if you get this one. Bomb. Like a bomb? Bomb. Like a... Like a... Like a... Bomb. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't bomb. Mm-mm, more. <laughs> bomb. Treasure. Treasure. Hmm. I don't know. I'm like stumped. I'm like, what Disney thing has a bomb in it? This should give it away. Crocodile. 
Oh, are we talking Captain Hook now? Captain Hook. Remember he tries to kill Peter with a bomb? Oh my god, I forgot about that. There's because I've seen can, there's cannonballs. There's a whole bunch. He's always trying to shoot him with cannonballs. Oh my That's god. That's true. But you know, he he like sends you know a package with a bomb in it uh, to yeah, to kill right. Peter. Sometimes I forget how dark some of the stuff in the Disney movies. You're like, wow, they really did that. Especially the older stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh well, sure. I mean Cruella Deville. You know, like, I like people are obsessed with John Wick. Like, dude, someone killed one puppy in that. I was like, she wants to kill 101 puppies and make a coat. And Disney's all like, don't let anyone know that puppies were harmed. And I'm like, I don't know. She might be the worst person in the world. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, let's see if you get this next one. Voice. Voice. Oh, are we talking Ursula? We are ta- talking Ursula. The other oh, one uh-huh. where transformation. Where were the other Transformation and Octopus are the Ooh. two other. Clues. Yeah, um, gosh, I, I love Earth. I did you see Mermaid in theaters? I, for me, like Little Mermaid is mm-hmm. the, the first new Disney film I remember seeing in theaters. So it was such a huge influence. Yeah, no, me too. No, I know my whole family took me, and because I'm really old, and I'm like, yo, I totally saw that. I think the first movie I ever saw in theaters actually was Bambi. Oh, re- wow. Talk about dark, right? That's oh, pretty- my. No, and it traumatized me. And I'm from, like, rural Virginia where everyone hunts. And so, and I didn't really understand. And I saw Bambi. I was like, is this what they're doing? <laughs> like, they're killing Bambi's mom? Yeah, no, no. I, I honestly, that, it, I was very upset in the theater. I was really young. And I remember my parents being like, she, she's old enough to see this. And I think I kind of lost it a little bit. That's hilarious. It's a Let rough do- scene. Yeah. Let's see if you get th- this one. Fratricide. So like killing your brother. Yeah, fratricide, killing your brother. Is this Hades? No. How about well, uncle? Uncle. I feel like this is some family stuff. I'm killing. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, who? Wait, which Think movie? Hamlet. Has- Think Hamlet. Hamlet. Yeah, no, this sounds like Hamlet. Which Disney movie was Ham? Like Hamlet? You have to tell me. I don't know. I'm like. Lion. Oh, yeah, 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 Scar. Okay, I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, no, Scar. Yeah, Lion King is Hamlet. No, you're right. That's great. Yeah. Scar. No, I was thinking because, you know, Hades and Zeus got a whole thing and they don't like each other very much. And they're brothers. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. Let me, now I got some trivia questions for you. Just a couple here. I know we've got to go out in a couple minutes. But in the Disney animated version of Peter Pan, since you love Captain Hook so much, we do see P- Captain Hook try to kill Peter with a bomb. But what? Does Captain Hook use in the original J.M. Barry story instead of a bomb? Do you know? Oh, I don't know. I would. I mean, I'm like he used cannonballs and pistols and guns and a sword. I don't know. What did he? I, had, I haven't read the J.M. Barry. Tried to poison. <gasps> Tried to poison Peter. Good call. That That's yeah. so crazy. Yeah. No. No. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in those where you're like, oh my gosh, he really did that. Oh yeah, Hook's cool. <laughs> That's a that's a cool piece of trivia. Now I'll remember that. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I named the main character in the book Barry as a hat tip to J.M. Barry. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. That's you great. gotta do it. You know, he's amazing. Excellent. Um, how about this one? In the French translation of the Disney animated movie 101 Dalmatians, Cruella de Vil is referred to as Cruella Dunfer. D apostrophe E N F E R. Do you know what that translates to? No, I don't know French. What is it? Cruella from hell. Can you believe it? <laughs> well, that's why I say I actually think she is the worst villain and like upsetting to write her, you know, because she's like, she, she's not even that fun. You're just like, you're just so terrible. You make goats. Like you're the devil woman. She's literally Cruella devil, cruel devil. Like she scares me. She actually, of all the villains, like that, like Ursula is fun. I could yeah. hang out with Ursula. I would, I would rock out with Ursula. Ursula's Cruella, like a drag queen diva, right? I she's mean, a drag queen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas like, do you want to hang out with Cruella? Cause I don't. Cruella's actually <laughs> really terrible. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I know. I'm excited to see what they translate everything to when they do the French version of these books. Cause I know the first two are out in October. Excellent. Well, our time is up here. There is so much going on in the live stream today. Folks, go out and get your daily chills. Part of your nightmare, mm-hmm. Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us today. We both got our books. Excellent. And now I'm going to go pop in my Little Mermaid VHS. Pl- uh, let me just go find a VCR player. Or something. Thanks, Jeff. But, you're uh, the best. Thank you so much. And thank thanks you for so much, all the great Jennifer. trivia. Now I want to go thank rewatch you. all the movies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.
Hello, Pumpkin. Hey, Norman Crates. Hello, Pumpkin. Do you ever feel like somebody's watching you? Yeah, I do. I always feel like somebody's watching me. I'm watching you right now. Gross. Quit it. Well, the reason I ask is that happens to be the title of one of my favorite Halloween songs, Rockwell, Somebody's Watching Me. Hey, Deep Cuts, hit it. I always feel like somebody's watching me. Did you know that's Michael Jackson singing the chorus? What? What? Weird. I always thought it was the weekend. The weekend hadn't been spawned yet. By Satan. Well, I just looked it up on Wikipedia, and it says that in January of 1984, it was certified gold and ended up peaking at number two on the Billboard Hot 100. Rockwell and MJ seem like an unlikely duo. Like, how, how do they even know each other? Thanks for asking, Deep Cuts. That's actually a great story. So, it wasn't just one Jackson who sang the chorus. In addition to Michael, his brother Jermaine, also from the Jackson 5, was singing on the song. And guess who Jermaine Jackson was married to? Who, Lil Pumpkin? You guessed it, or maybe you didn't. Jermaine Jackson was married to Hazel, Rockwell's sister. And to up the ante even more, Rockwell's father is Barry Gordy, the legendary Motown Records founder, who also signed the Jackson 5. Nepotism, anyone? Barry Gordy didn't take the song seriously, which peeved Rockwell enough to say, you know what, if I get Michael Jackson on it, I'll force his hand. And Barry said, you know what, son, if you get MJ on it, I'll put it out. So, Rockwell called up Hazel, and the rest was history. I heard neither Jermaine or Michael were credited on the album, even. What? 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 Well, aren't you just an information machine? Doesn't everyone already know this anyways? Either way, I'm still watching you. That's creepy. Yep. Still doing it anyway. Hey, Deep Cuts. Drop that. I always feel like somebody's watching me. Still here. Yep. I can see you. Hey, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for watching. I Walk can't right hear a thing. And I see Renee Harper with Sweet Midnight right now. Where are you at, Renee? I can't hear you. You can't hear me. I can't hear you. Oh, is my mic? I, I think my mic's on. Let's let's figure this out. Just let you know, Renee is she's donated uh, funds from these surprise gift bags that she has on her website. Uh, at sweetmidnight.com that are gonna go towards today's charities. Can you hear me now, Renee? Yes. Now oh, I can perfect. Hear you. So where are you broadcasting from? We are in Montesino, California. Mendocino. 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 Okay, I great. All is I know is the ocean is right there. Right? Let's uh let's go big on uh Renee here so we can get the glorious view of the beach. Oh my here, go. Woo. All right. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. It's it's nice for you to get out. You guys are hailing all the way from Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Very so good. we usually we usually go on this trip right after Midsummer Scream, and we decided we're gonna do the trip anyways. So. Well, good. We well, just uh, stay away from other people, especially in California. I have my mask. Oh, perfect. It's all you need. So, hey, uh, tell us about uh, these gift bags that you're donating today uh, to uh, some of these causes. So, uh, on our website, we have our mystery boxes. And we have three different types of mystery boxes. And from every mystery box somebody purchases, we are donating 10% to uh, the charities. That's great. Well, thank, thanks for doing that. And then you have some uh, products that I think either you made for Midsummer Scream uh, or they're just really cool, and we just wanted you to, you to tell us about them because you always have fun, awesome stuff. Yeah, so uh, this year we released our wrap dresses, which I'm wearing. Hey, Jimmy, you want to back up very carefully so you don't fall over the edge of the world? 
<laughs> and we were going to uh, debut these. Uh, at Midsummer Scream, along with uh, uh, the same, the same uh, dress pattern, different fabric, and there it is. Look at me, there. Yeah. I am. <laughs> Longer hair, and uh, we weren't able to do that, which kind of upset me. But they are available on our website, and we are doing a huge Midsummer Screaming sale right now. Uh, and it's 30% off over 70 products on our website. So hopefully that wow, makes great. up yeah, for some of the revenue we're missing out on by not being at midsummer. You got really some of these uh, coffin purses? Our coffin bags, they are all 30% off right now. And Those are our uh, most popular item. Oh yeah, our, little, our new little sleepy bat pin. I jumped on the pin wagon. <laughs> and, and of meeting. course you have a full lineup of masks yep and once we get back to arizona i will be posting more on our website we just got a whole shipment in right before we left so i'll be getting those on the website asap as soon as i get back home because everybody seems to snatch them up and you know it's no wonder everybody wants to stay safe and stylish so it's a good way to do that that sounds great. Well, thanks for joining us today. And uh, we have the your URL, URL up, sweetmidnight.com. Awesome. Um, and man, we hope, we hope to see you soon in person when things get uh, normal again. Yes, hopefully. hopefully. Yeah, if not, then next July. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. We're going to hop next into our next segment with Norm Gidney. Ooh, fun. All right, with the horror bug. <laughs> Norm, how's it going? Hey, how are you, David? I'm good. I'm good. So far, uh, things haven't gone too sideways on this. Uh, no, life. no, it's been going great. Yeah, but uh, we're we're bummed. Uh, we had so many. I hear we had so many awesome submissions for the Horror Bus Screaming Room this year uh, yeah. that we're like, how can we show these? And so you you were able to like, how were you able to pick some good ones to show today? Well. Uh, we this year was without question the biggest year of submissions film submissions we've had for the screaming room film festival uh the 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 you know the festival focuses on horror shorts so um th this year we had like over 300 submissions just it was ridiculous and and wonderful uh and to pick from all of those uh just samples to share with you guys it was really difficult, but we, we picked about six that uh, I think really capture the, um, the, the mood of the event and uh, the spirit of Halloween. Yeah, and I, I've seen this, this first one, and it's, uh, it's kind of perfect for some Saturday morning cereal eating. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so grab your lucky charms and just uh, get ready for this one. Uh, it's... It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, and we also um, were able to reach out to some of the filmmakers and they sent along their well wishes and their um, their messages too, so. Well, let's yeah. get right to it then and see what they have to say about this one. All right. Hello, thank you for joining me for the There in Spirit Midsummer Scream video presentation. My name is Max Johnson, and I have a very special short film to share with you all today. It is called Wally and His Hideously Malformed Wart. It was created by a group of sleep-deprived college students at the scariest place known to man, an art school. I think it's a very special short film and I'm happy you're here to view it. It was written and directed by... Ah, yes. I'm glad I wrote that one down. I think you are in for a very special treat today. Wally and his hideously malformed ward might just be the last short film you ever see. Maybe 
now. There's a lot of other short films playing, but I think you'll really enjoy this one. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into it, and that was just in the pre-production. I think you'll soon be meeting a very special friend of mine, but I'm not so sure that the two of you will be getting along. Thank you for watching. My name is Max Johnson, and enjoy Wally and his hideously malformed wart. Goodbye. That was hilarious. That was great. Um, hey, uh, so right now I'm going to bring up one of our, what's going on with my hair here? Um, we're going to be bringing up one of our longtime staff members uh, who's been with Midsummer Scream since the very beginning, Jackie Credifield. Um, come on in. How's it going, Jackie? Hello. Hi. My cat does not want me to hold her right now, but uh, oh, yeah. Huh? 
I said, you got to force her to. <laughs> She's good. She's chilling. Well, um, Jackie, you've, you've done a lot with us over the years, but I think the thing uh, I'm most proud of that, that you've been able to wrangle has been bringing in kitten rescue. Yes, it's I, it's my favorite thing. I feel like at this point, there's no midsummer if there's not a black cat lounge around with all the kitties. I might find myself in there multiple times a day. Still working, but you know they so need yeah, to get I mean, in. Yeah, so Kitten Rescue comes in, uh, which is a kitten rescue organization, and they set up the Black Cat Lounge with you. Can you tell people who haven't been there before what the Black Cat Lounge is? The Black Cat Lounge is a room where Kitten Rescue LA, the organization, they come in, they bring their available fosters, and everyone that's that comes, you can visit the room. Hopefully, you'll fall in love with Kitty, and you will adopt that baby. They have a great process, which I'm sure Don can explain a little bit more uh, better than I can. I know that we've done many adoptions that have gone through. There's been others that have been close to it. Um, and there's all sorts of, there's kittens, there's the older kitties, there's some disabled kitties. It's a great time. Well, cool. Yeah, I understand you have Dawn here as a guest. Why don't we bring her in? You talk to her and let her show you what's going on at Kitten Rescue. Sure. Hi, Dawn. Hi, Jackie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, great. I've got uh, fall colors going on in here. We got a little bit of orange, lots of black, little doses of white. So and is this the adoption center? This is the adoption center. It's a little bit tricked out for midsummer. And this guy right here who's eating my hair is Chaplin. Chaplin is a little Chap boy. And he's a tuxedo with a mustache. Over here, this little tiny thing is Alba, his little girl kitty. I don't know if you can see, but Francisco is taking a nap in the cauldron. And I'm going to show you around a little bit. Great. And how is with the with COVID and the pandemic, has anything changed for you guys? How's it going with everything? It has totally changed. We are not allowed to have visitors in here anymore. So what we're doing and is... And so how would it go? Yeah, we're still doing adoptions, but everything is online. So we have a... Uh, a kitten or available animal gallery on our website, which is kittenrescue.org. We have profiles just like online dating. So you can pick out who you like and email the foster parent or me. And we will go ahead with a video chat home check now. So we do those. I was doing those before. I missed you guys. I wish we were all together. Oh, I know. It would be so fun. But this is good. I mean, I feel like we can reach more people this way. Great. And you, I believe you guys are also doing your own little fundraiser right now. I hope that's okay that I shamelessly just plugged that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yes, we are doing our fundraiser. Please check out our Instagram and Facebook pages. It's Kitten Rescue LA. I'm just going to let you watch the kitties play the leaves that we found outside. Yay for July. Oops, no, August. Sorry, August. We're in August. Where are my kitties? Okay, so this one black kitty I have, her name is Fairbanks. She's about four months old. Very cute little girl. Over here we have what I like to call the drawers or the morgue. Oh. <laughs> kitties in them. This is Carlotta. Carlotta is a dilute calico. She looks like mine a little bit. 
And then we have a regular calico right here. This is Quinn. Look up. 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 There was some text in the little There we go. She missed the memo. And let's see. How many cats do you have at the adoption center right now? We're really low right now. I'm down to 11. Okay. Normally we would have about 20. Do you have any other questions for me? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> no. Hi, David. <laughs> I'm hopping in because I just love all of these kittens. So um, just if you can repeat to us, you know, we are, you know, we've got the time and we're home all the time. We need another friend. How would we go about getting a new kitten? Okay. Well, we have tons of kittens. And you would go on our website, kittenrescue.org, and click on the adopt option. Then you would go to uh, available animals, and you will see hundreds of cats and kittens and some dogs. Then okay. you would click, there's a, there are links on every kitten's profile to either email their foster parent directly or to go to our adoption questionnaire. So after the adoption questionnaire, then we would get in touch with you and set up a video chat home check. We would also, while we're home checking you, we would let you check out the kitty and how it's acting in here. And then we do like kind of a swap at the gate. They give us the contracts or electronically sign them, and we put the kitties in their carriers for them so they can go home. Okay, well, that sounds great. I, can, can I get a six-pack of kittens? Absolutely. And there is always a grace period after you adopt in case one of those six is not working out. All so right. No harm, no foul. You just bring the kitty back to us. We would refund your adoption fee. And if you'd like to try another kitty or take a break and wait for a little bit, that's fine too. There's no ding on your record. Well, thanks for joining us and showing off some kittens. Absolutely. I'm so glad to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Bye. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, see another clip from Barry right now. And uh, we'll see you guys in a second. horror movie that you definitely haven't seen yet. Do you like sleeping? Me too! Which is why I love A Nightmare on Elm Street. It stars a wisecracking boiler technician that teaches at a high school, and he teaches kids to believe in their dreams. Hope you like Christmas sweaters! Hey! Um, so I'm going to bring in Claire right now to show off some of the bags we have that are available for people if you would like to grab one with all the money going to uh, our, our charities. Is Claire available right now? Oh, nope. Hi. There you are. How's it going, Claire? Good, good. So, yeah, we have all kinds of fun uh, products that's been donated from various uh, donors, including this uh, fabulous Spooky Elf by Abby Bell. Um, we also have that will come paired with uh, a wonderful Silent Night, Deadly Night CD signed by the composer. Uh, we also, and it'll come in this fancy bag. Isn't this a wonderful bag? These bags were donated by Dark Delicacies, which you can find uh, at darkdells.com. We have various other things too. We have, um, is it, do you want me to keep talking or shall I no, be done? No, no, it's, it, yeah, just a, uh, show we it have another. Got. We have another fabulous book for sale. This uh, vintage Halloween trick, Trick Treats and Traditions. It's this fantastic coffee table book, and I'll do a little show and tell here with all these amazing images. Um, all of these, this is these were donated from Robert and Heine, Heidi Panis. They you can purchase these at our Square store. Um, everything has the value listed, and then we are. Uh, offering everything for below market value in order to encourage sales because all money outside of shipping 
will go to uh, the three different charities that we've chosen equally. Uh, and we have more to show you. We can show you more throughout the day. All right. Well, thanks, Claire. Um, now I'm going to bring in another longtime uh, white bat with Midsummer Scream, Emily Setlick. Hey, hey everybody. Well, let's see here. I'm doing all the controls wrong. Um, Emily. Going well. Good. good, good. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for joining us. Um, for the past few years, uh, you have been our point of contact on the show floor for one of our favorite guests, who is the star of the Halloween Town series. Yes, she is my favorite celebrity at Midsummer Scream, probably my favorite Halloween celebrity of all time. Um, so I'm excited that she's going to be with us today. So let's let's bring her in, uh, Kimberly J. Brown. Hi, guys. How are you guys doing? Kimberly? Good, good. How are you? I'm awesome. I'm so happy to be here today. You guys are doing such a great, just, this was such a great idea. So I'm, uh, I'm happy to come on and say hi. Oh, well, we're so excited to have you here and we wish we could be in person, but I know, know excited, I know. <laughs> excited to get to connect this way. So what Absolutely. have you, what have you been up to since, um, you know, the pandemic started, we're all kind of stuck at home. What have you been, been doing to have fun? I know it's been an interesting time, right? Um, I was supposed to be filming something. And so then we had to push that. So I've just been staying busy with my, my Etsy shop. This is one of the shirts. You guys might recognize this quote from, um, from Halloween town, obviously, but, uh, we have a lot of uh, fun, spooky, um, Halloween themed shirts and, and goodies and paintings and stuff on there. So, with uh, everybody staying at home, it's been nice to continue to connect through the shop and and uh, keep up with fans and everybody through that. And I've also been trying to, you know, uh, further some of my personal goals, playing more guitar, reading more books, you know, trying to use the time uh, productively. But uh, uh, so it's it's been a, um, an interesting summer for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I think everybody's trying to you know, make the most of the time and brush up on some old skills and all that kind of stuff. Um, exactly. Are there any, any particular songs that you've learned on the guitar that you're proud of or you're excited to be able to play now? Oh, that's a good question. I, I kind of cycle through songs. I love the Dixie Chicks. I love um, uh, Maren Morris's Bones, been working on that, um, a little bit of Ed Sheeran. I kind of take on like three or four different songs. James Morrison's another favorite artist of mine. And I kind of cycle through some of the songs and try to get to, um, to memorize them. But uh, it's always a process and, and music is so healing and everything anyway. So I just love, you know, I, I love connecting with that. So it's, uh, I'm just trying to keep up, keep up the, pra keeping up the practice is half the battle. So I'm, I'm trying to be good about that. Well, that's awesome. I'm. I think it's so good to uh, to be able to do something that not only you know works your brain and uh, you know keeps your mental health going as well. So exactly, it's that, very important. Yeah, that's a, a really really good skill to have. So um, we're excited to have you here today because um, you have a list of some names that you are going to. Um, share with us of people who have been donating money to this great cause. They've been um, logging in and um, you're going to share those with us today. I am. So we want to say a big thank you to all of these folks. So here's a list of everybody. Uh, thank you to Susan Duncan, Franco Tay, um, Mary Fogel, Darina Clark, Patricia Hernandez, Shannon McGrew, Jennifer Vasquez, Shelly Riley, Shelly Riley, yes, I did say that twice because she donated twice. Uh, Hallie Smith, James Carter, Julie Herdman, Tanita Burks, Michelle O'Brien, Grant Duvall, Melissa Camacho, John Duarte, Erica Grauman, Michael Libby, Dana Doros, Olga Gallardo, Richard Lau, Sarah Graves, Renee Harper, Samantha Leap and Evan Bogart. I hope I pronounced all of your names correctly, but wanted to say a big thank you for all of your donations. Oh, thank you so much, Kimberly. We're so, 
so glad that you could be here and um, and share those names and just, you know, say hi to everybody in our community that's all missing getting to see you in person. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And I love your uh, I love your very festive uh, um, throw you have behind you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> thank you, Emily. But I'm going to ask uh, Kimberly, uh, we're going to go live to Sleepy Hollow, New York. Kimberly, Ooh. would you like to join? I would love to. All right, uh, let's bring up Danny October. Hey, Danny, how's it going? Hi, how are Hi, you guys Danny. doing? Good, good. Hi, nice to meet you, Kimberly. You too. Uh, yeah, Danny has a, a great bunch of uh, social networking pages to, that, uh, sorry, social networking, you got social accounts and you're an influencer who shows off all sorts of awesome photos of Halloween and most of them are original because you happen to be one of the Halloween meccas, which is Sleepy Hollow. Where are you right now? Uh, so right now behind me is the famous, let me move, Headless Horseman Bridge um, from, you know, Washington Irving's tale, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Pretty much the most famous spot to be in when you come visit Sleepy Hollow. It's very much a must. So I'm hiding underneath some shade right now because it's about 90 degrees outside. Uh, I think we're all ready for that beautiful autumn weather to come in. Um, so sure. I'll walk over here and show you guys a little bit if you'd like to see. Um, so the original bridge, Kimberly, have you ever been to Sleepy Hollow? I have, have you ever visited? No, I have not. This is so cool. <laughs> um, we would love you here. We'd worship you. <laughs> uh, so let me show you. So right here, this is pretty much what remains of the famous Sleepy Hollow Headless Horseman Bridge. So the bridge was from... I'm going to say like the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, and since it was so old, it's since rotted away. So they've erected here this stone bridge. And you can see here, I don't know if you could see the sign, if I'm pointing it right. But it says Sleepy Hollow Bridge erected to the memory of Washington Irving, which is nice. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back here. And we'll walk up a little bit so I can show you the old Dutch church. Um, so we're right here at the sign. Can you see? Here you go. So it's, it's a little loud because there's lots of cars here. Sorry about that. Wow, that's cool. Um, that's great. And uh, when does the when does the Halloween season really kick off for you guys there in Sleepy Hollow? Yeah. Um, yeah. Come October first, we're pretty much. <laughs> Someone's talking. They know you're here, Marnie. <laughs> um, it's pretty much year-long uh, Halloween here. Like you know, every, every you can come here pretty much any month, even if it's really hot. Um, and there's still an October Halloween spirit, which is really really cool. Um, but starting October first, we pretty much celebrate month long. Um, we have the headless horsemen galloping up and down our streets at random times, which is always a thrill for everyone. Uh, we have the Horseman's Hollow. We have the great jack-o'-lantern blaze, um, haunted houses, hay rides. It's just such a wonderful Halloween town in October. It's really amazing. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, Kim, you, yeah, you can you guys before? see the old church behind me? Let's see if I can get it in. There you go. Wow. So that's the old church. Um, and that is where the headless horseman's bones are supposed to rest at night. And he rises from the church grounds nightly to gallop around Sleepy Hollow. So that's the very spot right there. Oh, so spooky. I, I think it's so cool, all, everything the town has done to like preserve that, you know, that oh, yeah. all that fun history and everything. That's, that's really awesome. Yeah, well, thank, cool. thank you. We've Thanks really come us. a long way. Yeah, we've really come a long way. Yeah, and it's, it's really a great cool. town. You should come visit sometime. I'd show you around. That would be awesome, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Kimberly, thanks for joining us. Danny, thanks for thank bringing you. us all the way to Sleepy Hollow. Oh, thank you so much for joining. Yeah, absolutely. And right now, we're going to be uh, starting the first of our haunt previews of people seeing what we're doing here in Southern California over the season. Okay, so, it was uh, so nice to meet you guys. Hey, Rick. Looks like we're on. Are we on? <laughs> Looks John. like it. 
How you doing? Man, I was waiting for like a fancy intro and they just like <laughs> sprung it on us, man. <laughs> no, I'm glad I had my coffee. How about you? You too. Yeah, that's, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, everybody, this is John with Spooky Hollows, which is a fantastic uh, home haunt here in Los Angeles in the uh, Sherman Oaks Van Nuys area. And so, John, how are you doing, man? Pretty, we're doing pretty good. I mean, everybody's been kind of just staying home. I mean, I, I'm lucky enough to, to be able to work from home now, so it's not too bad for me. But uh, the rest of our crew is is in various states of having to go into work or do whatever else. And uh, we're just, you know, we're, but everybody's doing good. So we're, we're fine. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, over the years, you guys have done everything from a really elaborate walkthrough. Sometimes you are in the Hall of Shadows at midsummer. And other years you do uh, yard displays, depending on your workload and at the time and all that. What is your plan at this point for this Halloween season? Well, okay, so for this year, we're definitely scaling down again to to a, just a yard display uh, for the, in the front yard. We are going to make it as big as we can. My, my, my neighbor has been pestering me for years to say, hey, this, you can use my whole yard too. So we're going to use a little bit of his front yard for the oh. graveyard and then split the yard, split nice. my yard in half and do the other half with something that looks kind of like the backdrop behind me a little bit. Um, we're gonna, so, cause, cause we had a plan to do a bunch of stuff like, like this in the, for, for midsummer this year. So we're going to, we're going to build it out. So we have it for next year anyway, and we might as well start, you know, we might as well put it out and test it out and kind of get some of the bugs worked out of it. So that's what we're going to do for a, a chunk of the time. So we're, we're, we're kind of continuing the story that we have going on of Mr. Sticky and, the the cabin that you see behind me will kind of be fleshed out in the front yard with maybe some sort of some sort of like fire pit or something that we're going to do and then um one then the other half of the yard will be just the graveyard and then um if i have a chance to do uh like a little bit more of a storyline thing we might kind of have some stuff going through uh some, some stuff going through that kind of thing where we can actually have like different uh keyed off like storyline things kind of like the some of the other attractions that do like a show across the front, you know, so we're, we're going to try to do a little bit more of that if I can too. Right. Yep. That's great, man. That's so. great. Um, <laughs> family safe, everybody good, safe and sound. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's doing well. We're, we're all just staying home and just doing what we can to, to keep this, great. keep this at bay as best we can. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's nice that I don't have to work. I, I don't have great. to work from what, um, from how, many, how many nights are you guys looking at doing your yard display? We are, we're probably going to start setting up in the beginning of September just to kind of get the fencing put out. And then from that point, we're going to keep, add, I'm just going to keep adding more and more things. And then as, as we have time to get stuff put together, but we're officially going to be running probably the last two weeks of October. We'll have everything kind of finished and finalized by then. So we can come by anytime after 7 PM every night and we'll have things up and running and, and you can, you can see the show. But up until then, it'll just be decorations Fantastic, out and man. You know, stuff like that. Yep. 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 No problem. That's great. So in the weeks <laughs> ahead, just so everybody knows, uh, we're going to be keeping in touch with all of our haunters and keep updating everybody as to what's going on. Because obviously the world is a moving target at this point. And so we want to keep people um, entertained and, and keyed in to what's going on here in SoCal. And so we'll definitely be talking to you again and keep everybody safe. Much love to the family. And uh, we will talk to you very soon, John. Thank you very right. much, man. All right, thank you, Rick. See you later. teach you how to make one of my favorite new projects sparkle monsters what? super exciting it's gonna be really fun basically we are taking our figures from this a little, little, little boring to all the sparkle all the time all the fun oh yeah 
All right, it's a super easy project. You only need a couple of things. So first we are going to need some paintbrushes, glitter, obviously, and then glue. Any kind of glue works. If you're going to use like an Elmer's glue, I would recommend mixing it with just a little bit of water. I am going to use Mod Podge. It is my favorite craft thing of all time. So Mod Podge, some glitter, and then the last but definitely not least, you are going to want some kind of container to catch your glitter in. And to also cover the surface with stuff that you're going to throw away. I'm using craft paper, you can use probably newspaper, I would recommend. So, super easy, we are going to pick out our figure. I am going to go with Bruce here because he's adorable and he's easy to show up. So, I'll open up my Mod Podge, take my little shark, and so you're going to carefully paint wherever you want the glitter to stick. You can go in tiny pieces, you can go in giant chunks. I'm pretty lazy so I tend to like to go in giant chunks. And then when you are all set, you're going to pick up the glitter color that you want. I am going with orange because, come on, I gotta go with orange. So, nice and easy, you're just going to open the top of your glitter and carefully coat over the top of our little sharky. And then give it a little tap, tap, tap. Get all the extra off. You might notice that sometimes they get a little, like he's got some uh, glitter stuck in his eye. Just use your dry brush, brush all of the extra off, and then Keep doing that, just applying and doing all of that until you built up the sparkle that you want and then seal it in there. That way the glitter doesn't go anywhere else ever again. I usually just use another coat or two in the Mod Podge. But when you are all done, here you can see I finished, I finished a little Bruce earlier today. Fish are friends, not food. All right, I can't wait to see what creations you guys come up with. Don't worry if I went over this a little bit too quickly. We will be posting this video online for you to see anytime you want. Thank you. Have a good day. Hey, um, this is David Marklin again. Um, coming up right now, we have Ivotri Littles. She's going to be interviewing David J. Skull. How's it going, Ivotri? Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> good. Good. Um, I'm uh, really excited to have you on Horror Movies and Beyond as part of Midsummer Screams. Very cool. And right now we're going to bring in David J. Skull and let you guys get to it. Okay, then. Thank you. <clears throat> Holy moly. I don't think we have David on right now. So uh, well, let's... Let's, I think uh, he said he was having some minor trouble. He's trying oh. to, like he just, <laughs> so That's he was funny. trying to, to, to fix it. And, and I told him to let you guys know, like it, he said it was working fine and then. Hey, it happens. It, so tell, yeah. me, tell me about Horror Movies and Beyond. How long have you been um, doing this, Horror, this show? Well, I started with Nerdtastic Girl. I was doing that for a couple of years, and then I converted it over to strictly horror movies and beyond, which is horror movies and beyond. So I started that uh, probably about almost two years ago, um, coming up with the idea, the concept, and things like that. And I wanted something a little bit more different, where you you learn about the movies, but the fun and the history and things like that. So. Um, I, I, I wanted something to know that the horror movies are here to stay. And if it wasn't for the old school ones, we wouldn't have what we have today. So uh, that's kind of what, what I was going for. And it's working. <laughs> that, that's really cool. Um, well, let's see right here. Are, are we having any luck bringing in David? Uh, Doesn't look like we are. Um, well, why don't you hold on for a little bit? We're okay. going to run another video. I think uh, we could show another one of our fun Lovecraft videos with a little bit of horror music history. Um, let, let's see one of those. 
Okay. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back. I'm going to teach you how Hey, Deep Cuts. Hey, Little Pumpkin. Hey, Norman Crates. Hey, Little Pumpkin. The craziest thing happened to me on the way to the graveyard today. I saw a cat nailed to a door. Shut the front door. Was it alive? If it is, I'm hungry. Okay, that's gross. Did you know that that was the original lyric to a mainstream pop mega smash? Huh? Yep, it was originally part of the chorus of Mania by Michael Cimbello from the hit soundtrack Flashdance. I'm a maniac. I'm a maniac. It's actually a funny story. Though the song is most remembered for the 80s aerobic images of Flashdance, it was actually written with something way more gruesome in mind. Cimbello's writing partner, Dennis McCoskey, was actually a huge horror film fan, and he was super inspired by William Lustig's horror film, Maniac, about a serial killer who stalks his victims. The original lyric was, he's a maniac, He's a maniac, that's for sure. He will kill your cat and nail him to the door. Ew! Word on the street is that the song was never even made for Flashdance. Okay, so it was accidentally included on a tape that was sent to Phil Ramone at Paramount. And Phil was producing the Flashdance soundtrack. He didn't like any of the songs on the tape until he heard the last one, Maniac. The part about the cat got cut, but the song stuck. To the front door. What? What? Wikipedia says it was number one on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 charts in 1983. It's always been my favorite tune to weld to in high heels while I'm supporting my modern dance career. Well, here's to an almost Halloween song that should have been. Hey, Deep Cuts, drop that. Barry recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet. We have not. It's summertime, which means it's the perfect time to watch Jaws. It's about three guys who go out into the middle of the ocean, get really drunk, and then illegally kill a great white shark, and then sink their boat. Hope they have insurance. All right, guys, we have uh, David Skull with us in a votary. So we're going to start again and show off this awesome segment on called, we're calling Silver Screams. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I had to switch cameras at the last moment but, uh, let's this was very nicely set up until okay there we are all right <laughs> so today Hold on oh, a okay <laughs> when everything's live <laughs> okay. okay here we are all right, so today we're going to talk about uh, your book that's coming out. But before we talk about the book, I want to talk about you and your accomplishments and things that you've done. Um, I mean, you're a film critic, editor, uh, creative director, producer. I mean, you've written so many fantasy and sci-fi fiction. Um, you have extensive knowledge on Dracula, but you, you cover so many elements throughout your, your career. Um, you've written numerous books. Um, you appeared on several TV, um, several TV specials, uh, including a hundred scariest movie moments, uh, and also history of horror. Um, you've done documentaries and things like that, and you've worked. With In other words, I've been around a long yeah, time. Yeah, you. Um, I, I could go <laughs> on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So we're going to talk about the book and the, like, the break it down. And I really, when I went through it, I really did enjoy it. I mean, the, I love how each segment tells you, you know, the name of the book, how, I mean, the name of the movie and how many minutes it is and the producer director. And 
the whole concept? How did you come up with that? Well, I was approached by Turner Classic Movies. I've uh, been a big fan for a long time. Uh, they knew me and I knew them. And uh, they had a big success with a book about Christmas movies oh, a few yeah. years ago. And um, uh, so much that they uh, are bringing out a sequel. And they said, well, how about Halloween? It is the second biggest uh, you know, retail hol holiday after, after Christmas. And uh, I'm also a Halloween historian, so it seemed like a a uh, a good match. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, and also I I really like how you 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 label who's in it and things like that, and then you it's kind of structured from the earliest film to the to the latest. And why you pick those specific movies? Well, we had uh, many uh, conferences about the selection. Uh, basically, the uh, the overall choice was mine, the shape of it. But we uh, had a lot of back and forth on individual films. Everyone has their favorite. And uh, but we decided to do it chronologically uh, from F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu to mm. Jordan Peele's uh, Get Out. So there's really quite a uh, quite a uh, quite a range there. Yeah, yes, it is. I mean, just the list alone, because, you know, I got the privilege to get a sneak peek of it. And the the visuals and the stills that are in there, some I've never seen before. So I thought uh, that was exciting. I hope so. I, that, <laughs> one of the things I enjoy most about doing these film books is getting to poke around uh, archives and find photos that have rarely, if ever, been, been seen before. And there are several of those in here. And uh, I think people will like them. I mean, we've all seen the same old, same old. And mm. so when something new pops up from uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or, or from Lugosi's Dracula, uh, mm. I, I want to showcase it. I'm sure, <laughs> um, I'm sure my there, discovery with people. Most of these films, you know, because I, I have the list here of what movies is in there. And like some, I've, I've probably seen probably more than half. Few I've, I've never had a chance to, but Knowing that it's in this book is like, okay, I got to see it, definitely. And the in-depth writing, some of the information I was just like, I didn't even know that. I never, and I took film classes and I even was taught any of that. How did you get a hold of that type of information? What research? Well, <laughs> digging into this sort of thing for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> my books, uh, you know, comprehensive though they are, can't uh, use every scrap of information I come up with. Uh, otherwise, it just kind of stops the, you know, the flow of the, of, of, of the narrative. Uh, but in a shorter form format like this, where there are, uh, you know, a few thousand words on each, on each film, um, I was able to, uh, you know, pace it a little differently and get a lot of those, those little uh, nuggets and uh, rarely uh, heard facts uh, about the films, including, uh, you know. Uh, uh, casting choices that never came came to be, uh, what what the critics at the time thought, uh, problems with the censors, uh, it, it goes on and on. But it it's fun. I think people who've uh, enjoyed my books will enjoy the uh, the similar approach. You know, it's uh, you know it's analysis and history and anecdote. Uh, I I think people are what make these movies. Uh, tick and a lot of them are very very colorful uh they don't always behave well on the set or didn't and uh so that's just the the kind of the human wild card that uh, comes in i i i really enjoy sharing that and one one thing that's really amazing about this book is that you can watch it every day in october there's a movie for every day of the week and a, and a runner up. <laughs> yeah. we, we really yes. couldn't, the, the group of us really couldn't decide. So we, uh, in addition to the main, each main listing, every day has a, if you enjoyed this, you may enjoy this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are really 62 films that are, that <laughs> yeah. are, that are talked about. And uh, of course, Turner will be uh, running films mm -hmm. all through the month of uh, October. They don't line up exactly with the book, but they do in, will include uh, many of them. And okay. there'll be some more surprises about uh, Turner's schedule that I'll uh, reveal later. 
Okay, so what can you tell us that uh, these movies will bring to the audience? For maybe someone who's never seen any of these movies or maybe a few and they come across your book, what would they come away with that? Well, I think just the, the, uh, the, the sheer scope and variety of uh, films. I mean, there's no one definition of, of horror that everybody can, you know, can, can agree on. Uh, uh, just like everybody can't agree exactly what a monster is. But uh, we follow the uh, growth of the genre from the uh, German expressionistic films of the 1920s, uh, uh, the Hollywood films that are very, very much influenced by uh, a lot of German talent came to uh, Hollywood in the 30s. And that's one of the reasons uh, we have that wonderful uh, look and style of the uh, uh, original Universal classics, and um, and also I you know I talk about how things in the real world are affecting things that happen in our mm -hmm. uh, in our fantasy land. Uh, you know I I've always felt that uh, from you know, my first books uh, that uh, every big um, social uh, a challenge or uh, a catastrophe or, mm -hmm. or uh, realignment of uh, our social contract leads to identifiable patterns you know in mm -hmm. horror entertainment mm -hmm. uh, we use horror to um, kind of get a grip on real life fears that we don't want to look at too directly but uh, you know with uh, in the guise of a uh, Hollywood monster mm -hmm. we can uh, uh, it's the spoonful of sugar that <laughs> <laughs> Not sugar, yeah. I guess something more bitter than that, but it does make the medicine go down. Yeah, definitely. So we actually talked before, and we're going to talk about three of our favorite movies that are in that book. So um, you picked Frankenstein, 1931 Frankenstein. And why did you pick that one? Why is that one your favorite? Well, it's not, none of them are my, everyone asks me, you know, which ones are my favorite. And, uh, or is this a countdown book? Uh, it's a countdown book in the sense that it's uh, 31 films for 31 days. Mm -hmm. But I tried to choose the uh, the best thing I could. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, uh, all these films are important for the, their own reasons. Uh, Frankenstein is simply the most famous uh, yes, horror yes. movie ever made. It's the most imitated horror movie ever made. And mm -hmm. uh, Karloff's monster is uh, one of the most identifiable screen icons of all time people who've never seen any of the movies know exactly you know who karloff in that uh, wonderful makeup by jack pierce okay, uh, okay they know who he is and basically what he's about and he's, okay. he's thoroughly permanent permeated the, the realms of uh, uh advertising and communications and okay. uh, you don't have to be a film buff to know who Karloff as Frankenstein is. Definitely. And you also choose uh, House on Haunted Hill. Uh, we, we don't have much time to get in depth, but I, you were scared to death as a child <laughs> on a scene in House on Haunted Hill when the lady came in on a skateboard and was like, Ooh. Oh yeah, there's, there's a scene in the, in the, in the yeah. basement. It's, it's a completely corny film. It's a yeah. ridiculous yeah. film. It is one of the most enjoyable mm -hmm. uh, scary movies to ever come out of Hollywood because mm. so much of it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, for this this haunted house party to work, they would need the infrastructure of a major mm -hmm. theme park, you know, to, uh, and uh, the character Vincent Price plays is not quite that rich, yeah. but uh, it, uh, it requires the complete suspension of disbelief Definitely. And if you can really just let all of it go, mm -hmm. all of your uh, objections to uh, uh, the reality of what you're seeing, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And for me, my favorite is The Thing, 1982, John Carpenter's The Thing. I, I love that movie. It scared me to death when I was four years old, when I kind of snuck and watch it, but I was kind of forced to watch it <laughs> by my how, parents. How, who, who my parents, well, I kept trying to sneak and watch it. And then my parents were like, okay, no, you, 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 since you're trying to sneak, you're going to really watch it. So the head, you know, when Norris head went across the floor and, and I, it was terrifying, but it ended up becoming my favorite movie, as you can see. But uh, it, it's definitely one of those, I, I the effects and I just love it. <laughs> 
I could talk well, all day you, about it. I just love you're, it. You're not, you're not alone. Uh, yeah. A lot of people just are absolutely in love with that picture. But uh, yeah. yeah, but I want to say thank you uh, um, for joining us, you know, this afternoon uh, to talk about you. Uh, we're here with film historian and author David J. Skull. Uh, this book, uh, Fright Favorites, ah. <laughs> say that a few times. Um, 31 movies to haunt your Halloween and beyond. Uh, it is released September 1st, right? It, yes, you can yeah. pre order now, but yeah. uh, uh, we'll be doing all kinds of things, uh, especially during the month of October. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have some daily, uh, uh, daily things to look at uh, for each of the uh, 31 days of Halloween. Okay. So thank you so much. This was this was fantastic. And I'm hosting this uh, with talking to him. I will treat little so you can find me horror movies and beyond. And there's my information at the bottom. So definitely look for that book and enjoy all the movies. And if you haven't seen any of them, it, it it's a, it's amazing. And his work is amazing. Look for his books and everything. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Let, let's do this again and get yes, the, we the, do. the set and the lights right, because it was really a beautiful setup. And um, I guess I'll have to perfect it for my next, uh, my next go <laughs> no, around. No worries. This is live. We're all here enjoying and having fun. <laughs> okay. All right. Happy Halloween. Same, same to you. <laughs> Oh, looks like I'm live. They keep doing this to me. The control room is keeping me on my toes. It's Rick, and I'm back with another Haunter preview. Let's see what's going on here. Who are we going to drag in? It looks like we are going live to the valley with the haunt with no name yet. Hi, guys. How are you? Hello. How are you? We're doing good. We're staying safe. We're wow. Staying it looks like you're staying safe and you're staying hot. You're standing outside. We are. We are. We want to kind of give you a preview. Fantastic. Do. And one reason. All why right. We're well. Here, it, yeah. We we a lot of people every year ask us about different elements of the haunt that they think is part of the yard normally, part of the landscaping, hardscaping, yeah. whatever. We just want yeah. to take a quick time and show what the yard is actually pretty plain. <laughs> so the only two things that are here year round. Uh -huh. All right. Are there's the door that everybody loves with the stained glass. Yes, love the door. And the stained glass and is a nice dragon. There's our lamp. I know it's all crooked, but otherwise the yard is very, very basic, <laughs> plain. It's very serene yeah. and very <laughs> unassuming until Halloween rolls around. Yes. That's awesome. Exactly. Um, uh, give the, the, the kids at home may not be familiar with your yard display. Why don't you just give us a quick rundown as to what you do every year for Halloween? For more of a spooky kind of atmosphere, haunted, inhabited by something supernatural potentially, we don't do jump scares. We don't have actors. It's almost kind of like a dark ride, but on your feet. We kind of use a lot of, we have a lot of details, a lot of subtle effects, a lot of things that you have to take your time to look at and discover. Yeah. And we let the mind do the yes. scaring. Small stuff. You may not always catch it, but we've had people that see stuff, they walk on by and then it, it dawns on them that either something was moving or something was happening and they, they come back to it and then they watch and it's kind of more, you know, we, we like for people to think about what's ha the scariness that happens. So that makes it kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I first saw your haunt years ago now, uh, it, it's very reminiscent of Gary Korb's Hallowed Haunting Grounds. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of haunters here in Los Angeles kind of took their cue from that and have kind of carried that toward Tor Lantern, if you will, and uh, have gone forward. And I know that you guys, every, everybody has little nods to Gary and all that. So definitely was an influence on you guys, right? Very atmospheric and haunting and beautiful as opposed to a jump scare situation. Yeah, well, I think we always were going for more of a Halloween experience and a little more tied to the origins of Halloween. 
And so we had been doing this for several years before we ever saw his haunt. And But when I saw it, I remember thinking this is what we were going oh, after. Oh, okay, great. I just kind of feel like, no pun intended, but we were just sort of kindred spirits. Yeah, so, you know, like there's, you know. Yes, we, beautiful, we, yes. We also use a lot of Celtic stuff as well because they're pretty neat. And a lot of our stuff we try to base on actual historic tombstones or locations and stuff like that because I, I still think yeah. a lot of well it really is beautiful know. yeah so we don't have it as a full love what you guys do how many nights are you guys going to be open this year well that we've still been debating it's definitely going to be three so um okay halloween two nights before we are debating about sunday just because Ordinarily, we don't do Sunday if it's the day after Halloween, but it's definitely not a normal world right now. So if people don't have to get up and right. go to school, like actually go to school the next day, you know, that kind of makes it a little bit easier for us to be out here because we're always with it. We don't just let it run and we're not here. We're always with it. Right. 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 Well, it's a beautiful display and everybody should get out there and, and take a look this Halloween. Uh, glad to see you guys. Please stay safe. We miss you. And uh, we're sorry you're not in the Hall of Shadows right now. But we hey, there's always next year. year. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's great. So thank you guys. We will keep in touch with you in the weeks ahead and we'll keep updating everybody as to what's going on there with you. And uh, until then, thank you. And we will see you very soon. Take care, guys. Hey, take thank care. You. Thanks. Barry recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet. Go back to the summer camp with Friday the 13th Part 3. It's about a group of teenagers who help an ill-tempered hockey goalie overcome the loss of his mother. What a lot of grief. We are now going to go all the way to West Mifflin, Pennsylvania, to Kennywood Park uh, to check out a new refurbished dark ride. Uh, from Scarehouse, and taking us through it is from Scarehouse itself, Scott Simmons. How's it going, Scott? Uh, it's going great. It's a little weird, but it's going great. That's pretty cool. We see that we have a theme park open out there, and it looks like people behind you are wearing masks. That's great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, of course, a controversial topic online, but at least here in western Pennsylvania, most of the people I'm seeing, they're, they're wearing masks. They want to come out and have a good time. That's pretty cool. Well, um, so tell me about uh, tell me about this ride. You get you guys uh, refurbished it. Or what what what's the deal? Yeah. So you know, I own Scare House. It's a very elaborate haunted house here in Pittsburgh. But Kennywood is an institution. It is a uh, neighborhood amusement park. It's been around for over a hundred years, and for almost every one of those hundred years, this ride behind me uh, has been in existence. It is a very old school, traditional dark boat ride, like a tunnel of love. And um, this year, Kennywood actually reached out to us uh, because I'd been bugging them, frankly, and said, you know, if you ever decide to re-theme it and take it back to a more traditional, old school, creepy, spooky feel, please give us a call. And they did. And it's been really exciting. All right. Well, give us a ride. Oh, absolutely. Let's, let's go. Can you pick us up some cotton candy while you're there? Yes, absolutely. You'll just eat it in front of you. That'd be fine. So, re repeat again. When when did this ride originally open? Um, first, first, first built in 1901. Completely rebuilt in 1926. I mean, I don't know my dark history ride that well, but that sounds like it might be the longest running dark ride. It it is. It is. Um, so uh, here we are going on to the old mill again. Almost a hundred year old ride. One of my Again, I am not an employee of Kennywood. I'm just a huge fan of this ride that was lucky enough to get booked with my team to do the work. But one of the things I love about this ride is when I say it's old school, uh, the mechanics of this ride, it is literally that paddle wheel and gravity. It is, uh, you know, there are no mechanics. There are no tracks. It is just literally, there's a big giant pinwheel going pinwheel whatever you call that and then you sit in your boat and gravity does the rest all right and have you ever done a uh, something like this a project like this before not for a dark ride no i mean we have been scarehouse has been around since 1999 
and we've done a lot of very uh, elaborate theming and design and that kind of thing. So we've done some other things like escape rooms and stuff, but an actual dark ride attraction, absolutely not. And what a thrill it's been for us to do it. Right. So um, I don't want to talk, you know, I don't want to spoil the talk too much, but, you know, one, so our story follows this character named Harold, and it's all very old school, um, skeletons, spooky stuff. But for this, our hero is a guy called Harold, and you'll be able to recognize him in every scene because he's got piercing blue eyes. Very much modeled on Paul Newman from uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Okay. Rear screen projection. Uh, yes, very. Again, that is probably the most high tech part of this ride. What we just went through. <laughs> we, uh, you know, it's not only designed to be a tribute to the old school feel, but we used the old school techniques when we did it. Uh, you can see it's very much like the color scheme is neon, very simple pneumatics, and stick. And you know, this moments of darkness. You know, it was a tunnel of love, and it's not quite as dark as it used to be, but it's designed to have these little moments of uh, darkness where canoodling is encouraged. They should be paying attention. Now for put a little bit more light on. Now for you guys, some of this just looks like okay, this is old, you know, again, very sort of old school style dark ride stuff, but by design, this ride actually has quite a few references to uh, Pittsburgh, to some previous dark rides uh, here at Kennywood. And darkness, which is, I know, not particularly photogenic. Those are the parts where you do the canoe. Though. Yes, exactly. There's like a, a real, uh, I feel like there's a sort of a tradition of creepy Western scenes involving skeletons. It's all, you know, I, I think of Knott's Berry Farm, of course. It's always been one of my favorite old school genres. <laughs> of course, some, some dad level jokes. So, of course, our character, and I know it's hard here to watch this on video, he uh, took a skunk, and this is, of course, a stink up. Stink up. How much would you say you guys added to this versus I'm sorry, what was that? What, what, what percentage do you think you guys did overlay versus free tool? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did not get any of that. That's okay. I think that must be hard to hear inside of this one. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure, you know, everyone, you know, when you watch. This is a relatively low impact, slow moving boat ride, but it's still, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming at you here. Oh, no, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, again, very fun is the mood we're going for. Like, that is some, you know, this is not Rise of the Resistance by any stretch. It is designed to have that kind of old school feel. Uh, but yeah, so we have. Again, I know it's hard watching him like this on the video, but we have followed Harold on his adventure. And uh, he started out, he got very stylish. He hitched a ride on a train. He caught a skunk. He had a stink up. He partied a little too hard, ended up in jail. And But 
sort of a riff. I mean, that that jail scene is a riff on a classic jail scene that existed on this ride back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the idea of a character uh, trying to sneak his way out of jail, basically, by, uh, you know, the guard is asleep and he's going to try and sneak out his, uh, get the key when no one's paying any attention. Mm. No, and every Disney fan is going to have the same joke. Yes. I'm not even going to say it. Well, Scott, that is really cool. Um, and this this just opened this week? Uh, very recently. You know, of course, Kennywood, like a lot of other parks, they were uh, planning to open earlier this summer. But, you know, that pesky pandemic keeps getting in the way. Very good. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, thanks for uh, bringing us all the way to the Pittsburgh area. Absolutely. Thank you, Park. guys. And um, I know there's a lot of awesome Halloween attractions in the years in the Pittsburgh area. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we are. Uh, we, uh, Western Pennsylvania has a long history, and I think it's Kennywood is part of that. Uh, haunted houses, dark rides, and scare house is very much part of that. That's very cool. And then again, we can find you at scarehouse.com or on Instagram at scarehouse. Yep. And awesome. Well, we will uh, hopefully chat with you again soon on one of our future live streams. And, that would um, be great. All right. Well, thanks for having us, Scott. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Screaming Room. Uh, for those of you who don't know what The Screaming Room is, it is a two-day horror film festival that runs during Midsummer Scream. And uh, in lieu of that, and for this telethon, we've decided to pick some of the best shorts uh, to play throughout the day that have been submitted uh, for this coming year. So, uh, and maybe a few extra surprises as well. Uh, this time around, we have something called Portrait of a Lady from uh, director Robert Wang, Robin Wang, excuse me. And um, it makes an amazing case for uh, skipping your your fruits and vegetables uh, for candy. I'm just I'm just saying, Halloween candy maybe. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, let's check out this this tasty little horror film. Hi, my name is Robin Wong, and I am a MFA student at USC uh, School of Cinematic Arts. I'm very excited that my film Portrait of a Lady will be screened as part of this year Midsummer Screams virtual event, uh, Dirty Spirit. Um, and this film was actually my first film at USC. It was made under a class assignment that basically asked you um, to make a five minute non-dialogue film, and you basically have to do everything by, by yourself. Um, so um, given that assignment, I just came up with the idea of uh, making a basically um, one person um, horror film. And, um, but basically this film is a Me Too inspired horror comedy um, that explores um, the unexpected consequences of lust. So I want to make uh, first and foremost a horror film that entertains and not just scares, but also sometimes makes a laugh. Um, but also through the ridiculous uh, the ridiculousness of the situation, um, I want to uh, make a point. Um, I want the film to have something about uh, something to say about our current social political climate, uh, especially the sex culture of our society. Um, so I hope you enjoy the movie, and um, if, and if you enjoy it or, or would like to connect with me, uh, uh, please feel free to send me an email at uh, wang uh, zach at usc dot edu.
When we first saw you, what a lovely sight to see. Looking at your face, it was then we knew the meaning and feeling of love. We thanked God that day, many times it's true. Then we held you in our arms with a fond embrace. It was then we knew the meaning and feeling of love. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. We are now going to go live to Hollywood Forever Cemetery where we have Carrie Bible joining us. Carrie is the resident tour guide over there at Hollywood Forever. How are you doing, Carrie? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you? Doing great, great. What's uh, happening over there in the cemetery? Well, I just finished a tour. It's pretty hot outside now, so I'm about to go get some uh, ice water and some lunch. But it's a really beautiful day out here. There's tons of flowers, animals everywhere, a nice breeze. It's uh, really beautiful. That's great. Is that? It's. It seems like a cemetery would probably be a decent place to go for a walk that's socially distant. Um, it really is. It's kind of a, an, a hidden treasure because I don't think a lot of people really think, besides people like me, to go walking around in a cemetery. But they're peaceful, they're beautiful, and as long as everybody's polite and respectful to others who are grieving, they're wonderful places to go and soak up nature, peace and quiet, and of course, history too. Very cool. And uh, if people want to take a tour with you, uh, what are they gonna what are they gonna find out and learn? Uh, they can find out more at uh, cemeterytour.com is my official website. And um, I do tours most Saturdays at 10 in the morning and also uh, by private appointment, too. And wh what are they going to learn about while they're there? Oh, gosh. Well, um, Hollywood history, the cemetery history, a lot of the famous residents at Hollywood Forever, including Rudolph Valentino, Judy Garland, Cecil B. DeMille, Johnny Ramone, um, Tyrone Power, Faye Ray. There's a ton of famous people here that are truly amazing that people can learn about. Will they see any former Hollywood residents disembodied walking around? You know, I have been here uh, 18 years now, over 18 years. I have never had a ghost sighting here at the cemetery of any kind. But oh. I don't think they would haunt a place that had to do with their death or where they're buried. I think it would be like their life, like where they lived, where they worked, something like that. But honestly, though, this place is so darned interesting. I think even without ghost story, it's still a fascinating place. And I think everybody that comes here feels that for sure. Are, are you able to show us any of the headstones or anything uh, from where you are? Oh, gosh. Uh, let me let me walk a little bit. Uh, I know internet over there is a little funky. It can be a little funky. Um, yeah, I was I was a little nervous about how this would go. But let me walk on over to DeMille. And um, so I know uh, Rudolph Valentino is interred there. Uh, what's the story behind the lady in black? Well, there was a woman who um, met Valentino apparently as a child. Her mother was friends with Valentino. She got sick. She was in the hospital. And apparently Valentino paid her a visit. And when he did, he brought her a red rose and said, I know you're going to get better. You're going to outlive me. I just ask that you remember me. And this was her way of making good on that promise. So she showed up every year on the anniversary of Valentino's death for about, off and on, for about 50 years to see him and to leave him a rose. And then other women sort of took up the tradition. I took it up starting in 2002. So every year I wear my, my outfit and I show up as the lady in black. And if other women in black want to show up too, I think that's cool. To me, the more the merrier. It's just a celebration of Valentino's life and legacy. And that to me is a really cool thing. Um, I don't know if you can see it. This is Cecil B. DeMille's crypt right here. Can you see That's, it? Yep, we can see that. 
the sun is so bright, I can't really see what I'm showing you. Well, but. Thanks for keeping us shaded. That's really neat. And then um, is there any, like, what is the, can you think of the creepiest thing you can tell us about the cemetery that our audience of Halloween junkies would like to know? Well, actually, let me walk on over. I wouldn't say it's creepy, but I think it's cool. And that certainly counts for something, right? Oh, yeah, it's bonus points for that. Yeah, hang on. Walk into it right now. I cut across the lawn here. And for anyone who's just checked in, we're live at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Which is a fast walk around. And I think most people I know because of the cemetery street. Well, I've been doing the tour for over 18 years and it's it's a really well reviewed, it's a great walk and a great way to learn more about all this incredible history. And I think you'll enjoy seeing this one. Oh. Vampira. Oh, very cool. See it okay? Yeah, that looks great. The Vampire's yeah, Grave. Huh? It's a Vampire's Grave. Vampire's Grave. And we do have some scream queens here at the cemetery. We have Vampira, of course, the first uh, woman to ever host horror films on television. We have Faye Ray, who, of course, was in a whole cycle of horror films in the early 1930s, including Dr. X, The Vampire Bat, and, and King Kong. Uh, Mystery of the Wax Museum. Mm-hmm. We have Francis Drake, who was in the horror film Mad Love with Peter Lorre. We have director Edgar G. Ulmer, who directed the very famous Bela Lugosi Boris Karloff horror film The Black Cat. That's great. And, well, yeah. Well, thanks, Carrie, for, for letting us uh, come and take a peek at the cemetery. And uh, yeah, sure, if, if you, thank you. And uh, please visit her her site to book a tour sometime soon with the, with a small, manageable, safe group. Yes, and uh, do check it out on Instagram, uh, Cemetery Tour Guide. And thank you so much, David, for arranging this. And, I, and we're going to have you I on. I really look forward to next year when we can all gather again for Midsummer Scream. It's a wonderful Ab convention. Absolutely, we're going to have you on a little bit too, uh, talking with Scott Michaels about uh, a little bit more about the cemetery and other tours you can do in LA. That'd be great. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. All right, I think we're going to be showing. Uh, what are we going to be seeing next? It's a surprise, but uh, let's move on to the next clip. Here we go. <laughs> hey, Deep Cuts. Hey, Little Pumpkin. Hey, Norman Crates. Hey, Little Pumpkin. Are we thrilled to talk about this one? I mean, I don't know. It's definitely a thriller. Let's dig in. What is the story of Thriller? Did you know that the original title of Thriller was Starlight and was written by another iconic songwriter, Rod Temperton? The original chorus went a little something like this. Hit it, Deep Cuts. We need some starlight. Wow, glad they changed it. Starlight? Temperton had a lot of experience working with Michael Jackson. He wrote on his 1979 hit album, Off the Ball, and he knew Michael loved the cinematic. So when he crafted Starlight, he kept that in mind and tried to appeal to Michael's love of film. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I heard that Quincy Jones was actually heading Jackson's production team, and he thought the song could be the title track for the album, but it needed a mysterious edge to fit Michael Jackson's new developing career. Temperton once told the Telegraph that it was Quincy Jones who gave him the assignment 
to come up with the title of the song that would become the title of the album. Temperton wrote two or three hundred titles and went to bed with the title Midnight Man before waking up in the morning with an epiphany. Thriller. He could see it in his head then and there. He could visualize it on the top of the billboard charts and all over merchandise. The word thriller just jumped off the page. Okay, Temperton rewrote the lyrics and knew he wanted to do some sort of spoken word sequence. So Quincy Jones' wife at the time, Peggy Lipton, reached out to her good friend, the one, the only, horror legend Vincent Price, and voila, Temperton wrote lyrics on the way to the studio, and the spoken word was recorded. Special shout out to the icon of icons, Vincent Price, and the greatest Halloween song of all time. Hey, Deep Cuts, drop that. And welcome back, everybody. Thank you for being there with us in spirit today here at Midsummer Scream Online. How are you guys doing? We have a, another haunt to preview and another haunter to preview it with. As soon as he pops in here, we're going to uh, have the discussion. Look, there he is. It's Chris from Scare Ventures, everybody. Trying to represent as best I could today. Dude, that yeah. works for me, man. How are you? I'm doing good, man. How about you? How you guys holding doing, up there? Doing all right. Yeah, we're doing doing all right, brother. Doing all right. So Scare Ventures has been one of the great haunts in our Hall of Shadows. Uh, you guys have been with us since the beginning, and you're always a great addition to the Hall of Shadows. You were going to be there this year with us, and suddenly it didn't happen. But anyway, you are still on track to happen at Halloween. So go ahead and share with all the spooky kids what your plans are, Chris. Yeah, so we started from the beginning uh, when this – first hit i mean it, it obviously hit us all like blindsided us but uh i i came out of the gates running i'm like we got to figure out a way this is our chance to be that guy that can come up with something that nobody else is doing uh we came up with the drive through idea the city wasn't keen with that a lot of safety issues even with the barricades uh we tried to think about how you could park the car it, it, it just didn't work and i've seen some other people are going to try it you know i hope it works but uh, for us and our insurance safety issues, we're not going to proceed with that. And we looked at how our event already is, which is an outdoor venue, like a haunted trail, and it's already in the open air, so we want a bunch of ceilings. And I think with that, it'll keep the airflow going. So we have a lot of tricks up our sleeves. We're not sharing because we're trying to have our own industry secrets to try to make this first year work. If it happens again next year, you know, I'm more than willing to help with other people and help guide them if it works. But the city right now is on team and on page with us on our ideas so what we're doing is we have six dates that we're going to start with tentatively it's uh friday the 16th saturday the 17th friday the 23rd saturday the 24th friday the 30th and saturday the 31st and what we're going to do is the one thing i will tell you is we will have blocked time windows and you do need to meet your window so um what we're going to have you guys do we're going to try to give out a discount code just for your viewers for our community uh so we've already put that on all our social media platforms so what we need you to do is just Great. comment on one of our posts we put up this afternoon, either on the Haunted Lodge page or my Scare Venture page uh, on Instagram or Facebook. Just comment, drop your name, tag your friends, and we'll try to shoot you over that code. And what we'll do is we're going to give you the priority to uh, lock in those time windows for select dates. So like on a prime night, like on October 31st or the last Saturday, we're going to make sure you guys get that first. Um, hoping everybody comes down from the OC. Uh, we've recruited a lot of actors from the Queen Mary, uh, some other haunts that weren't able to get open this season. Uh, they were like, hey, I want to scare. We want to get out there this year. Please, I'm jonesing. I got to have this. And I'm taking the best of the best. So we are really going to have a nice ensemble cast this year. Dude, that sounds really awesome. And and I know that you guys will bring it. You bring it no matter what you do. Dude, I've known you for so many years now, and every time that you do a, a project like this, you put your heart and soul into it, and it certainly shows. So, dude, thank you so much. We're going to keep in touch with you as well as other haunters in the weeks ahead now as Halloween comes barreling down on us. 
as much as it's going to barrel down this year on us. And we're going to keep everybody posted as to what's going on, because obviously this is an ever-changing climate and we want to keep everybody informed. So we're going to use the Midsummer platform for that. Uh, in the meantime, Chris, much love to you and the gang. Uh, stay safe and stay secure. And we will talk to you very soon, okay? I do want to throw out, we do have a trick or treat yeah. trail that's going to run for four nights. Uh, which will be okay. the 17th, the 24th, and the 31st. And then I think we're going to add one extra night floating in there. Uh, and we Perfect. will add more dates if we fill in these time blocks. So the idea is to sell the event out so we can work backwards and add more dates. So if you guys want to come down, we're going to try to accommodate everyone we can. But we're just going to start with a small schedule first to get that going. So we will figure out a way to hand out candy safely. <laughs> That's awesome. Chris, thank you so much. Love, love, love the Tiki Drum. That's very cool. I'm very jealous right now. <laughs> All right, brother. We will talk to you very soon, man. Stay safe. Mahalo. Mahalo. Hey, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, on there in spirit midsummer scream telethon uh which will bring you up to speed as to what's happening in the next hour uh right now we're going to be starting in a little bit with the polar guys and paramours fashion show one of four sets we're going to be playing those just about once an hour uh we're going to be doing a panel that i'll be hosting uh or not i'll be hosting this one ted doherty will be hosting a panel talking about la spooky places uh, we're going to be going live to Upland to take a peek inside a little shop of hairdos. We have a performance from the Rhythm Coffin, another horror by short film, and then at, towards the end of the hour, we are going to be going live to the Winchester Mystery House. So um, in just a second here, we'll start up Holy Guys some Paramore's Fashion Show. But just a reminder, please, if you're enjoying what you're watching, and even if you're not, please go to givebutter.com forward slash they're in spirit, uh, and we're taking donations that will be given out to a lot of, uh, to, to share with people who are really uh, hurting because of uh, pandemic-related layoffs and other financial impacts. So with that, let's go and uh, look at the Poltergeist and Paramours fashion show. A dead man from a white oak tree. People sitting on porches thinking how things used to be. Dark night. Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for joining us to the virtual festivities of Midsummer Scream. My name is Ava Ziegfeld and I am your ghost hostess with the mostess. I hope you're all staying safe at home wearing your Halloween masks. All day long, you are going to have the delectable treasure of being able to watch four frightful fashion shows by Poltergeist and Paramours, as designed by its CEO and founder, Amalia. We are delighted to have a sneak preview of Sean Keller's upcoming album, Killer Sounds of Halloween 2. So nice he had to do it twice. So stay tuned and enjoy the frightful fashion of poltergeists and paramours. Cheeks! 
and drink your blood till I'm full. I'm gonna eat you up cause I'm a Hey, Ted Doherty, how's it going? Hi, it's great to be here. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, how are you spending your time in quarantine, Ted? Uh, you know, still keeping busy, still working on some uh, spooky stuff, which I think is extremely fitting for uh, today's discussion. Um, I think so, you're cutting out a little bit, but uh, tell me about Road Trip Mysteries. What, you, you just ran a test of a new game, road trip, mobile app. What was that all about? Yeah, well, uh, just for folks who don't know who I am, my name is Ted Doherty, and I am a writer, producer, and director uh, for seasonal events and experiences and attractions. So I've worked uh, creatively uh, with all kinds of different companies, Universal Studios and Hollywood for their Halloween Horror Nights, uh, Not Scary Farm, Queen Mary's Dark Harbor, all kinds of companies. And, and you know, a lot of these experiences are sort of at a, at a, a standstill. They're kind of being impacted right now. And one thing I wanted to uh, do was get something out there now uh, for people to enjoy, get out of the house, uh, take a break and, and out of quarantine in a very safe setting. So how do we do that? And so uh, we did uh, create and launch Road Trip Mysteries uh, about a month ago and, and ran it for about a week for free. And uh, it was simply a, a test to see what the demand was for something like this. And I'm pleased to, to say that it went very well and, and we're working on our next mystery. And, and so uh, what it really is, it's a, a problem solving uh, murder mystery uh, adventure that takes place in uh, the socially distanced uh, comfort of your very own vehicle. And so it combines an audio narrative that uh, you'll listen to in your car stereos, as well as vis visiting like historically relevant and interesting stops while using real world natural outdoor elements that provide clues as to who the murderer might be. And so uh, you really drive around to these uh, cool spots, you get out of the house, you listen to this creepy narration. And at the end, uh, after using some uh, maps and clues, you let us know who you think the murderer might have been. And so our first episode was named the mystery of Simi Knowles, K-N-O-L-L-S. And it told uh, a fictitious story about a string of very bizarre murders that took place up in the Chatsworth and Simi Valley areas here in Southern California. And it led visitors to uh, 
uh, old movie ranches that were used as filming locations, Corriganville Ranch and uh, Iverson Movie Ranch. And these are both not far from Spawn Ranch uh, that was made famous by its inhabitants in the late 60s, uh, the Manson family. And so I wrote an entire uh, interactive fantasy adventure based around these very real uh, locations and these real locations have have rich histories of their own and uh, they made a perfect backdrop for this fictional story and I think that's one of the great things about being here in Southern California and in the Los Angeles area is uh, we have some very fascinating beautiful historic spots that are uh, sometimes connected to some very sinister stories and that's what I'm looking forward to uh, hearing about from our guests today. All right. Yeah, let's get to it. We're going to talk, or you're going to talk to them all about spooky places in L.A. <laughs> Hi, guys. I am here Hello. with... <laughs> here with Scott and Carrie. This is so exciting. Uh, you know, I have not been on either one of your tours, so I'm really looking forward to hearing about them uh, today. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote uh, an entire uh, mystery adventure that was uh, created out of uh, a desire to provide some entertainment, a brief escape uh, for people in the middle of this pandemic. And, and so here to kind of help talk about some of the things that uh, people can do and see here in Southern California uh, uh, is, is Carrie Bible and, and, and Scott Michaels. And so Carrie, I'm gonna start with you because you are connected with and work for Hollywood Forever Cemetery as a tour guide. And, uh, and on a limited basis, I understand it, those tours are still being offered right now in this uh, situation that we're in. And so we're always on the lookout for something fun and exciting uh, to do that's fun and safe, especially if it's on the macabre side of things. So can you talk a little bit about how you got into this whole thing with uh, Hollywood Forever Cemetery? Yeah, um, I was born Halloween night, actually, which is kind of a, I don't know, fate. And when I was about five or six, I saw my first movie on television, which was Dracula, starring Bela Lugosi, and it completely changed my life. It's why I'm sitting here today. And I fell in love with old Hollywood. And I got a degree in film. I moved up here in the year 2000. I saw Hollywood Forever and just fell insanely in love, as I hope everybody does who visits there, and realized they didn't have a tour guide. And I thought, maybe that could be me. So I met with a historian who mentors me. I met with the owner of the cemetery. And I've now been giving tours there uh, several times a month since February of 2002. So I've been there over 18 years. Oh, my gosh. That's incredible. Wow. Okay, so I have been to Hollywood Forever Cemetery one time and just went unaccompanied and just kind of browsed around at all of the uh, the beautiful sites. And so there's this beautiful over there. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what the tour is like? Well, the tour is a, it's really a deep dive into the people that are interred their their lives, their work, their history, a little about the architecture, the history of the cemetery, Los Angeles history. It's not like a horror attraction or anything like that. And I look at it as like it's a celebration of these lives and the um, artistic contributions that these people made that are, are you know, still with us today. Absolutely. Now, for folks who uh, may be unfamiliar with Hollywood Forever Cemetery and, and uh, some of the... Uh, folks that have been buried there. Can you talk a little bit about, or tell us about some of the uh, the, the, the folks that are buried there? Uh, sure, we have a variety of celebrities from past and present. Uh, we have Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney, Rudolph Valentino, director Cecil B. DeMille, uh, Tyrone Power, Marion Davies. Uh, more recent stars would include um, Chris Cornell of Soundgarden and director Tony Scott. And uh, we just have a host of stars. I mean, the tour is actually two and a half hours long. So it's a long walking tour. 
And uh, right now I'm doing the tours, but um, I have to kind of take reservations in advance. I can't do walk-ups right now because I'm trying to keep the group small. And um, everybody has to wear a mask and socially distance themselves. But so far it's been really good and everybody's really played by the rules and it's been great. So I'm really grateful to be back doing what I do. That is so cool. I know I am going to sign up for this. I did not know until this, these tours are, are being uh, offered on, on this reservation basis. So we're, we're sharing the information out to folks right now. So that way uh, people like me can make a reservation and, and uh, sign up for this. That is so cool. Now, uh, has the tour had to been aside from being uh, socially distanced and all that, is the tour being somewhat modified at all because of Well, a little situation? bit in that, um, well, first off, I had to go on pretty much a three month hiatus when the pandemic first hit because oh. it was just so uncertain. The cemetery even shut down except for property owners for like three weeks or so. But um, what I do right now is everybody, as I mentioned, wears the mask and is socially distant. I cap the groups at 10, so no huge groups these days. And also, if people don't feel comfortable going into the mausoleum, I completely understand that. So we actually sit under a tree and talk about the people inside the mausoleum. And so that way, if someone want to go in there, we can go and they'll just be in there a few moments, see the graves and then leave. Or if they don't want to go in the mausoleum, they don't have to. So that's kind of been, I guess, the the big modification. I know, that sounds great, though. That still sounds like a, a wonderful time, and and I I, I can't wait to, to check it out. Now, uh, as I had mentioned earlier before about sort of this that road trip mystery idea about mm -hmm. leading people to these spooky spots and these old movie ranches. Uh, you know, it was a fake story that I was creating around these these existing spots. But Scott, for your tours, you also take guests to spots like these different ranches. But you're telling the horrific truth as to what is sort of wrapped around these places. Uh, before I get into that, how did you get into this whole thing? Okay, I, well, I've been interested in this kind of stuff since I was a kid. I've, uh, I think most of us have uh, that are interested in the dark side of Hollywood first discovered it with a book called Hollywood Babylon by Kenneth Anger in the seventies. For all that could be said about that, which is, it's a, you could say a lot because there's a lot of nonsense in the books. However, it's what turned a lot of us on to the dark side of Hollywood from an early age. And now it seems I spend uh, my entire career disproving the myths that uh, Kenneth Anger sort of made up about people. But uh, I moved to Hollywood in 94, so I've been doing it about uh, 26 years. I think I started my own company 16 years ago called Dearly Departed Tours. Uh, our regular tour is called the Tragical History Tour, and it's a three-hour lighthearted look at the dark side of Hollywood. You'd see about 70 different locations where deaths and scandals and, and fun things happen. I and mean, we do the Battle of the Ghosty uh, old apartment. Uh, we do where the Black Dahlia uh, may have been murdered. You know, but we go so far as back then and then to lesser known stories like the suicide of Albert Decker and then to Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston. So it covers a lot of time. And about 10 years ago, I started a tour called the Helter Skelter Tour, which is based solely on the Tate LaBianca murders from 1969. And that's a four and a half hour tour, but we cover a lot of ground with that, 45 miles. And, uh, and you'll, you know, everywhere from the murder scenes to where, you know, the clothing was thrown off the mountain, where the gun was found and uh, where the, not only where the, where the people died, but where they lived and where they worked. So it's a, a uh, I try to make a really balanced, uh, a really balanced look at the people and the crimes. And then we have a couple of other tours. I have a murder tour that goes out on Saturday nights. That's just just gritty. I mean, it's it is it is as gruesome as it gets. So uh, so you know, we 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 offer a lot of different choices for people. Now with the pandemic going on right now, uh, we can only do private tours. You know, we can we if we have a uh, do a tour for somebody, it has to be one group of people. We can't take multiple groups of people just for safety's sake. But we are still up and running. And, uh, and all these tours are still available. Wow, that is fantastic. And so I, I know you, you worked with, with Quentin Tarantino 
for his last big film as as a historic uh, consultant. Can you talk a little bit about uh, because uh, I know I know the answer, and I'm sure you do too. But for folks who may not know about uh, the ties between uh, What's Upon a Time in Hollywood and Corriganville Ranch and Spawn Ranch, mm-hmm. and, well, the, and yeah, the the what was amazing watching the film being made was watching uh, the Spawn Ranch being recreated, and I've been on the location where the original Spawn Ranch was in uh, in Chatsworth you know, many, many, many times. And it's uh, it's fascinating to be there. And there are still things that you can actually make out that were there when the family were there. But when they recreated it, that was something that I never expected. They, you know, Tarantino went so far as to put every sign back, every car back. And and the people were, were costumed just the way they were. And it was literally like stepping back in time, watching it unfold and it was it's my favorite era it's my favorite story so my mind was continually being blown that whole summer while that film was being made oh geez i could only imagine i mean i was seeing photographs of when they were filming the movie that would you know just like leak out on the internet or whatever and i was just so excited to see that movie finally come out and then uh i did not know that that whole spawn ranch scene was recreated at corriganville until Mm -hmm. we were working on the road trip mysteries i'm like oh my gosh and so to see those same exact spots from the movie and to see and then to refer back to the movie and see how much detail went into that to try to re you know to recreate that was just astonishing really it was neat to see an old movie ranch being used as an old movie ranch the way it was back in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s. So, uh, yeah, it was it was like he was breathing life back into these locations. He's literally taking us back in time. And it was a, I, for that reason, it's a very special movie to me. Oh, absolutely. And and, it, you know, and that's the great thing about being here in, in Southern California in the L.A. area is places like these are available for for people to go and and see so you know they could either you know we could go to hollywood forever cemetery and and go see some of these famous graves and learn about their history there or we could go to places like these old movie ranches that were you know really marked such a huge stamp in in hollywood history especially those old westerns in the 40s and the 50s for television shows and everything and those places are there right now and it's kind of crazy because like at corriganville the, the the foundations are still there right in the middle of where the buildings used to be for this old west town that was borderline it was pretty much like a like a smaller knott's berry farm it was an old west town that was recreated back then for so 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 many years and so scott that is great that your tours are available for personal uh guided tours and so we put that information up as well and so uh by personal reservation we can go and take one of Scott's dearly departed tours. And we've got so many different options. I'm not sure which one I would go with first. I'm really <laughs> tempted with the Helter Skelter one, but the murder one sounds so grisly that I don't know. I think I might lean towards something like that. So now, Scott, you also have spread throughout all Southern California doing these tours. Uh, is there one type of tour that you would recommend in this private setting in this current time that that folks might be uh, ready to sign up for? Well, as I say, that, well, the Helter Skelter one is the, is the one that's closest to my heart. But because uh, we were isolated for so long, because literally our company shut down in March and we're just now getting to the point where uh, we can start doing tours again. Uh, but so I've been working hard at uh, creating online videos on my YouTube channel. It's called Dearly Departed Online. And I'm able to cover actually a lot more ground that way. I did a... Uh, uh, a video about uh, an actress named Joan Davis, who was from a show called I Mary Joan in the 50s, who uh, died a normal death, but there was a fight over her estate and her daughter, a very bitter fight, and the daughter uh, died in a fire with her two sons. And it's a fascinating story. The one I did very recently was on the Lennon sisters, who were the, you know, the beautiful uh, girls that sang on the Lord's Welk show, who was father was brutally murdered only a hundred hours after Sharon Tate. Uh, so, and they, for a while they thought it might be low, you know, sort of related in that way. So, uh, and I, I did something on Jay Sebring as a human being, not a murder victim. 
as well as you know a whole lot of different things. So virtually, I'm taking people there for free, uh, Duly Departed Online on YouTube. But if you went to my Facebook page, which is linked below, there's in the bio is a link to every single thing I do. That's my Instagram. That's my tour page. That's my, you know, everything is listed on that page. So, uh, but I'm really proud of the videos that we get to do. And, and I really hope the tours get back to, you know, whatever normal is anymore. Sure. No, totally understand. And, and that sounds awesome. And especially for folks that might be tuning in that are not in the Southern California area, they could tune into those YouTube channels and check some of that stuff out and see what, what's going on here in, in Southern California. Now, Carrie, is, is there's, uh, what's the best way for folks to make a reservation for one of your tours? Uh, they can just go to cemeterytour.com and click the button book now. Book now, that's simple enough. And then it'll just tell us what time is available and all that good stuff, right? Yeah, I usually start at 10 a.m. on Saturday mornings because it gets so hot the rest of the day. So by the tour starts at 10 a.m., it's usually over by about 1230. So most Saturdays at 10 in the morning. Perfect. Well, guys, thank you guys so much. This is just a very small taste of some of the spooky things that are going on in L.A. right now now in the middle of a, a global pandemic that people can it can get out of the house and explore and and, and, and get some of their uh, macabre uh, juices flowing and I think that's really super exciting thank you guys so much for for sharing this information and for doing and providing these tours to really share with folks to help them get a sort of uh, uh, this macabre uh, sort of escape from everything that's going on right now well, thanks for asking. Uh, it's it's been a pleasure, and um, yay, yay, Midtown, yay, Scoopy LA, <laughs> yay, yes. Hey, me again. I'm going to quickly check in, go over a lot of quick stuff uh, before we get to our next guest. Number one, uh, please do donate throughout today. We're, we're raising money for United Way's Pandemic Relief Fund, the Actors Fund, and the Angelino Campaign. These are all good charities that are providing support to people impacted by the pandemic. Uh, one easy way to find the link is just go to midsummerscream.org forward slash live, and you'll see the uh, donation form there. And then just below the donation form, we have a link where you can buy some uh, premiums and different products, whatever that uh, some of our, our vendors have provided with all the money that will go to these charities as well. So take a look at that, do some shopping. Uh, you'll get a really good deal on some good stuff and the money will go to a very good place. Um, coming up for the rest of the day, let me bring up the schedule real quick. Um, I'm not bringing it up too quickly, but I, I just want to point out at, at just towards the end of this hour, we have Christine McConnell, who's going to be live with us uh, from her home. So looking forward to that very much. And really important, uh, in addition to what we're doing here today uh, at Midsummer Screen, USC's uh, TEA group, known as TEA at USC, they're, as you can see right now, they're running their own stream all day long with educational panels and presentations talking about how to make your own haunted house uh, or immersive attraction. And you can find the schedule for that, for that as well on our page, midsummerscream.org forward slash live, as well as links uh, to go and check out that footage there. We want you to stick with us, but they've got some really good things too. So uh, you have a lot to choose from today. Um, now, as you can see, I really need uh, some help with my hair. Uh, so I'm bringing on now uh, Tammy with Little Shop of Horrors. Oh, sorry, Little Shop of Hairdos all the way up to California. Um, Tammy, what could you do with my hair? What can you do with the hair? <laughs> Can we hear you, Tammy? We can't hear Tammy. Is, the, uh, is anybody wearing headphones or something? Hello? Okay, let me, let me tell you where we are right now. We're at Little Shop of Hairdo in Upland. It's a uh, full service salon with a, a bunch of spooky decor in it. And uh, Tammy's a huge Halloween and horror fan as well. Um, can you hear us yet? No, we can't hear it. Well, if, if the camera operator can hear us, 
Ask uh, Tammy if you can just walk us through the shop. Well, we can't hear you too well. All right, well, we can't hear Tammy, so um, maybe let's try to come back to her a little bit later. We want to hear what she's talking about, but you can see she's got some really cool things in her window there. Um, she's got a little props to show off, um, plenty of things to look at, but um, we'll come back to Tammy a little bit later. Let's go to our, I believe, our, what do we have up next? Do you think we have a short film? No, what do we have? Oh, Rhythm Coffin's coming up next. That's pretty awesome. Uh, if you guys don't haven't heard of Rhythm Coffin, you have not been at a single horror event in LA. They are the hardest working uh, horror musicians and monster band I know, and they, they've done a performance just for us here to watch now. So let's check it out. And gruesome greetings to Midsummer Scream and HorrorBuzz.com. Thanks so much for having the Rhythm Coffin on the show tonight. We got Scary Kerry and Gruesome Garrick here. We're going to do a brand new Duo Plus debut for you of a song called The Coffin Creep. Hit it, Scary! <laughs> Hey guys. 
We're back here in the screaming room, and uh, we are getting very musical now uh, with a music video short film called Competitive Morning. And uh, this one's good, nice and bloody too. Enjoy. Recording. Hi, Midsummer Screams. This is Gabrielle Lydia, an actor from the short film Competitive Morning. I am Kevin Beecham, co director of Competitive Morning. Hi, I'm Mondo Lopez, co director, Competitive Morning. Hey, I'm Eric Triber. I'm an actor and editor of the piece. Hello, everyone. I'm Cully Roberts, production designer and competitive one. We are truly honored and humbled to be a part of this year's festival. We want to thank the event for allowing us to uh, showcase our, our music video. It is a music video. It's uh, a music video that falls into the, the guise of a, a short film or vice versa. It's a very uh, cinematic piece, and the band were kind enough to let us do whatever we wanted with their, uh, with their song. We approached it as a movie. The premise of it, it's, it's uh, I don't know, what would you say, Kev? What's the uh, mood of it? Without going into, into spoilers, I mean, uh, it, very, it very much harkens off of the work of like Abel Ferreira and uh, like early Catherine Bigelow. It took about f four or five weeks to make. It was some grueling, grueling nights, but the crew and the cast, everybody was just so amazing. It just was, it flowed effortlessly. We had an incredibly fun time filming it. And I think the video has so much personality that you don't always see these days. Thrilled to be a part of it because it's, uh, as, as an editor, first and foremost, I uh, don't spend a lot of time in front of the camera. And to have this opportunity and to do it with this group of people, you guys were really fantastic. Besides the uh, gallons of uh, corn syrup that course through my veins. Incredibly bloody and humbling experience. The entire crew, including Tony Molina, our cinematographer, and uh, the band, who was a fantastic part of the short film as well, uh, all put in tons of effort. Everyone played multiple roles uh, throughout the entire filming of this uh, project because everyone was so invested in it. It's fantastic. The rest of our crew couldn't be here, Eric Box and Christina and Melissa and Chase and Teddy, you know, thank you guys very much for all your hard work. This is Festival 40 for us, so this is an extra special occasion. So, you know, it's, it's pretty cool to come a long way. <laughs> Again, thank you guys for allowing our film to be screened during the screaming room and uh, much love to all of you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks guys. Enjoy. You enjoy the bloody scream works. <laughs> i 
Barry recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet. Do you like puzzles? Well then have I got the movie for you. Hellraiser is about a guy who buys a Rubik's Cube, solves it, and then gets kidnapped by a bunch of people who are really into S&M. Not m and though. I actually kind of want some M&M's now. Do, do we have M&M's? No? No M&M's? No M&M's. I've got M&M's. Uh, hey, right now we're going to go all the way up to San Jose and to the Winchester Mystery House. Hey, Natalie, how's it going? Hi, good. How are you? I'm not at the Winchester Mystery House at the moment, but uh, no. I'm at home, of course, like so many other people. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so you're up there. You you work for the Winchester. With I do. The, uh, Sorry. Uh, tell, tell us what you do up there. Uh, so I'm the marketing director for Winchester Mystery House, and I've been there almost, it'll be three years in October. Um, certainly been the most interesting couple of months, the last few, because it's the first time we've been closed uh, since opening in 1923. Yeah, it's been a long time, and yeah. this is a very weird year, but you guys are doing some very inv inventive things. Typically, people get to walk all through this massive house with how many rooms? 160 rooms. 160 rooms, uh, supposedly one of the most haunted locations in the world, but this pandemic is not allowing people to go inside right now. But you guys, what are you guys doing uh, in lieu of that? Yeah, so I mean, back in April, we actually had a video access tour that we had used uh, for several years. We immediately put that up online because we wanted people to still get a chance to see the house, um, even though we were closed. Um, and then we quickly shot a 360 video tour so there's actually an immersive tour of the house available um, for folks to do as well and that's really fun because we actually were able to get in because the house was closed and we didn't have tours and guests in the house that we could go and film almost every space in the house um, so when you look at it it's really a virtual experience uh, it's a full floor plan of the house which again we don't have Sarah didn't leave any blueprints there's nothing to tell us you know what yeah. room goes to where so it's a really fun activity for people from home to be able to kind of really take their time in some of those spaces virtually. And then in May, we actually were able to open our gardens. So we've been doing the Sarah Winchester garden tour during the day, um, Wednesday through Sundays, which has been good because people just want to get out and do something different. Um, and so we've, we've also leveraged some audio uh, that we had um, from, you know, from other, you know, from, the past and uh we've been running that since may and then this wednesday actually we just launched a nighttime experience as well which is um our walk with spirits tour so it's a nighttime sort of ghost walk through the gardens um kind of leveraging some of our most infamous um you know paranormal stories from our tour guides from our guests um some of the experiences that we've had with um, Ghost Adventures and James Von Prague and a bunch of other folks that have come through and done um, investigations there and sort of leveraging all of that information and allowing people to, you know, do something different at night um, yeah. in the middle of summer. So we basically couldn't wait for Halloween. We just we said, let's just do it now and try to get folks through because we get so many people that are so disappointed that they can't go in the house. So we're just trying everything right now to keep people um, engaged. You know, we appreciate it. And obviously, everybody hopes to be able to go through the house, but we I think everyone appreciates that you're trying to do something. Yeah. Tell me, though, uh, what is the spookiest thing that's happened to you uh, while working at the Winchester? You know, I've been there for three years. My, um, I have one story, and it's really kind of simple, but I was standing in my office sort of between two desks talking to some of my staff, and we were talking about somebody that had recently passed away. And I had said something like, you know, his his poor wife, like she's just, you know, really struggling with this. And um, there was a snow globe sitting on one of the desks. And it, it was a snow globe of the Winchester Mystery House, of course. And it just flew off the desk. Like nobody touched it. Nobody was near it. It just kind of flew off the desk and landed on the floor. And I was like, oh, that was weird. Um, and we kind of were like, did one of us move? Did one of us shake? Um, but no, it just sort of flew off. So that's my one story. 
but there's so many. I mean, our tour guides, especially and maintenance folks have a lot of stories because they're in the house, um, you know, after hours or early in the morning when there's nobody else around and they definitely have more, you know, tugs at shirts, hearing their names, um, hearing footsteps, seeing shadow people. I mean, there's all kinds of stories that we've heard over the years. Um, so it's kind of up to people to determine if, if, you know, the house is haunted or not. We don't, you know, we're, we're not experts. We don't know. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I look forward very much to being able to go anywhere, but one of the places I love to go especially is to go and check out the Winchester. It's a easy drive from LA and it's definitely something spooky and fun for Halloween fans to do all year round. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. Well, thank you very much for having us. And, and this is great. We're so glad that you're still getting to engage with your, your horror fans out there. And we hope to see them all come through for our walk with spirits tour. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, all right, thanks. Happy Christine, she's the best. <laughs> All right, we will. Well, right. Before we go to Christine, though, we're gonna we're gonna try to check back in with Tammy at the little shop of hairdos. Tammy, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. It's working. Okay. Yes. I see Love everybody it. in the control room cheering. So, <laughs> why, don't, why don't you give us a quick tour of uh, the shop? Um, well, I'm standing outside of one of our very famous display windows right now because um, I have to pay homage to the beginning of horror because I'm, of course, a Life Life Horror fan, and that is Elvira. And uh, as a kid, I watched her, and nothing's ever changed. So that is why this all came about. So now I'm going to take you inside. Excellent. And how long have you been there in Upland? Uh, five years now, over five years. All right. Uh, here's our little merchandise area. We even have logo t-shirts and, of course, horror-themed beauty products. Can't go without that. And this area here is our salon where our stylists typically work. As you can tell, uh, a lot of our stylists have our show off their own fandoms here of horror. And, of course, we cover all genres of horror, from campy to slash fix. It's all, it's all included here. This is all great. And, and tell me, uh, you know, everybody's obviously thinking about all the salons around California, around the, the country because of COVID. What are you doing to, to keep everyone safe as you're proceeding? Well, when we were allowed to be open, um, we were actually state certified to be in sanitation and disinfection, which a lot of people don't realize. It's actually we go to school it's not really hair talent. So um, we just upped everything while we were allowed to be open. You know, of course, for masks, and um, we even have professional cleaning crews that came here on a regular basis. But um, unfortunately, as most people know, we got closed down again. Most of California has for hair salons or any any type of beauty salon whatsoever. Yeah. So, yeah, but we definitely, you know, we, we used all the things we were supposed to, but unfortunately, we're here now. But... Well yeah, show me the rest of this. That, that's, I see um, Spike up there behind you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's allowed to remain here. <laughs> and, and, what's, this book, of course. and what's in the next room? All right, come on back. This is a huge salon. Oh, yeah, it looks definitely it's like a TARDIS. It's bigger on the inside. So, this is our hallway, and um, there's a lot of artwork here from a lot of local artists. From, for all different types of mediums, from paintings to drawings, to sketches, to three-dimensional artwork. And the great thing is they hang stuff on our walls, they sell it, they get 100% of the proceeds, it all goes to them. And then, then this here, as we're entering here, this is our lobby. Switching off lights here so you can see. And, um, you would think we hold seances here, but it's pretty close. Uh, since this building is 115 years old, this whole district that we're in here is quite old. We're all at least 100 years old here. I've actually hosted a lot of paranormal investigations here, as well as ghost tours. And they were very popular when we were able to have them. Um, and people loved it. And this place definitely has its ghost stories. And as you can tell here, as we're going into the bathroom now, this bathroom is dedicated to Tim Burton. 
switch the lights mm -hmm. and come on in. I'll let the cameraman go inside and take a look at our Tim Burton bathroom. Love it. Well, this is all really cool. I, I bet Tim Burton doesn't know there's a bathroom dedicated to him. <laughs> so here we're going to go pass through some more artwork that artists have amazingly given to us. Truly talented people. I'm very fortunate. And into our shampoo room, which is, of course, very unique to us. You don't see a whole lot of salons that have witches hats for lights. And this is dedicated to a lot of uh, parts of universal horror and classic horror. This is great, Tammy. Thanks for letting us take a peek inside of oh, Little Shop of Hair, dude. Thank you for uh, writing us. We appreciate that. But uh, we, we hope to be able, I need my, as you can see, I need work. So I think I have to come your way as soon as I can. I don't Absolutely. know what you can do. But um, thanks for thanks for joining us. And uh, right. we'll see you soon. Right. Thank you. All righty. All right. Well, um, we are going to go now uh, to, to uh, Claire with our team. Claire, how's it going? Uh, with all the, the donations and everything. Oh my gosh, fantastic. You guys are really stepping it up. We are doing really well. The merchandise is selling out. So if you guys want something, hop on that store quick. You can find the link at our website, midsummerscream.org. And yeah, we've still got some great artwork left um, from Derek Vakusic. Gosh, I hope I pronounced his name correctly. And some coasters from the Gloomy Globe at the Gloomy Cottage. Um, a few books left. And uh, I believe one mini mask from Retro A Go Go. So, uh, but thanks for all your support thus far. And I'm so excited because now we get to say hello to the stunningly beautiful and amazingly creative Christine McConnell. Yay! Hello, hello. It's so great to see you again. It's been way too long since I, saw I know I know a whole, I can't believe it. I was thinking about it. it's been a full year since Midsummer Scream and that's when we actually saw each other last time so and so much so. so many fabulous things have been happening for you and you've been you found an eerie mansion I hear I we are going to be moving <laughs> into it we actually are going to be leaving California um, <gasps> next Saturday oh and my god going on a road trip across the United States and oh, we're that's exciting. Even in this house in person. We're buying it sight and seen, and it is this big, spooky old mansion built in, I think, 1866. So uh, and it, it looks like a haunted mansion. It's amazing, and we're so excited about it. It sounds like a dream come true, actually. And I'm hoping that you'll be doing some of your, because uh, we've got your, you've got your Patreon. Will you be doing any of the renovating that kind of thing and posting it on Patreon? Absolutely. So that is going to be it's essentially going to be the backdrop to the series that I'm doing. So the from the mind of Christine McConnell, it's going to be this beautiful gothic backdrop to all of that. And it's just I feel like it's going to enhance everything. Give oh, us my gosh. Kind of stretch out a little bit and sort of find all of these secret passageways and fun oh. things that I'm sure are waiting for me there. That just sounds like the best thing ever. I cannot wait to watch. And I'm um, so excited. Yeah. And, um, you know, so we've got, you've got your From the Mind of Christine McConnell, which is the Patreon. And then, of course, there's always uh, Curious Creations of Christine McConnell, the series yeah. on Netflix, which is still there, which if you guys haven't seen it, is so much fun. Definitely check it out um, yeah. with our favorite Rose. <laughs> she is, <laughs> I was just talking, talking to Colleen, who does her voice, Colleen Smith. And yes. she is, every time I start talking to her, it feels like I'm communicating with Rose because she is so much that character and the humor that she gives. And I don't know, it's just, she is something I will miss terribly not being about or about not being in California anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's terrific. All right, wonderful. So uh, I believe you have a list of our, our next uh, list of donors. And I added a few more at the last minute, if you're able to put those on the list as well, that I already sent you that. So perfect. you should have them. All right, well, first, thank, every, thank you so much to everyone who is contributing to this. Um, you're, it's definitely going to a good cause. So the donor list I have is Hendel Thistletop, Patrick 
Nottingham, which I think I follow, Robert Soto, Christopher, Dan Carlo Dannon, Joshua Wagner, Martha Porter, Sarah Keen, Ke is it Kinney? I think it's Sarah Kinney, Lisa Peters, Vanessa Moraz, Jeannie Tula Tulao, <laughs> Tuliao. I'm going to mispronounce some of these. I apologize. Martin McCollum, Nixon Collins, Justin Castillo, Mark Rodriguez, John Evans, Anthony Cortez, Cole Ellis, Jessica Ashman, William Rood, and Michelle Gilmore, Derek Moore, Jacqueline Franks, Karina Ardon, and Sarah Musnicki. Yay! Wonderful. Oh gosh, Christine, it's such a wonder to see you. So oh. grateful for you hopping on at the last minute and uh, reading our donors. It just, I'm sure it makes everybody really happy. I know it makes me thrilled well, and absolutely looking forward to your next adventures and um, take care of yourself. Yeah, you as well. Bye. And we are back. You guys having fun? Are you enjoying? Are you staying cool? I hope so. Thank you for being there with us in spirit today. We have a new haunt preview. You guys ready? Another haunter preview. Let's bring in Corona Haunt. Mason, Corona Haunt is in the house. Corona Haunt, insert joke here, right? <laughs> I'm sure you guys have never heard that before, that's right? That's a new one. <laughs> that's a new one. Yeah, well, that's why I'm paid the big bucks. All right. <laughs> Well, hey guys, good to see you. Thank you for being yeah. here. Uh, first and foremost, you guys safe and sound? Everybody cool? Oh yeah, trying to stay cool. All right. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. All right, well, so obviously Halloween is crazy and up in the air this year, but what we are looking to are a lot of the home haunts. And you guys certainly are a leading force here in Southern California. So why don't you go ahead and, and tell all the spooky kids at home uh, what you guys have planned thus far for Corona Haunt. So Corona Haunt 2020, we have our, as of now, we have our nightmare show, which is our special effect projection show that we debuted last year. The second chapter of it comes out this year in September. So we're really stoked about that. And we also just announced another special effect projection show that will debut later in October, uh, which is called All Hallows Eve, which celebrates the traditional um, Halloween, Halloween season versus our nightmare show where it kind of like picks and chooses like the um, horror some some horror movies that we had our fans actually choose which they wanted to see in nightmares this year and then Perfect. later october we're still planning for a haunt so we're yeah, still we're still shooting the big guns. we're going like this <laughs> um working right now in developing a virtual queue to eliminate um any sort of contact while waiting in our line we're going to be as uh, safe as possible as we can with everything going on right now hopefully by the october season that everything will be lightened up just a little bit at least that would help us but we're still <laughs> going to follow every every single safety protocol so nothing to worry about that one though yeah yeah well that's that, that's a good plan uh will you guys be having live scare actors in your haunt yes so our live scare actors will actually be distanced from our guests this year um, okay so that's one of the things we're also working with. Um, and then for this year as well, our actors actually are behind multiple layers of masks. Yeah. So it's very like, I think we're, it's, we're very like up and down about it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's tough. And obviously anybody that's a scare actor anywhere this year, it's going to be like the ninth circle of hell, oh, right? Yeah. Where, wearing a mask and then a mask and being distant and hot and, it's just going to be so much fun. Thank you, 2020. Um, <laughs> Literally. I'm not letting this season die. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So now, have you guys started build or anything yet? Not yet. We're actually starting, I think, in about two, three two weeks. Two weeks, three weeks. Hopefully. So we're going to gonna wait for it to get really nice and hot. Oh, That's yeah. what you're waiting for? The perfect time to build when it gets nice and hot. Because everyone knows that Corona is like the cool spot in Southern California, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> exactly. Perfect. So when you, you say that you're up and down, it's, and of course, everything is a moving target for Halloween season this year. Um, when when do you have to make that decision, that critical decision, whether you're going to have a haunt or not, or whether you're going to scale it back in yard display? When do you guys really have to pivot and make that make that choice? So I've made our cutoff date to be August 17th, so roughly three weeks from now, just since that would okay. be typically when we would normally begin full speed building. Um, it's okay. not really, we don't just start building and all of a sudden we're like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do this. Well, we were always of course. off since day one of the year. So like already in the, where we're at right now, we have like about six props done. Yeah, we're still making okay. props every day. So, so we're kind of... We're still, excited. We're still, still pushing. Excited. We're <laughs> excited. We just hope everything is going to all go well. So that's just the point. Yeah. Well, you know, the good news is even if things have to be shuttered a bit this year, you're that much closer to being done for midsummer next year. Very true. Very See, true. that's why we that's how we spin it, right, guys? Very true. Nothing's wasted. Perfect. Perfect. So now in the weeks ahead, we are going to be doing more um, haunter previews and, and live hits with, with different haunters around the, the Southland. And so we will definitely be keeping everybody up to speed and up to date on what you guys are doing. And uh, we'll just go from there. Okay, guys. Sweet. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being part of the broadcast today. Uh, stay safe. Uh, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Oh, yeah. whatever, li whatever liquid, that's your choice. <laughs> and uh, we will talk to you guys very soon, okay? Right. Thanks, Thank Ray. You guys. All right. Much love, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Right. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us to the virtual festivities of Midsummer Scream. My name is Ava Ziegfeld and I am your ghost hostess with the mostess. I hope you're all staying safe at home wearing your Halloween masks. All day long, you are going to have the delectable treasure of being able to watch four frightful fashion shows by Poltergeist and Paramours, as designed by its CEO and founder, Amalia. We are delighted to have a sneak preview of Sean Keller's upcoming album, Killer Sounds of Halloween 2. So nice he had to do it twice. So stay tuned and enjoy the frightful fashions of Poltergeist and Paramours. You lie in bed, but you're not sleeping. You hear a noise, but no.
Barry recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet. Small towns are my favorite settings for movies, which is why I love it. It's about a bald and clown who shows seven children the true meaning of friendship. And it stars that sexy vampire from True Blood. Mmm, Vampire Eric. Hey folks, Jeff DePaul here from the Disney Coast to Coast podcast, and I think it is pretty undeniable in movies of all time is Disney's Hocus Pocus, and I am so thrilled. Today I am joined by a couple of fantastic people who made this movie. First one I'm going to bring in is William Sandell, who is the production designer of Hocus Pocus. Hello, William, and welcome to the Midsummer Scream live stream. Hey, Jeff. Fun to be here. Thank you so much. You set up such a fun show and tell today. You this is this is your home, man. And you have you so know, much it, cool stuff. It kind of looks like this all the time anyway. So it wasn't I love cool. it. I love it. Now, of course, for Hocus Pocus, you had the great pleasure of shooting very close to where I grew up in uh, Salem, Massachusetts. But some of it was actually shot here in Los Angeles. Uh, in fact, down the street yep. from where I am right now at the Walt Disney Studios. Some people might not know that that Witch's Cabin is entirely created by you and your team and designed by you. Oh yeah, I I, I have pictures here. I, you know, I was working with uh, uh, Cal Di Valerio and his crew of painters and carpenters. Every piece of wood was hand hewn. Rosemary Brandenburg, the great decorator, was uh, uh, decorating it, and uh, you know. But but here's what it looks like on stage. I dug out some pictures. That's on the big stage at Disney when they're building it. So we're laying in all the roads and the, and the topography that'll eventually be the forest. And I mean, I think you remember a couple of years ago on stage when you were hosting, uh, Th Thora Birch said when she was 10 years old walking on this stage, you know, it was quite a, quite a, you know, experience for a 10 year old. It, didn't you even bring in dirt from New England or something? Or what? You brought in some yeah. real pieces of New England, right? Well, there were there were certain trees and certain uh, uh, foliage that we needed, and uh, we kept shipping big truckloads back from, uh, you know, back from uh, Salem, back here, back from Marblehead. So I never know if I'm destroying the illusion showing the behind the scenes pictures, but uh, you know, it was, it was really quite a. Set. I mean, you and I have talked about it. Uh, it was a happy set. It was a great set. People, you, we were going to work for months, living Halloween. So, how much cooler can it get for people that love Halloween? And uh, yeah, it's we all. It's totally true. Like there are so many people who you know worked on this film now that I've spoken to, and all of the cool thing about it is every single one of you are so passionate about the Halloween season and had so much oh, yeah. fun making this movie, which isn't always the case. So it's kind of great to hear as a fan of Hocus Pocus that you yeah. all love it as much as we do. You know, I, I worked for Kenny Ortega, the director on Newsies at Disney. And I'd uh, worked on a Bette Miller, Lily, Lily Tomlin picture there at uh, Buena Vista, Disney. Uh, we did big sets there for Bette Miller on big business. And uh, I was always bugging the studio to try to find me a Halloween, Halloween script because I, I was dying to do a Halloween story and sure enough this popped up and uh, you know the execs there uh, Bruce Hendricks and Mike Fertrell all those guys they said well go bug your friend Kenny you just did a picture with him if he'll do it maybe he'll hire you back so I was bugging Kenny all the time he, he was getting mad at me because he was trying to score newsies and I kept <laughs> pleading with him to do this because I good shot because we you know we had a good relationship on newsies so uh, yeah, I finally, I knew, I knew from day one, this would be a perennial Halloween uh, favorite and show on TV every year. Like I watched Wizard of Oz every year when I was a kid. So I, I just knew it. And, and then it the, certainly I, is. I read the script. I, yeah. yeah. William, why don't you show us those? I love those photos you have of Bette Midler there because those are some of her early makeup tests, right? Well, yeah, this was, this was kind of fun. She, I got a call in my office and uh, from Bet's assistant, and uh, Bet wanted me to come down to the, her makeup room right away. She was, uh, there was a bit of a, a tug and pull between the studio and Bet. Bet wanted to be a witch. She loved being a witch. It's still one of her favorite characters. 
in a film that she's played, she says that all the time. She dresses up as Winifred at her uh, at her big New York uh, fundraiser sometimes, and uh, they wanted her to be Bet. They're paying all this money for Bet, right? And uh, she wanted to be a witch, so she kept trying on teeth for me and trying on different hairdos. So I I I kept a lot of the pictures. I mean, here here she is. She was making that's Mary Vogt, the great Mary Vogt in the back there the, with the red hair, the costume designer, who did all those wonderful uh, costumes for the girls. But that was so funny. She kept spinning around in her chair and trying to scare Mary and I. <laughs> uh, you know, different, different teeth, and you know, and it's you know, she's such a character, bet, and she's so sweet, and she loved that role so much. But here's some of Bet trying awesome. to figure out how to be Bet. I borrowed some of this back from uh, the Sugar Mint Gallery in South Pass. It has a lot of my Hocus Pocus collection there. But isn't that great? I mean, she was so sweet, so terrific. That is very cool. Thank you for holding all of this stuff up for us as well. I know we're making you go through all your stuff there, but oh, I do no, see, no, I do fun. see a very important piece there. I see book. Yeah, I, I ended up with a book. Not too many of these around. Okay. So any fan of Hocus Pocus knows that this is a character from the movie. What version is this? Because there were several versions of the book yeah. on screen, correct? This was this was a stand-in book that the kids used to, uh, you know, when they were running at a distance and, uh, uh, you know, caught in the rain, caught in the water, in the elements. It, it's I think uh, Orlando, uh, Disney, in their world may have the one with the eyeball working. Maybe Kenny Ortega has the other one. I'm not sure where that one went, but uh, I've got the only one around here that I, I know of, so... So that one was actually seen on screen, right? Oh, many times, yeah. Yeah, very, very, very cool. Now, you have some behind-the-scenes photos. I know that you were lucky enough to go to Salem, as I said, in that whole New England area and shoot good portions of the film, and you have some pretty cool behind-the-scenes photos uh, to share with us, right? Well, I, you know, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the photos from uh, Salem. Oh, oh okay, no worries. I thought you had the one of the, of, um, the kid's house. And I, I know there was a beach on there because there were some scenes that were cut. Ah, yeah, there we go. This is a great, great one of Kenny when I was showing him the house that we picked. Uh, you know, it, those people are so sweet. This, the couple still owns it. But, you know, we were looking for a beach, you know, out in front of the house because there was an extended scene with Max and his father having a father-son chat on the beach. So uh, there were a number of houses. I do have pictures of those that we you know, brought to Kenny to look at. And this, this one got the nod. And now <laughs> family has people shooting the house, the Denison house constantly. <laughs> so it's kind of Listen, fun. Listen, I've gone. I've gone and gotten my photo in front of it for sure. So very cool. Now, in a, in a couple minutes, we're going to be bringing in David Kirshner, who is the creator producer of Hocus Pocus. But I want you to show... Oh, good. David can watch this as well. Show some of this artwork, uh, William, that you have that was created by David. Well, I, I don't know that David even knew I, I'd saved his drawings that he drew until we uh, had coffee uh, last year. But it was so interesting to me when we were flying back to uh, Boston to do our uh, Scouts of Salem. I'm sitting next to David. He's the producer and the writer of the short story. Such a cool guy. And uh, so talented. And he starts drawing the whole movie next to me, pulls a big pad out and start. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, I got to really deliver for this guy because he can draw it and write it. And, and he, so I saved some of his drawings, the very first drawings before Giacomo Giazza started doing all his wonderful keyframes. David starts drawing like this is the, the kids going through the thing. He's, what do you think? What do you think? And I'm like in awe. And, and I still am in awe, so I had him pinned in my office for inspiration. And then uh, at the end of the, I finally framed him a few years ago because can you imagine I'm watching the whole movie being drawn for me on this airplane and he finishes drawing one, gets in the crew van to go scout Marblehead the next day and he's got another couple done for me. So I <laughs> just really was really digging it, you know, I just thought it was so cool. Very cool. Well, let's bring David Kirshner in here right now. Hello, David. Welcome to the Midsummer hey, Scream live stream. How are you? 
Good. Hey, how David. Are you? Good. To Good. See you. I see. Now, David, you're the producer and creator. You created hey, the original David. story of Hocus Pocus. And behind you, I see you got a, a friend with you, Billy Butcherson there, yeah? I do. I, I even did a little trick that I used to do when I was a kid to scare my sister. I took a flashlight and I put it under him so that the light would be okay because we're redoing my office and everything is torn <laughs> apart. But I, we moved everything around just so that uh, we can bring Billy with us today and, and book and, uh, and the Black Flame Candle. Excellent. Now, Bill, uh, Billy, there in the background, he is created from pieces from the actual film, right? This isn't. That's not like a recreated Billy. That's one that Tony Gardner worked on, correct? That's right. And uh, and Tony presented this to me uh, after we were done making the film. And it's uh, it's of, of all of my props that I have, it's my very favorite thing that anyone has ever given me. It's very cool. Now, David, did you know about, or do you remember drawing those pictures that William just showed us or those illustrations? You know, uh, Bill and I had, had uh, iced tea at, at Bob's Big Boy in, in Burbank, uh, not far from the Disney studio, uh, not too long ago. And he told me about this and then proceeded to bring them out. I'd completely forgotten that that had happened. I remember sitting next to Bill, but I'd forgotten that, because I'm always drawing something. But I, I completely forgot that I was, I, I just went home on such a high and saying to my wife, Bill Sandell, <laughs> of all people, saved my artwork. It made me feel so good. Oh. That was, oh. that was uh, I, I, think, I think, David, all the time, what, uh, what a terrific film that was that we all were on. I mean, I'm still so keen on that film. <laughs> I, I, I feel the same way, and we were so fortunate to have Kenny and the job that, that he did. Oh. What, what the world that you brought to life was just, yeah. I mean, people decorate their homes like that because of what your vision was with it, Bill. And it's, it's well, so Kenny, much fun you know, to Ken, just see this. Well, Ken, you know, Kenny being a choreographer, uh, I think there's a lot of movement and, and it's really interesting and kind of uh, him getting the nod to do this film because the more uh, watching it over the years well that's that's a musician and she probably appreciate that, that with kenny but there's a lot of action and a lot of movement going on that's kind of fun besides great direction he's great with the kids too wasn't he he, he sure was loves, with he's such a I pleasure mean, to be said, there's a, a very happy set yeah. and most sets are not really happy there's always moments of, of some kind and this from beginning to end, there was just, I don't know, people, it, it was like summer camp. People, people did not want to go home. They wanted to keep working on it. And uh, yeah. from, from, you know, yeah. Kenny and yourself and the actors and Mary, it just so many people that brought so much to it. Stephen Half. David, I do need to mention your, your sweater is amazing. Is that your, you. your, uh, ugly Halloween sweater? Like they have the ugly, ugly Christmas sweaters. Is that what we got going on here? Uh, Disney sent this to me, and it's. Let's see if I can, you know, get up here a little bit. There are the girls. Oh, so there's, cool! Uh, there's uh, the vacuum and the mop and the broom and uh, Thackeray Binks and uh, Black Lamb Candle. Uh, yeah, um, I. That's, <laughs> there's not a lot of that's so cool. Put on a sweater in 96 degrees for, but I'm doing it for you, <laughs> Jeff Capaldi. So uh, I was excited to break this in because I thought I'll I'll wear it obviously in fall and then. When you invited me to this with Bill, I just thought, oh, I'm going to wear my sweater. Well, I am honored. It's very cool. I actually haven't seen that before, so I need to get myself one. Very, very cool. But I do think it's very appropriate. Today is August 1st. We are celebrating Halloween, of course, which is totally normal for Hocus Pocus, right? As your film came out in July of 1993 because Disney was saving the October month for The Nightmare Before Christmas. And it's... Right. Pretty, it's pretty incredible how Hocus Pocus is so related to summer. Very much how Midsummer Scream is is you know a, su a summer celebration of this wonderful holiday. Um, now, David, I do see you have a book with you as well. Tell us about this book because unlike uh, Williams, which was seen on screen, this is totally different. What is this? This was the book that I did for my original presentation to Jeffrey Katzenberg, and um, it's. Uh, uh, it's you know supposedly made out of human skin, and there's an eyeball in it, as you can see. Mine, mine didn't work. Um, I mean, it was just an eye stuck stuck in there, and um, and it was kind of the the 
the basis for what uh, Bill and Company would design for uh, for for the book that actually was a character and and his eyeball did move and, uh, and they did an amazing job on that because that character is so loved because of what they did. Now, obviously, you're you know an artist. We saw your your drawings and such. Did you actually make that book yourself, or was that you? I did not, did you... I did not make no this book. I okay. did not do um, when I did the black flame candle for part of my presentation, uh, and I made two of them. Um, this is what I did, uh, which was just paper that I then just uh, put in the oven and kind of toasted it so that it would look like old parchment paper and used uh, sepia uh, ink and, um, and just kind of drew evil things on this candle from the grocery store and then wrapped the paper around it. And that was my presentation. But when Disney went to, uh, said yes to the film, they used my David, original David. Uh, candle and they still have it. I think William was trying to say something. What's up, William? Oh, David, you tell such a wonderful story about the uh, about the pitch to the Disney executives and you know making the brooms and the and the well. What, can you tell it real quick? Sure, if there's sure. time, Jeff. I don't uh, know. Yeah, yeah, it's for sure. So I've always I've always loved the idea. Walt Disney spoke about before you get on a ride, uh, as you're standing in line at Disneyland or Disney World. There, there are hints of what the ride's going to be and um, and how exciting excited you become as you get closer to the front of the line. And, and Disney has continued to do that uh, for all these years. And, um, and so when these executives came in, I, I had that thought in my mind of what Walt Disney had done. And this was the beginning of the ride in, in my mind. And what I did was I had um, uh, two witches broomsticks hanging from... Uh, from the ceiling on monofilament wire, and I had a hollowed out Electrolux vacuum cleaner also hanging from the ceiling with its cord dangling. Uh, my wife and I uh, ha had the kids in the neighborhood draw pictures of, of uh, black cats and zombies and pumpkins on a, a just a, a kind of paper bag you'd get from the market. And, uh, and inside, my wife bought about 20 pounds of candy corn. And I, I ripped the bottom of the bag and I kind of made a serpentine line as to where the executives were gonna be sitting. And when they walked into the room, I mean, they smelled Halloween, they smelled their childhood. Yeah. And um, so I true. So showed great. storyboards of what uh, scenes that I thought would be fun and, um, and present book and the black flame candle and proceeded to tell them that uh, Halloween was a, uh, a business that um, generated about, at that time, $1 billion a year, and yet there were no movies for, for families um, that were kind of a, a fun, Amblin-esque kind, of, uh, kind of romp. And uh, I, honestly, I don't even know if they paid attention to the rest of everything I had. I think they heard that it was a billion dollar industry that there were no family movies for. And, uh, and Jeffrey jumped, Jeffrey Katzenberg jumped on it, I think with that. Um, but today <laughs> that business has grown as, as evidence of us even speaking about it today. Halloween is a $10 billion business and um, it just continues to grow. And I think that it makes uh, adults, kids again, and kids can become anything that they want to. So that, you know, it's, it's weird. I never thought of this, but just the, the likes of, of Bill and Kenny and all the people that came to it. There was just a passion and love for Halloween. And I, I had no idea that there were grown people like me that still felt the same way about Halloween <laughs> when I was 10. So all of these people came together in this wonderful summer camp to, to create this movie with just an absolute love of Halloween. And every person brought something that really touches audiences 27 years later. Now, David, are we at 28 years, Jeff? Uh, this is 27 right now. Oh, this, is 27. Right. Yeah, this is 27. So, David, that fantastic pitch that you were talking about, I'm always amazed by this. Remind me, what year was that that you made that initial pitch? Because the movie was released in 1993. Right. Uh, it, it, would, uh, it would be almost uh, just about nine years later. I pitched it in 1984. And, wow. Uh, yeah, and... I thought that was the end of it. I mean, I just, you know, 
they bought it. They bought it in the room, but they also were, um, it just took a long time for it to come together. And when I got the phone call, I almost fell over because I just thought they decided not to move forward with it. But it took nine years for that to happen. Yeah. So for folks who don't know, uh, in the entertainment industry, it is very normal for projects to be bought, like they bought Hocus Pocus, and never get made. That's very normal practice. So as you were saying, David, your fear was that, yeah, you got some money from it, but it was never actually going to come to fruition. So thank yeah. goodness it did, right? <laughs> I got, and more than the money, I just it was so important to me to get it made. So I was, I was really crushed. Um, and I would learn, because it was so early in my career, but I would learn that, as you just said, this is pretty standard fare. It takes often a long time for uh, a project to, to happen. I, I'm Curious George, the first Curious George film we made, it was 16, 16 years. So, um, you know, it's it just, these things take a long time. Yeah, no, David, uh, D Hocus Pocus fans would be very upset with me if I didn't ask this ne next question. What's going on with Hocus Pocus 2? Well, putting a pandemic aside for a moment here, um, uh, Disney Plus uh, is moving forward with it. Um, they've announced Adam Shankman as the director, and um, they're just trying to put all the deals together. I mean, obviously, I don't think anybody's going to get on a plane right now and bet or Sarah Jessica Parker or Kathy and Jimmy or anybody else and uh, and go make this film in the middle of this. But uh, the, the hope is that uh, sometime next year that uh, everything will begin on on this, the film. They seem to really want to make it. Have contracts been signed with those three actresses, do you know, or can you say, or is it just there? I know they've shown interest at this point, right? I, I don't know if, if the contracts are done. I know they've all said that they want to do it. I know they've all given their notes on the script. Um, and th that's what I know so far. Okay, very exciting. Well, William, I, I believe you have some uh, more sketches there and such of scenes that maybe didn't make the final cut of the film, either were shot and hit the cutting room floor and never even shot from the original script. Can you share some with us? Well, I can, I can share one that I have here. This was a scene where the witches were gonna, you know, waiting for the bus, we're gonna end up near a uh, costume shop. And uh, it was drawn by Giacomo Giazza. And uh, for probably time reasons and uh, whatnot, uh, you know, it was cut. These were, these were all the kind of ideas that we kept, uh, you know, giving to uh, Kenny to sort of sift and look at. And David probably weighing in on, you know, what's relevant and what's too much and whatnot. So. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah, I'd, you, like to show, you, I'd like to, can I show one picture, uh, Jeff? Please do. Yeah. This is uh, Kenny in the streets of Salem. And that's the great hero Narita that shot the picture. And he did such a beautiful job on the sets and shooting Salem and Marblehead. And that's just one of the few pictures I have of those two sort of, you know, we're scouting, I believe, when we shot this, trying to figure out how to shoot Salem. So I just want to always remember what a wonderful picture the cinematographer shot. You know, I, I always talk about Mary, how wonderful her costumes were. I mean, this is pre-CGI, and she layered those costumes with all the fabrics that would flow with a fan on stage it was really done the old fashioned film way. And uh, so many interesting people were on that film to make that come alive like that. So I, I just wanted to make sure Hero got a little nod here. He's such a wonderful guy. Well, one of the great things about this film is, you know, you did go to the real place, right? You went to Salem, but you did shoot a lot around LA, I believe Pasadena. I know the Warner Brothers Studios lot, the, the Disney lot stuff like that. And the thing that's really kind of incredible, that's all Warner Brothers, right? William? Oh, he froze up on me, but I think- Warner lot. That's where, where Mex gets busted by the cop who says, are you this virgin and uh, his girlfriend? And, you know, it, it doubled for Salem and a lot. They had a you know, pretty sweet little back lot back there in those days. I guess it's being all uh, torn out now, but yeah, we have a lot of location pictures of different uh, Max Dennison houses that weren't chosen by all of us and by Kenny. And uh, 
a lot of look I have a lot of location pictures just you know searching Marblehead of you know looking at different cemeteries looking at different homes looking at different pieces and we shot for uh, you know and then eventually we came back here we shot in the West Adams district we shot in Whittier turned to Whittier into Halloween right at Christmas time which is a real <laughs> crazy thing for everybody down there and uh, you know it's fun. We shot a lot here, but we, you know we shot for uh, about a week and a half in Salem and Marblehead. So that was fun. We captured all of that. And, you know we were back there at the 300th year anniversary of uh, you know what what happened. You know all the the things depicted in the Crucible and the you know and the, and the killing of these poor women and the stoning of the man and the whatnot. So it was uh, it was pretty heavy to be back there shooting this. It, it, it's really interesting for me. Yeah, what, well, what I was going to say was one of the cool things was even though you shot in so many different locations so far apart, it's so cohesive. Like the entire film, anybody watching that movie wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a backlot shot and the real well, Salem. We a, it, yeah, we, we had a really great location. Lori Balton, who's actually uh, runs the location managers guild most of the time. And uh, she was terrific. Rosemary Brandenburg has just finished the new... Uh, Star Wars film, and she's much in demand. So, you know, we managed to get a lot of interesting, cool people on that show. And uh, that's why that, you know, that house that we built, you could walk in the gates, walk up the road, walk in the house, and you could shoot anywhere you wanted in that house because every piece of wood was hand hewn with uh, square nails and aged. And, uh, you know, there was no phony, no phony vibe there. So it was pretty crazy to be on that set. And then we had a whole big cemetery next to it and uh, crypts for the kids to run through. It was, it was really amazing. I can see when Thor was on stage at Midsummer Scream last year, I asked her about that and she mentioned it to me a couple of times over the years. It was, can you imagine being a 10 year old? I mean, she's a very precocious 10 year old, but can you imagine being a 10 year old and walking on that stage uh, every day to go to work? I mean, it was, she said it was crazy, so cool. Yeah. I'm a now, grown up and it was crazy and cool. <laughs> <laughs> now, Hocus Pocus is one of those films that seems to keep keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger each Halloween. I honestly predict this may be the biggest Halloween ever for it, uh, upcoming this October, because you know a lot of people are going to be celebrating this holiday from their homes this year, and we already know that uh, that I believe it's Freeform has their Thirty One Nights of Halloween, and they they show Hocus Pocus an unprecedented amount of times it seems every single year. And David, you know, we've talked about in the past how originally this film was a flop and it was severely disappointing for you. But when was like that turning point, do you think? Was it about 10 years ago or so? Uh, no, actually about uh, five or six years after the film came out, uh, Disney just kind of threw it onto um, the Disney Channel. And there was a big uptick in, in viewership. And they thought, huh, that's interesting. And so they tried it again at another point in October and the same thing happened. And from there, it's just built over all these years. And it is now on uh, of the Disney channels. It is the most watched movie of, of all time. It is it surpassed uh, E.T. and uh, Nightmare Before Christmas and Harry Potter. It just people, I don't know, it's like uh, on a cold, rainy night, pulling up a comfy blanket. And I think that... Uh, Hocus Pocus seems to do that to to people. They just seem to, even though they've seen it. You got your, you got your there's, revenge. There's drinking games all across uh, in colleges where every time the word book is uh, said, kids <laughs> take a shot. Uh, they, <laughs> they, um, there are parties where people have to dress as the characters. I'm just surprised that as people get older, they they don't want to leave it um, to their childhood. They really want to continue to celebrate it and. Wow, I don't, I don't think any of us knew at the time. I mean, all of us loved Halloween, but I don't think any of us truly understood. I certainly didn't. Yeah. Just, just how, how much uh, life this thing would have. Yeah, now, we were talking about the upcoming sequel a little earlier, and I'm curious, I mean, how many discussions of sequel has there been? Because I, I believe at one point there was a Disney Channel discussion, then it became a Disney Plus. How many years has this sequel thing been going through your mind, Disney's mind? When did you first hear about that? Well, I, I'm the one that brought it to the Disney feature group and said, hey, you know, look what's happened. It's become such a, a big property since we came out. 
um, what, what do you think about making a, uh, a sequel? And, uh, and I had a whole presentation where Billy was, was standing there and artwork and all kinds of ideas. And uh, it took them six months, but six months later they passed on it. And, uh, and of course I was devastated again. And then I asked my attorney if, if he could um, speak to them and see if we could bring it over to uh, the Disney Channel since it's had some success there. Uh, so we were able to do that. We sold it there in the room and we were moving forward uh, with a couple drafts. And then uh, Disney Plus came along and uh, they and the feature group said that they would like to continue with this. So it is now with them and we're doing it under the Disney Plus uh, banner with a great budget, a better budget. Fantastic. Better budget at, uh, <laughs> at, at just the Disney Channel. Great. Well, David, William, thank you so much. I could talk to you guys all day for many hours. In fact, I have about Hocus Pocus. So if anybody wants to hear more from these folks and even more folks who worked on uh, Hocus Pocus, I highly suggest checking out these podcast episodes at DisneyCoastToCoast.com, 551, 577, 581, and 669. So much Hocus Pocus goodness. Take a screenshot if you'd like right there. And uh, David and William, thank you for making Halloween even more awesome. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Take care. Great seeing you both. Nice to see you, David, Jeff. Hi. Very All righty. Now we're heading movie. back to whatever. That you definitely haven't seen yet. Jason X is a lot like Friday the 13th, where a group of teenagers help an ill-tempered hockey goalie overcome the loss of his mother. But this time, it's in space. And it's the best. Shut up. It's my favorite one. <laughs> And we are back. I, I see David. Do we have anybody else, David? Or are we, we having we're, a te we're, technical difficulty? Having, well, somebody's having trouble catch, uh, getting on, but just fill us in on uh, where we are today, but as far as you can tell. We've seen, as far as? Like, what's going on at the haunt world right now? It seems like we, we have some Halloween stuff happening in spite of fears. There's no problem out there. What problem are you talking about? Um, no. So <laughs> uh, obviously things are going kind of crazy. The whole world's on fire. I mean, really. But uh, here in America, Halloween's a big deal. And so we've had some of the larger scale haunted attractions um, already pulling the plug uh, on their events. So now the shift is kind of kind of taking a look at what the home haunters are going to be doing around the Southland. And the answer is that's a moving target as well. Uh, we know that a lot of them have gone from doing walkthrough experiences to maybe yard displays or something different. Uh, Chris with Scare Ventures was talking about, you know, they're gonna they're trying to do different things. Um, I know in a, in a little while we'll be hearing from Diane and Preston from Rotten Apple. Uh, they're going to be doing some different things this year. So everything is kind of evolving and changing. It's it's a it's a day by day thing, right? But it does seem that the, the haunters are definitely all systems go as long as they're allowed to go. And so fingers are crossed that things don't, you know, ramp up again with another wave of COVID. We just are kind of in wait and see mode, which is why I think it's going to be really important for us in the weeks ahead to really, um, you know, follow along with these haunters and keep everybody, you know, um, up to date on what's what's happening and what's transpiring in SoCal. Yeah, for sure. Um, who else do we have coming up uh, as we get as you go through the day? What other haunters are we going to hear from? Give your list. Oh God, we're, uh, the Drick Society is coming up. Um, boy, uh, Ryan with um, with the Haunted Rose is coming up. I don't have my notes in front of me, but uh, yeah, and and then we of course are going to have a, a special little little happy hour at at six o'clock, and, and so uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah, we have a lot coming up. Um, yeah, we, good stuff. I'm gonna give a quick review of where we are, um, and then we will have our next uh, bit. So uh, thanks again for joining us. You are watching There in Spirit, Midsummer Scream. We're raising money today for a bunch of charities to help out people impacted by the pandemic, including the Actors Fund, Angelino Campaign, and uh, the United Way's Pandemic Relief Fund. So if you wanna donate, you can go to Midsummer Scream forward slash live, or givebutter.com forward slash there in spirit. Um, 
And uh, let's see what we have coming up here. Quick scan of my schedule. Uh, we're going to be going live with uh, haunts throughout the day. We're going to be checking in at Dirk's Terror Tavern, a new haunted or horror themed bar in Sherman Oaks, which is open sort of, but pandemic has kept people from it. Uh, then we're going to go live to Vegas to talk to Nightmare Toys. Um, and uh, we have more Peep Show. We're going to have Peep Show Menagerie coming up with a burlesque show. Um, and uh, and just a little bit, too, uh, movie star Kelly Maroney is going to be on. But first, right now, we're going to go and we're going to take a look at that Peep Show burlesque. It's ready to roll, so let's do it.
you guys. Uh, me once more. Again, uh, please donate if you can at Midsummer Scream forward slash live. Um, and coming up right now, we're going to, I think, check out another Lovecraft video. Waiting for news from the control room here on what they have on deck. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, oh, we're going to do a Lovecraft video. Find out some more horror music trivia. Let's do it. Hey, Deep Cuts. Hey, Little Pumpkin. Hey, Norman Crates. Hey, Little Pumpkin. Feeling a little spooked. I think I saw a ghost. You saw a ghost? Who are you going to call? Well, it's funny you should ask, because I have another amazing story about how the classic hit song from the soundtrack to Ghostbusters was written. Let's hear it, Little Pumpkin. Actually, Columbia Pictures was looking for a theme song for their Bill Murray classic and wanted a song that was inspired by Huey Lewis in the news, I Want a New Drug. So they reached out to the man himself to see if him and the news could deliver. But unfortunately, Huey didn't want to be known as a soundtrack artist. So the news was that he passed. The studio brought in Ray Parker Jr. and asked him to write a song that was similar to I Want a New Drug. And after going back and forth countless times, we ended up with what we now know as Ghostbusters. What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. They wanted a new drug so bad that they hired someone else to cook one up for them? You know, I never really thought about it, but those two songs sound pretty similar. Maybe we should hear them back to back? It says here in Wikipedia that Ray Parker Jr. came up with the idea to do the song about a fictional business after seeing a cheap commercial for a local service on late night television. He remembered that there was a similar commercial featured in the film, so he ended up writing it like a jingle. Well, he ended up writing it like a jingle written by Huey Lewis. Well, as one might expect when you were inspired by another song, when the song hit the airwaves, Huey was like, Hey dude, that's my song! Columbia made good with Huey and cut him into the version that we all know and love. In another twist, the public wasn't aware of the settlement until 2001, when Lewis leaked the news of the settlement to VH1's Behind the Music, Ray Stance, uh, Ray Parker, ended up suing Huey for breaching confidentiality. On Reddit, Ray Parker said he got a lot of money off of that. Oh, his ghost got busted. Ouch! Youch. Okay, that's enough spooky for today. Let's hear the track. Hey, Deep Cuts, drop that. Oh, hi. <laughs> I just got yelled at from David in the other room. I'm just checking texts, you know, that kind of thing. Hey, everybody. So glad to see you all again, or not see you, but I'm glad to hear that you're here. And um, next up, we have the fabulous Kelly Maroney, a star of cult favorite uh, Night of the Comet and Chopping Mall. Hi, beautiful. How are Hi. you? Oh, I'm so glad to see you, even if it's this far away. I know. It's great. I was just thinking about how um, how we met years ago in acting class. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's been, it's been such an incredible journey. And who knew that we would end up on screen together? Well, we I, it was a different I always thing. wish we would, but uh, yeah. I can't I'm trying to think. It was Women of Manhattan was that scene that we had, we had to do. We did it with Jamie Rose and Alexandra Kenyuk. Oh, right, right, right. Oh, my gosh. I know. Somebody An age ago. Yeah. So, do you have anything that you're working on currently? Or I think, didn't I see something, Some a film you've done is doing really well? Um, I did Exorcism at 60,000 Feet, which is a oh, whole yes. movie, and it's got a whole bunch of horror icons in it. And... Um, and it's it's um, uh, uh, Lance Henriksen and and Bill Mosley and you know everybody. Um, so that's fun. And then uh, I did a short film called um, uh, A Well Respected Man, which uh, is it's more of a drama. However, uh, it's about the 
end of the world kind of thing. Oh, lovely. And in the, yeah. the 90s, <laughs> video thing called, uh, oddly enough, the video store with aliens in it. And cool. um, something that's not, it's not, I don't think it's quite finished yet, but it's a, a Lovecraft thing called The Deep Ones. Fabulous. That's yes. wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, you are going, to, yeah, absolutely. You're going to be reading our next round of donors that have mm -hmm. donated uh, at the Give Butter site. So there you go. Should I go ahead? Go for it. Okay. Yeah. This is wonderful. Thank you for donating. Um, if I murder your name, I'm sorry. I will. It's not going to be intentional. I hope I don't. So we have Brandon Sanforo, Deanna Gomez, Susan Travascus Owen, uh, Callie Halholt, <laughs> Emily Selleck, Rosemary Martinez, Jackie Kretterfeld, Ian Lovecraft, Denise Nunez. Raul Paredes, Norman Gidney, Christina Willis, Michael Arona, Shannon McGraw, Kenneth Stewart, Gail Hoker, Jacqueline Mergevar, Brian Zimmerman, Ryan Albertson, Mindy Rice, and I was just sent two more, hang on, and Last but not least, Russell Eaton and Tina Carter. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me read their names. They should be acknowledged for this. Well, you're awesome. I appreciate it. We're so happy to have you on today. And it's just been such a pleasure to see your face. You too. I love this show so much. And uh, I, I love that you're doing it anyway and that you're doing it for such a good reason. I love you guys. A lot. Thank you, Thank Kelly. You well, we look forward to seeing you live and in person next year. I mean, hopefully before then, but at the show next year. Oh, yes. I'll be there. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. And uh, thanks for everybody that's donating today. That's really cool to hear all the names right off. A lot of uh, Midsummer Screen staff doing that as well, which is very, very nice. Thank you. So we're back for another Haunter preview. And with me, I've got Cameron. There you go. From uh, Insane Haunt Productions. There he is. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good. I'm doing really good. Excited. Good, man. Glad to have you here. Good. So, folks, Cameron, and I love this, and I just got to i got to preface this here. Midsummer Scream really goes out of its way to give a um, showcase to younger haunters because tomorrow's Halloween's belong to these guys. I mean, Cameron, you're you're helping younger younger hunter. You're 18 now. You're helping the younger haunters really kind of define what Halloween and SoCal is, you know, for the next generations. And so I love that we're in the position to really be able to work with younger haunters and give you guys a canvas to paint on every year. And, and even though we couldn't do it in the Hall of Shadows this year, we're doing it here online. And I'm just really glad to have you. How are you and your, your family doing? I'm good. Everybody's good. I hope they're watching now. I'm pretty sure they are. <laughs> good. So, that's good. Um, so tell us, tell us about Insane Haunt Productions. Yeah. So what I'm working on this year is, uh, well, we were planning a, a 16 foot by 34 foot haunt in the middle of our um, street because um, I live in a cul-de-sac. It was going to be a nice little outdoor, somewhat like uh, Halloween Horror Nights. I was really inspired by them to keep it very, very large and um, sure. outdoorsy. And uh, something I want to integrate this year was um, a floor. So I was going to use a floor and texture the floor and make the floor look very um, realistic with everything else. Um, I had, I set up foot pedals. I had everything that I was going to set up for um, having actors just press a button, jump out, everything be done. It was going to be very um, Halloween and Horror Nights inspired. It was going to be great. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah. So what what does Halloween look like now in, in the days of COVID? Uh, yeah. what, what, what's going on with you for, for October? So I'm thinking it over. We were going to have something with a car, but then we we're like, no. And um, so 
we're thinking that we're just going to have half the haunt. It was just going to be a nine foot by 32 foot haunt. That's just going to be a straight walkthrough. There's going to be no actors. There's going to, well, there may be be actors depending on what we're looking at in a, in a few um, weeks. And then um, it was just going to be a straight shot. You were going to not stop. You weren't going to be close to people because there's people that are still going to walk around. I theorize that there's people still going to be trick or treating and they can just walk straight through um, so. yeah. and not be close to anything and not touch anything, but just go straight through. Okay. Well, you know, in the weeks ahead, we are going to be keeping in touch with, with all of our haunters and we're going to let the public know. Uh, certainly all the fans are going to want to know what's going on because obviously with COVID, like everything else, Halloween changes now every day. And we're getting to the point where it's so close that, you know, like I've said before earlier today, like the main haunts, the big, big events are, are canceling. And so all eyes are kind of on the home haunters now uh, to kind of carry, carry the, the, the season forward. So we're hoping fingers are crossed and uh, we will just keep everybody updated. Like I said, in the weeks ahead and until then, just, just keep what you're doing, doing what you're doing, Cameron. And uh, thank you for being here with us today. And we will, uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Okay, man. Yeah, no problem. All right, brother, stay safe. We'll talk soon. Have a good one. Hey, Rick. Uh, again, hey, David. An honor. <laughs> How you hey, doing, man? I wanted to invite you to, to join me on this next live hit. Um, last year, you did a really cool panel on haunted or horror-themed bars. Yeah, um, it was great. And who would we have on that? Uh, <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. You know, we had, so we had uh, The Cauldron was on. Um, God, Fourth Horseman was on. Um, our The Lost Spirits Distillery was on. And... Beetle we House. had also Beetle House was on. Yeah. Well, is that it? We got everybody, right? I think so. And there's a lot you more. Didn't, you didn't tell me there would be a quiz, man. I know. I'm throwing these things at <laughs> you. That's the nature of life. But ah! but uh, a new horror themed bar and restaurant opened up in the midst of the pandemic, uh, which I'd known about mm. for a little bit. Uh, so it's unfortunate we can't go there now. But I thought you'd be the person to bring along with me virtually to. Yeah, I want to see. In Sherman Oaks. Dirk's Terror Tavern. Welcome, Dirk Rogers. Hey, Dirk, how's it going? Oh, no. He's been on, oh. and we just lost him. That's such a tease, man. Oh, well. He'll, he'll come it. back. Will he come back right now, maybe? To reconnect. We're going to vamp. We're going to vamp. What a cool little background he had already. Was that inside the tavern, I hope? Uh, yeah. It, it looks really good. Cool. Wall. And it's I'm really a tease. Wall. They, uh, they have they can do I believe outdoor eating, but you can't go inside and really see the the main attraction. But it's oh supposed to be God. really good food and okay. stuff. Good. Oh, good. There it is. here we go. Hey, I'm back. Hey, thanks for being with us. Uh, you're a little quiet. You. Um, sorry, but we had a little technical difficulty. Well, That's all right. Started. Um, so Show us the place. We're in Sherman Oaks at 13730 Ventura Boulevard. This is the culmination of myself and my uh, wife, Sunny Benson, and my partner, Tony Yanow, uh, to create a very, not only just a horror bar, but everything that celebrates the dark arts. Something along the lines of makeup artists, um, uh, sculptors, painters, anything that I can get in here, anybody that's a fan of horror. So. Just to give you the quick tour, I'll go back to the, our skull wall uh, is a representation of the catacombs of France, and we figured it would be good to have one of those in Sherman Oaks. Um, let's see, I will just kind of do a, a pan. Uh, we have all sorts of different masks. We have Beetlejuice over there. We've got some American World from London. We've got some heads from Hostel. As we come around this way, we have our Creature from the Black Lagoon homage. We also are trying to celebrate some of the lesser known women, Millicent Patrick, the creator, Julie Adams, who of course everybody would know as the talented actress who also wore a white bikini like no one else ever has. Coming along, right along, we come into our main area. Um, originally when I came into this place with Tony, uh, it had already been made to look like a uh, a uh, European basement. So when I came in, it was really easy to get a few ideas. Uh, we're trying to make each of our tables to be uh, themed. So in this area, 
is our haunted mansion. And I will just pan. We have a few props donated by Mr. Greg Nicotero, who's a huge haunted mansion aficionado. Um, let's see if I can get a little bit of a better turn here. Coming over to the table here, we have a lot of our music. Uh, we have things up on the wall, like, let me see if I can position this right. Ozzy Osbourne's hands, Offspring soda can, the beating heart from the Nine Inch Nails video, Closer. In the middle, we have our David Bowie life cast. Um, some of the bad guys from an NSYNC video. Our tables are uh, covered in flyers, old VHS covers. Um, moving right along into this area, our table is covered with old Kaiju posters. Uh, this is our Toho and Daie section. So everything Ultraman, Godzilla, War of the Gargantuas. Nice. Anything important. Um, and is also, whoops, I dropped that. Wait, bring it back, bring it back. We see, yes, we see. Oh, sorry. Greasy hands, greasy hands. Um, so let's see here. Uh, we have a little bit more. Uh, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to keep going. Coming over to this way, we have our main stage. This is where we're going to try to do things like record podcasts, um, have actors in to do signings, um, maybe even get someone like Richard Band to come in and spin the Reanimator soundtrack one night. Uh, let's see here. Coming right along here, we have what we call the main museum area. Um, over this is Big Trouble in Little China. In the cases, we have things like Doc Ock's Claw, Predator 2 Throwing Ring, um, a casting of the original Stegosaurus from King Kong. Oh, this is important. Freddy vs. Jason, foosball table. First of That's time. amazing. Yes, yes absolutely. So Kirk, let's pause it there for a second because there's so much we don't want to spoil it for everyone. Because I trust me, of course. everybody watching this uh, is going to want to go. So, dude, I'm wanting to go. That's really uh, great. And I want to open it. I want you all to come. <laughs> we were to be, be open four days before the COVID shutdown. We were going to open on uh, April first, Long Cheney's birthday, and uh, it just it blindsided us. So, yeah, it's weird to have like the really, really amazing horror museum and to make everyone sit outside it's dirt this is really this is a really cool uh, addition to the la area just really quick what th that's a really cool interior what what was there before you guys uh, right before was a place called bluebird brasserie it's a belgian brew house uh, okay we, so and that gives people a good reference if they maybe are familiar with the area as to where maybe. you guys are exactly we're uh, basically on Ventura Boulevard. Our nearest main cross street would be Woodman. And That's really great, man. Helps and people all. can find you at DirksTerrorTavern.com. Yeah. And, and Instagram, Instagram well. Dirks Terror Tavern. Thanks so much for joining us, Dirk. And uh, we we really do look forward. To, we're gonna we're gonna bring all thirty thousand people from Midsummer Scream. Uh, <laughs> you are all by. welcome. Please come. We have. I mean. There's so much more to show you guys. Alien. Um, there, yeah, wow. we have haunted paintings. It's, oh my God. The, the, oh. I'll run really quick over here. And I'll finish <laughs> just by talking with my friend, the airport zombie from Dawn of the Dead. All right. Well, Love thanks, it. Dirk. We will check in with you as soon as we can. Absolutely. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great rest of the time. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Peace. Hey, uh, we're going to go from Sherman Oaks now all the way to Las Vegas uh, to check in with uh, one of your favorite cosplayers. What? Did she go? Where, did we lose her? Creepy, cute Jayla. Uh, looks like they're almost on again, but uh, Creepy, cute Jayla is uh, the second place winner of our costume contest last year. You will recognize her from being the spookiest kid ever at uh, in the Halloween scene. Um How's it going out there, guys? Right, you, you're muted out there in, in Vegas. Oh, you were getting on the mask. There we go. 
But, but uh, Jayla, tell your dad he's muted. Oh, so we won't be able to hear his screams. But can you guys no? Oh, no. I think, I think we may have lost the connection with our Vegas crew. Uh, how about this? Uh, I think we are going to queue up another fashion show right now. What? Try them again? No? All right. Well, I think it's time for another fashion show. We'll try to get them back on right after. So uh, let's go and check out another uh, Polar Guys and Paramours fashion show. Sitting on porches Thinking how things used to be Dark night Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for joining us to the virtual festivities of Midsummer Scream. My name is Ava Ziegfeld and I am your ghost hostess with the mostess. I hope you're all staying safe at home wearing your Halloween masks. All day long, you are going to have the delectable treasure of being able to watch four frightful fashion shows by Poltergeist and Paramours, as designed by its CEO and founder, Amalia. We are delighted to have a sneak preview of Sean Keller's upcoming album, Killer Sounds of Halloween 2. So nice he had to do it twice. So stay tuned and enjoy the frightful fashions of Poltergeist and Paramours.
Well, <clears throat> my dream is to be a model for poltergeist and paramours. I'm going to work on that. I hope I'll be accepted soon. Let's try going back to uh, Vegas now and creepy cute Jayla. Hey, Gina, how are you doing? I'm in Vegas and it's so cool. Can you hear you? No. I don't know. There, they can hear you now. Where are you right now? Hey guys, it's creepy cute Jayla. I'm currently in the back right now. It's, it's super hot, but it's worth it. We have some slashers here. We have Jason and we have Freddy. And of course, we got Jamie. You got you guys were a nightmare toy in Vegas because you're happy with your friend, I believe, today. It was so hot out there. And it's really hot out. Oh, cool. We're going to get a tour inside of the new Nightmare Toys. Which way are we going to give you a little tour of the shop. Oh, looks like some fun stuff. We have these like these Chucky costumes and a mask. They're like oh, very like, cool. It's like a girl one. Yes. Let's see what else they got. The owner of the store. Hi, Kristen. Hey. Hi, hello, everybody. Hey, How thanks for joining us. <laughs> can you hear me? I don't think you guys can hear me, so just keep on showing me around. Hi everybody, can you I'm Christy, the owner of Nightmare Toys. You can find us on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook, and you can see us on NightmareToys.com is our website. Very cool. Where in Vegas are you? <laughs> and we'll see y'all at Midsummer Scream next year. We have a booth. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. She's going to give you guys a tour of the store. Okay, keep, so oh, keep first going. First, we have these. I think these are like action figures. Yes, I'm actually going to show you the shirts. So, we have so everyone, we're looking inside of Nightmare Toys in Las Vegas, which just opened today. Creepy Cute Jayla is giving us a tour. We're having some audio difficulties with them hearing us, but they're still showing us around. All right. Are we going to guys they have a whole wall full of masks? Let's go look at the masks. And then uh, we're going to go into our next sequence. We're going to be bringing in 13th Floor Entertainment. So, so if, if you can hear me, do you know what part of Vegas this is? These are Jason masks. On this side, and in our hand, we have all these all right, guys. So, again, one more time, we're at Nightmare Toys in Vegas. <clears throat> and now let's uh, let's go and so check out our panel with 13, we're going to check out our panel with 13 Floor Entertainment. Bye. We will see you soon. All right. Let's do 13th Floor. We are here with 13th Floor Entertainment Group, uh, three heads from that. We have Chris Stafford, CEO, Warren Conrad, Director of Operations, and Creative Director John Cook. How are you guys doing? Doing good, man. How are you? Doing good. Are you guys all in, uh, Chris and Warren, are you guys in Denver? We are, yeah. Yeah. And how is it out there today? Denver's pretty good, man. I, You know, the weather's been nice and... and uh, you know, our virus related issues have been fairly moderate. So that's good news over here. Um, yeah, things have been good. It was been, it's been a hot summer so far, but this week it cooled off finally a little bit. So, and, and John, you're in, uh, you're a man in Cali. Yes, sir. All right. Yep. So, uh, 13th floor entertainment group, uh, the group has how many haunted houses across the U S we have uh, 15 uh, haunted Halloween attractions across the country. That's pretty cool. Um, and then within that, you guys have, I, I, I've been, and I know you guys have a lot of stuff going on. Give me a, give, give the audience a feel of what else you guys do. It's not just that. 
Yeah, you do. Uh, we do haunted houses uh, for Halloween, and uh, then in addition to that, we have a, a location-based entertainment uh, division of the company that we have uh, room escape locations, uh, axe throwing locations, and then uh, in addition to that, we also do some family Halloween festival uh, stuff as well. That's very cool, and um, I think what would be great is we're going to run a video now, which. Uh, it's a couple minutes long, but it really gives the breadth of what you guys do. That's that's amazing. Um, so, give me the, the how long have you guys been with Thirteenth Floor? <sighs> wow, longer than uh, we'd care to say, probably. <laughs> Warren, Warren, and I actually met when we were teenagers uh, working at a haunted house, and uh, kind of the the genesis for everything was us talking about, you know, what it would be like if we did our own haunted house one day. And uh, we ultimately ended up doing that together in 2002. Um, and then uh, started our first haunted house in 2008. Then uh, we started the first uh, 13th floor haunted house, which was in, in Denver, where we are. Um, then in 2009, uh, we met uh, John Love and Dan McCullough at the House of Torment uh, in Austin, Texas, and found out that we both thought about growing our businesses the same way and looking to grow you know, outside of our home markets and ended up uh, joining forces with them. And that was kind of the creation of, of 13th Floor Entertainment Group. And we opened our first uh, joint venture with them in 2010 uh, in San Antonio and uh, been growing ever since. Wow. And Warren, what were you doing before you got, when you, before you became a professional haunter? Yeah, you know, um, like Chris said, we met when we were 16, uh, you know, in our teens. And, and so we've been doing this ever since we were kids. Uh, but I've done a lot of things through college, you know, marketing. I had a searchlight advertising company, rented hot tubs, uh, a lot of different things until we could finally say, let's do this full time. And I think that was uh, probably 15 years ago, Chris, wouldn't that sound about right? Where we just said, let's go in all all in on this and and uh um really try to try to do it full time and and we've made it work so far so it's it's been we've done a lot of different things both of us have and um did you, you know, say like, hot tub rental <laughs> we did hot tub rentals when warren warren always tells me if he wasn't doing haunted houses he'd be doing monster trucks <laughs> yeah, <that's> cool <laughs> yeah we both had other you know, careers up until, gosh, about 2009, 2010 um, is when we kind of went full time um, with 13th Floor, which is, like I said, around the same time that we opened, you know, that we looked to open San Antonio and we looked to really start growing the business. And, um, you know, obviously didn't have the bandwidth to be doing other things like renting hot tubs and search lights. And, <laughs> right. Uh, my, my, my career was much more boring. It was in banking and, you know, behind a desk a lot. So. 
Well, it, I mean, that's that's pretty good. Those are good skills that I think a lot of hunters do need if they're going to go pro, which is marketing and finances. Yeah. And uh, the fact that you guys brought that out with your passion for haunted houses is pretty pretty amazing. But um, yeah. but it also shows people with different backgrounds can uh, become professional in something creative yeah. that they love. Yeah, for sure. And and you know Dan and John, um, you know that that we formed Thirteenth Floor with. Um, you know, John had a background in, in promotion. Um, he promoted some live music events, um, in Austin, Texas, and Dan, um, was a contractor. So you know, on the building side, um, you know, so we all had a, a real complementary skill set, which, uh, served us well. And then last year, uh, I think is the, is the first time a lot of people in Southern California had really heard of you because you guys took over what had been one of the more most dominant haunt hunted attractions in SoCal, which is the LA Haunted Hayride. Do you want to yeah. talk a little bit about how that came together and how this guy John Cook got involved? Yeah. So um, yeah, we we acquired the Hayride a couple of years back, and um, interestingly enough, uh, Melissa Carbone and I had a mutual friend, um, and uh, we were kind of on our on each other's radar for a while, you know, in the same business, but really didn't know each other. And then found out that we shared a connection and um, ended up connecting with Melissa and, and discussing what it would be like to acquire the Hayride and, and bring that into the, the 13th floor family. Um, so we did that a couple of years ago. Um, really the first year that we had it, you know, just learned a lot about the operation and, and um, kind of how, how it works. And then mm -hmm. uh, last year was kind of the first year of like, really taking what Melissa and her team knew and then, you know, what the 13th floor team had to bring to the table and um, kind of putting things together and, and uh, uh, kind of creating a bit of a new direction, you know, for the Hayride. And at the same time, um, and we talked about this last year at Midsummer Scream, but um, John was also someone that was on my radar, you know, where, I didn't know John and, um, but I'd heard of him and, you know, heard a lot of good things and, um, ended up connecting with him and, and, um, I've told the story before, so I'll keep it short, but, you know, a lot of the stuff that he said he did, uh, in his past employment, I was, I was a fan of, you know, that I had seen and, and really enjoyed. And, and at first I thought he was full of it, you know, I'm thinking somebody saying, Oh yeah, I did that. And I did that. And, and I was like, well, I really like that. And so, you know, I kind of, I kind of researched it because I was like, I don't know if this guy's blowing smoke or what, but, um, you know, clearly he wasn't, and he has an awesome, uh, background within, uh, our industry. And, and, uh, we decided to work together on, you know, kind of creating that new direction for Hayride last year. Um, and I'll let, you know, I'll let John talk about the creative direction there, but, we ended up working really well together and I, it was a good relationship and, and uh, you know, very happy with how things were going and, and ultimately ended up bringing John on board with 13th floor full time to focus, not just on Hayride, but all of our other attractions across the country as well. So um, yeah, it's kind of how it came. Cool. So, so John, um, with, with Hayride, it had been around uh, sort of what, 2006, 2007, They've been around a number of years, um, doing great stuff. When you came to it, what was your approach to um, put put your own take on it? So I uh, I visited the Hayride religiously every year. Um, and I was always a big fan of the events. Um, and what I what I really really enjoyed about the Hayride was when you visit the Hayride out in the middle of Los Angeles, you feel like you're lost in the woods almost. Um, it feels like you're truly transported out of LA and into this whole other um, world. So when uh, you know when we started to look at the creative uh, uh, creative reboot behind the event, um, that was going to be our our main cornerstone on, on which to build the creative off of was to really make it feel like this uh, this town of Midnight Falls coming to life out in the middle of the woods and. Um, really having that experience of being in the L being in the middle of Los Angeles, but really uh, feeling like you're, you're lost in a, in an East coast celebration of Halloween uh, 
that's trapped in the eighties. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, now, you know, your background is you've worked with uh, pretty much every major attraction in Southern California, but Hayride's different. It's all outside it and it's a ride. What challenges did that present for you? So the, the one thing, the one thing about the Hayride that I didn't know, um, it's essentially, uh, I would consider it a pop-up event. Um, you know, we, we were starting to work on all the creative and all these, uh, all the different sets and stuff. And then I think, I don't remember when the, the dreadful question was asked of, well, how long, how long of a load in window do we have? In which Chris said, uh, about 14 days. Oh no, 12 days. Oh no, 10 days. <laughs> Um, so I would say to me, that's the largest, that's the largest obstacle is to create, you know, a, a high quality attraction event, um, you know, with up to date modern technology uh, and install it all into a park with zero infrastructure in less than two weeks, I would say is definitely the major challenge. And it doesn't help that the park is uh, cursed, as far as I know. It's How'd cursed, guys... not, yeah. It's cursed with ghosts and demons and just regular people walking around while you're trying to build things. And <laughs> uh, what's the cra what's the craziest thing that happened uh, during the event, uh, like supernatural wise? I don't even know. You know, the thing is, like we 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 were living and breathing that that build, right? Like we were we were camping on property working, you know, 16 to 20 hours, um, and then turning around and doing it again. So it's all kind of a blur and you know, you're not really sure like what's your fault and what you can blame on the paranormal, <laughs> you know, at right. that point. Um, or the residents of Los Angeles. Yeah. yeah it, you never know. It was, uh, it was definitely, um, an experience though. And it, and it was a fun one, you know, and when it was over, it's like, Oh man, Glad that's over, but quickly after that, you're starting to starting to to miss it and, and can't wait to do it all over again. Yeah. Well, that sort of brings us to uh, the big old spooky elephant in the room, which is uh, what does this year look like right now, or what can you speak to on that? I think everybody's, you know, uh, Bond Halloween is is not looking good, and uh, we just have to be safe. Yeah, I, you know, listen, <laughs> piggybacking on what John said, um, whether you call it fortunate or unfortunate, we get a very short load in window. Um, but that also means that, you know, we're really not setting up Hayride until very close to the event happens. Um, we've not given up hope this year and we're still, um, you know, working and moving forward. Um, but we have the luxury to wait a little longer than, than some do to have to announce what they're doing. Um, you know, so we're hopeful, you know, we want to do something. Uh, we're also realistic and we know that that might not be an option. And, uh, you know, of course, whatever we do, we will only do under the, um, strict understanding on our point that, uh, we can keep everyone safe. So, you know, still working a lot on that. Um, but if we can't operate a uh, hayride this year, um, we've got kind of a plan B in the works, um, that we're not really ready to talk about yet. Um, but, you know, listen, we want to bring some form of Halloween entertainment to Southern California. You know, so much has been canceled that it would be great um, to put something together that people could enjoy. And, and we're going to keep pressing forward for that. Absolutely. That sounds really good. I mean, we, Halloween can't be canceled. It's just you right. need to find it's ways really to fun. celebrate. Yeah, exactly. And, it's, and it's, uh, been, it's been refreshing almost, you know, that... Um, I think when everything got tough and, and, you know, it was like things are starting to look rough that, you know, it was refreshing to be on this team that, that didn't want to just say, you know, let's, let's shelve it until next year. Uh, let's, let's try and uh, work through the issues and, and try and come up with some solutions. Uh, it's that, you know, for, I've said this before, I think the hardest thing um, about taking a, a year off is the fact that you're, you're not going to be haunting um you could be missing out on a haunting that year. And that's a really tough pill to swallow. So it, it's exciting, um, even though it's, it's a lot of work and it's hard and uh, we're having to do a lot of problem solving. It's um, it, it's awesome to be, still be working towards something. And like Chris mentioned, we do have a couple uh, really awesome plan Bs. And I would say even plan Cs in place. So, you know, uh, hopefully this year we'll be able to see everybody out and uh, celebrate Halloween. That's great. If anybody can do it, you guys can. And I hope that even if uh, – 
<laughs> if you guys do go forward, I imagine these plan B's and C's could be some pretty amazing things in the future as well. I mean, this I think this situation has really uh, focused or pushed everyone to, to really think outside the box and get creative with things. And I think there's a few things we've stumbled upon. It's like, oh, wow, this is actually uh, pretty awesome. You know, and I think uh, even moving forward in a post COVID world, uh, there'll be awesome things that we can implement as well. Cool. So um, on a more positive note, I kind of want to hear, I'm uh, springing this on you, but your favorite Halloween memory. Warren, do you have one? Gosh, it, it's tough to pin one down as a favorite. Um, as a, what did you dress up as as a kid? You know, the, the, the costume that comes to mind, my mom at some point, I was, I was little, maybe four, she made a, an outfit that was a skeleton. Um, and my mother's passed away, but in, in the house that uh, she had, we actually found that old costume. And, and it was, you know, with, without her support and making all those costumes when I was a kid and letting me decorate the house and playing, you know, the thrilling, chilling sounds of Halloween on a record um, with a speaker in the window when I was a kid, I probably wouldn't be doing this now. So um, a lot of those childhood memories of, of not wanting to trick or treat so much, but do something for the neighborhood. Um, I was I was that kid. And that was special. That's really cool. Yeah, that that album. You know, that was gold as a kid. Uh, Chris, what about you? You know, mine's fairly recent. So um, I guess not super recent, but about eight years ago, we moved into a new neighborhood, um, bought a new house, and ended up talking to one of our neighbors prior to the season. They were, you know, talking about what, you know, what I did for a living and in the, in the haunted houses and Long story short, they go, oh, well, you know that our neighborhood is a is a destination neighborhood for Halloween. And I said, no, I, did, I didn't know that. What does that mean? And she said, well, we get about 400 trick-or-treaters here. And I was like, oh, you're, you're kidding me. Like, in in many places, trick-or-treating has is, is been on the decline for so many years that it was, like, refreshing to hear that. So, of course, going into Halloween, um, my kids uh, were of the age they were starting to get – you know, kind of involved in, in what I did in Halloween and, you know, trick or treating themselves. So I said, well, we've got to do something for Halloween at our house. And I uh, brought home some stuff, some different projections and put projections in our windows and put a fog machine outside and some lighting and sound. And, and uh, it was funny because I probably set it up in about, I don't know, a few hours and, you know, my kids got to help me and it was, it was, you know, kind of a, an awesome Halloween experience when usually I'm just working on Halloween. And then when it got dark and the trick-or-treaters started, you know, pouring in, um, you know, my house, they're, they're all standing in front of my house with their cell phones out and taking video and, oh, this is amazing. And it was, it was hysterical to me because it was something I threw together so quickly and, and they were so impressed by it. And meanwhile, I'm going, okay, you know, 20 minutes down the road here, I have something that's a hundred times as impressive as this, but it felt like that was like the coolest thing I had ever did. So that I'd ever done, excuse me. So um, that was my most recent memory for Halloween. That was pretty cool. And it's pretty cool that we get that many, that many trick or treaters and that I happened upon a, a destination neighborhood and didn't even know it. Yeah, well, I love that you're doing haunted houses all the time, and you still get super excited by trick or treaters. You're not like yeah. go away kids. That's right. And John, John, uh, what about you? Tell us your favorite Halloween memory. Um, yeah, I think mine mine comes with every with every Halloween seems to be my favorite memory. You know, I think I'm at that the age of uh, my son is at the age where he just goes nuts um, for trick or treating. Uh, you know, he can't sleep um, the night before. He can't sit still before, you know, we're getting ready to go out. So I think, um, you know, watching him get dressed up and just run around the uh, and terrorize the neighborhood like a maniac that he is, is probably <laughs> my favorite, my favorite um, part of Halloween. And it's kind of my favorite memory every year. Very cool. Well, thanks, guys, for, for joining us on this. Do you have anything else you want to add before we, we close? I think we're good. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, I, I'm. Uh, it's a it's a bummer that um, you know we're not uh, in Long Beach for Midsummer Scream, but um, I'm, I'm happy we're able to do this and, and connect on this. And thank you for 
for organizing um, something for, for us and the fans to be able to, to kind of come together and, and check out and get our minds off of the craziness of the real world. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, thanks for yeah. spending your time with our, our audience. I know they really appreciate it. Um, and uh, coming up a little bit on the USC, the TEA USC channel, um, your cohort, uh, Amy Hoffman, is going to be doing a, a seminar talking all about haunted attraction operations, which is, uh, I know she's a good instructor, and uh, I know she's going to be laying down some good info. So keep doing oh, yeah. that. And uh, that's it. We'll have a happy Halloween season, guys. Hope to talk to you before that. With uh, hopefully you'll be back on with our, doing a live stream with us, talking about uh, an announcement for Hayride or whatever else you guys have going on across the country. Stay tuned. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Our club, TA at UCSD, took over the design and execution of this project back in 2017. And since then, we've collaborated with a myriad of students from different backgrounds to bring two mazes to fruition, with a third in active design process for the upcoming season. Our first maze, The Last Resort, was directed by Sochi Corey and Robbie Ketchum, and took place in a gym on campus. It broke an attendance record for UCSD and was so successful that it led to a partnership between our club and the University Events Office, as well as a design competition for a Halloween maze for students across the nation. Since then, each year, we've brought on new creative directors to bring fresh ideas to maze and its leadership. Last year, we debuted Petrified, a maze that took place in a theater on two different floors, led by Jared Walker and Miranda May. This maze had more creators, actors, operators, effects, and guests than its previous iteration. Each year has shown an evolution in effects, scope, and attendance. For example, we use simple and common effects like the drop portrait across both years. Effects such as these offer excellent practice for our students in engineering and designing a prop and they provide a fruitful challenge for our creative teams to fit the effect into the story each year. The maze has also provided our team an opportunity to develop AV and interactive effects for guests. For example, in The Last Resort, we created a room that showed a murder but no gore. This was done using projection and a planted actor that guests were led to believe was a member of their group. Action. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Between the actor, the timing of the actor, and the projection itself, the effect was successful enough that we brought it back for Petrified. This time, we used the same planted actor idea in a new way we called the Sacrifice Room, where we trapped guests and showed the plant being stabbed right in front of them. Using more advanced AV, amazing prosthetics, and incredible acting, we pulled off a scare that we are quite proud of. We pushed our talented team even further. The way we went about this was by adding a themed queue, which included a cloudy moon projection and a photo op, as well as adding a large animatronic spider to freak out the arachnophobes in our audience. We are deeply thankful for our long-running partnership with the school, as it has allowed us to iterate our design practices and learn hands-on lessons we wouldn't have been able to pick up in school otherwise. And now, catching up to current time, I'm the director of the newest iteration of the project, Wonderland. Wonderland is our unique take on the good gone bad version of Alice in Wonderland. To me, Alice in Wonderland is always read as a fever dream jotted down on paper. Our goal is to design a walkthrough experience that steeps guests in that fever dream feeling and punctuates it with moments of terror. In order to achieve this, we're putting a huge emphasis on practical effects and we're leaning into the strengths that we've seen from our team in earlier years. This means doubling down on classic scares like the drop portrait and pushing our costuming and prop design teams to create horrifying iterations of Carol's characters. Wonderland is shaping up to be our most immersive experience yet. In an effort to create a COVID safe experience, we've had to change up the design of Wonderland quite a bit. As such, Wonderland has gone from a conventional walkthrough haunt to a much more intimate but social distancing safe experience that blends escape room elements into the traditional walkthrough experience creating something in the same vein as Not Scary Farms Trapped. In it, guests will find themselves confronted by the denizens of Wonderland, completing strange tasks at their behest in order to move forward. And while this added interaction has certainly created some unique design challenges, especially regarding COVID, it's also allowed us to create a much more interactive, 
immersive, and most importantly, safe experience than we ever thought possible for a student project like ours. We are so excited to show off Wonderland for y'all today and to continue to see where this Halloween project takes our team in the future. Hey, thank you, UCSD, TEA at UCSD, for sending in that video and letting us know what they're doing down there. Um, we've discovered some really cool projects that colleges are doing with themed entertainment and um, especially haunted attractions, which have been pretty amazing. Our partner on this today is TEA at USC. And if you go over, uh, if you go to our website, at Midsummer Screen forward slash live, you can click over and uh, check out what they're talking about today. They've got a bunch of classes. And at six o'clock, they actually have a class all about what colleges are doing using Halloween attractions. And for that, they have uh, who you saw there at TEA at UCSD, as well as uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University, which I believe built a dark ride uh, as, as a big school project. Uh, coming up in a second, Harvey Gillen's gonna come and join us. But first, uh, we have a performance by Nancy Nightmare and the Wizard. Thank you so much for having us. This is Horror Queen. One, two, three. I'm a horror, horror queen, a victim of the silver screen. I'm a horror, horror queen. I'm never gonna get away. Nightmare.com and remember, stay safe and stay, stay spooky. 
Hey, we are back, and we're going to go live now with the star of What We Do in the Shadows, Harvey Gillen. Hey, how's it going? How you doing? Good. I was just singing my new favorite song, I'm a Horror Queen. Oh, there you go. <laughs> We've got some good performances of another one coming up. Um, so uh, you're here in Los Angeles, I believe, with us. Um, mm -hmm. How are you spending your time in quarantine? You know, I've been keeping busy, surprisingly enough. I just, uh, you know, we went into quarantine right about the time the show was about to uh, air for the second season. And so I kind of got busy and started doing something for the fans, uh, what we do uh, before The Shadows, uh, which is where we just bring on the producers, the writers, some of the actors and costumer and whatnot for the show to get all that behind the scenes stuff that people had so many questions about, like the costumes or the set decor and all that. And uh, I was like, why don't we just bring those people to the fans? And so I created that show before the shadows and that kept me pretty busy through quarantine. It was a full-time kind of job uh, to find all the resources and find those uh, people to interview and time zones were different. People were in New Zealand and London. So that kept me busy and writing and uh, of course, just uh, you know, promoting the show all together. I mean, I watched a number of those. Those were a lot of fun. It, it just surprises me how much of the personality of the actors actually shows up in the characters. So it, it didn't feel too weird. I mean, they weren't as, as, as dumb, so to speak, as the, the vampires, of course, but um, yeah. just, it just seems like such a fun cast to work with. Oh yeah, the, it's great. And also that's funny that you said that because people are always like, oh, I watched the show, you're not Guillermo. And I was like, no, that's the, that's the character. <laughs> and I'm the actor and it's uh, two different people, but uh, I love you know qualities that Guillermo has. I wish I had some of those qualities myself. Yeah. Um, like patience, he has lots of patience. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm more like Colin Robinson. You know, Colin's one of my favorite characters. So if that's the case, everyone knows a Colin. We can all sustain, like, you know, like we can all like, you know, stand a Colin for a short period of time. I think after a while. And Mark does that too. I can't tell if sometimes he's just, you know, messing with me and like just uh, is sitting next to me and doing like a whole monologue and spiel or if, if he's really just trying to like bore me to death. So he does that on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and you have some other projects you're working on that I think are coming out. Yeah, I have a Room 104. The last season is coming out. Uh, it just uh, premiered, but the episode that I, uh, I'm i in is the first week of September. So that's next month. Uh, so yeah, a month from this week. So you can watch Room 104 on HBO uh, as it does its farewell season. And I'm really excited for this new film that I shot, Werewolves Within, um, that had an amazing cast in it. It was just like Sam Richardson, uh, Michaela Watkins, like you name it, it was like the, the cast was amazing. That should come out next year. So Werewolves Within, it's a really cool whodunit. Absolutely, and more more, more uh, paranormal, supernatural, you know, the more we love it. And, and again, <laughs> congratulations on your Emmy uh, for what we do in the shadows. Thank That's you. Cool. Um, yeah, that was exciting. That was a, a, a you know, you never expect things because, you know, uh, you don't want to feel like entitled to anything. So it was just like, a, we'll see. And uh, and I think I, I almost thought we didn't get nominated for a second because when Leslie was saying the announcements, I think she right before us was like Marvelous Maisel, which was, I think, the winner last year. And so I was like, mm -hmm. oh, well, they usually end with the winner. So that's probably the end of the list. And I don't know, I don't know why in the back of my head I was like, oh, you know, we didn't get it. And then she quickly said, oh, what we do in the shadows? And I was like, what? And it was like, I dropped my guard for a second and that's when it popped up on screen, which is really cool. Uh, and I immediately was like, I, you know, capture that moment of just uh, how awesome that felt to to hear your name and the, you know, and watch the show pop up and like, uh, it just, it was really cool, really cool experience. Very cool. Um, well, thanks for joining us. As you know, today's a, a, a big uh, telethon. We're trying to raise some money for some good causes. Um, yeah. And uh, I know that you've been doing some stuff. You, you recently, you've launched a shirt sale. You're raising money for, what was the benefit for? Chirla, which is an organization that helps uh, families uh, with um, immigration. Uh, we have, uh, it's based out of here in Los Angeles, but it helps people and families all over. So I'm really excited to, um, part of the proceeds from the, the official Harvey Guillen fan club shirt uh, are gonna go to that. So I'm really excited about that. If you wanna get your shirt, you should just go to uh, Topher's website, imafoolishmortal.com. And Topher's such an amazing artist, so yeah. it's so cool to collaborate with him. Um, so just go to the website and just type in Harvey Guillen and it should pop up and you're helping and also looking stylish by wearing a cool yeah. official shirt. <laughs> for sure, well, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for you know really being invested in the, the horror community and 
uh, being a good representative of that and coming oh, in last I love year. It. I, love, and, I love, you know, all of uh, the fandom. I love this community. I love, you know, shout out to like, you know, Creepy Kingdom who like, you know, supports yeah. and Michelle Halloween. Like, um, I just love the people who, who support us and you know I'm a big believer and um, in giving back. So like I I love this genre. So I'm really excited that I get to be a part of it. And also the fact that the show got nominated, which is so rare to have like a show that deals with like you know supernatural or like you know creatures and whatnot be at the helm of a, a nomination. That's kind of really cool and unique, and it's kind of never been done. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks again. Uh, we hope to see you in person soon. Um, but uh, Stay safe, and uh, we, we hope you actually get to shoot the next season on time because I'm, I'm ready for yeah, season Yeah, we're working on it. We're working on the uh, dates uh, as we speak, so we're trying to get that out to you guys ASAP, and we are close to, to doing it, and we're doing it safely, and we're going to do it. Um, you know, We don't want to jeopardize the quality of the, of the work and the show and the storylines for you guys, so uh, it's been months in the making of how to do it right, and I think we're getting close to it. So we're pretty close, but... Uh, we're getting we're getting there and we'll get you guys uh, season three filmed as soon as possible all right thanks so much thanks harvey thanks have a good one bye, bye. welcome back everybody first of all i think that we all agree that everyone needs a chair like harvey had right i'm certainly jealous of that chair Anyway, we're back with another Haunter preview, and this time we've got Sean from the Direct Society. Hey, there he is. What's up, hey. my brother? How are you? Hey, not too bad. How about you? Hanging in, hanging in, man. So uh, you guys have been a big part of the Hall of Shadows and Midsummer Scream for the past several mm -hmm. years. What uh, what were you planning this year, and what what part of that gets covered or carried over into your into your Halloween event that you're going to go forward with this year? So this year is kind of a spirit sequel to what we did last year. Last year, as you know, it was Fear Fest '89. This year, it's Fear Fest 1941, where we're doing all of the classic monsters. You're going to go through Frankenstein's Laboratory, uh, the Phantom of the Opera sewers, uh, the Forest from the Wolfman, and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, we did have a small casualty from last year our elevator broke. No! Yeah, the elevator kind of collapsed in on itself. So it's, we tried salvaging it. There was nothing we could do, but we are going to be replacing it with a bigger, meaner, better effect that should be debuting either next year or the year after. We're working okay. diligently on it. That's awesome, man. Good to hear. Good to hear. So like I said, th things you know, obviously are funky this year because yeah. of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, has that altered your plans for your haunt or how are you how are you seeing yourself executing the haunt this year so what we're doing is instead of doing three nights we're actually going to be only doing two nights and since everybody has been really cool with us in the haunter community and has been reaching out and checking up on us we decided that the friday before we open on halloween we're going to be doing Haunter and Blogger Appreciation Night, and that's Friday, October 30th. Any haunters and bloggers that want to come out, just so, go ahead and send us a direct message on our Instagram, and we'll just be more than happy to host you. And then on Saturday, Halloween itself, we are going to be using a reservation system. We're not quite sure how that's going to be working out quite yet, but we're getting the bugs fi figured out and everything, so that way it can go flawlessly. Dude, that's awesome. And obviously you're you're thinking things through. So that's that's what we mm -hmm. want to hear. Good, right. good, good, good. Now you said that you have you have something, you have you have a little surprise, a little little yes, art show? Yes, yeah, I've got two pieces do, of detail. Oh yeah. So um for next year's Hall of Shadows, yeah. we are going to be rounding out our Fear Fest trilogy with an original maze called Fear Fest Grindhouse. And it's going to be the uh. biggest facade that we've ever done. Um you think the movie theater facade was awesome. Wait until next year when you see our, uh, there we go, 18 to 20 foot drive-in movie theater. Love it. Yep, it's gonna love be, it, uh, love it. we're gonna have a screen there. We're gonna be playing uh, fake movie trailers for all of the movies. All of the movies that we're gonna be featuring are going to be uh, parodies of famous B movies. So if you remember uh, late, Late 1970s, early 80s, all of those, the slashers and the sci-fi flicks and everything. And yes. I've actually got one right here. My buddy Taylor Jackson, great, great artist. He did one of our first uh, movie poster sketches for one of the movies called Dino Warriors of the Year 3000. Oh, that's awesome, yeah, dude. This is going to be one of the movies that you are going to be walking through. That's hilarious. That is so cool. 
Well, that's there you go. Movie. You heard it here first. That's going to be uh, Midsummer Scream 2021. Hall of Shadows, baby. We're excited. Our fifth anniversary, right? So it's going to be bigger and better than ever. Bigger that's better. great. Yep. Dude, thank you so much. And in the weeks ahead, you know, we've been saying this all along today. In the weeks ahead, I think that it would behoove us just to, we're going to continue to keep in touch with our haunters and kind of keep a finger on the pulse of what's going on, because obviously things do change day to day with COVID. And so we're going to, we're going to keep everybody informed. We're going to have you back and we're going to do even more deep dives in the weeks ahead as to what the community can expect for the Halloween season this year. So I'm looking forward to that, man. And you'll be a part of that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm excited. Awesome, brother. Great. Well, dude, thank you for being with us. Much love to your 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 team there. And uh, stay safe, brother. And uh, try to stay cool. It's hot, hot, hot. Oh, and yeah. uh, <laughs> we will talk to you very soon. Okay? All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Rick. I'll see you. Best. Hey everyone, we are now here with Alexander Montoya with Confessions of a Zombie Killer Clothing and Dangerous D, uh, Sideshow King. Um, Alexander and, and D, I have a, an event coming up that they uh, want to tell you guys about called Living the Scream. What's it all about? So Living the Scream is a horror art gallery. It's a horror slash photo booth where you see a lot of live art. Uh, a lot of horror art, uh, you'll see live demos, uh, FX demos uh, going on in the horror photo booth. So you'll be able to take three uh, photos with uh, with the pinup zombie. You got uh, we got Jinx the Clown, uh, Jinx the uh, Jinx the Fool. Uh, he'll be performing as well. Yeah. Uh, um, and then uh, so we also have uh, mini horror shows as well. Uh, some of the horror, mini horror shows involve uh, is Dangerous D right here, who you see right here, Extreme Stunt Entertainer. Uh, we have uh, Brett Allen, a horror magician, and we have uh, a senior musician as well. We have her name's Asha. Um, you can see her at uh, Asha Makes Music on Instagram. Um, so it's definitely a lot of live art. Uh, I just wanted to create a, a, a Halloween horror themed event uh, based on uh, just artists and, and all their hard work and, and they put in so people could see uh, what they do and admire their work and stuff like that and uh, network. Uh, with the artists and, uh, you know, possibly be inspired by them. It's really all about the artists and just, you know, the, the hard work they put into it. You know, I just want people to see their work, you know, and, uh, you know, be good for, um, you know, Halloween horror theme, horror theme event this year. So, but yeah, um, we got about, uh, it's a smaller venue as well. Um, you know, there's only about 220 tickets available. Uh, trying to keep everything safe for, for uh, you know, this whole pandemic going on and stuff like that. That sounds that sounds great. Uh, what what would you say makes this event unique and different than any other? I think the fact that it's uh, a horror art gallery. Um, I haven't actually seen any of those. Uh, also, the photo booth as well. Uh, you know, everybody's taking pictures and stuff like that. But I just kind of like want to dedicate it just to uh, you know the, the you know the makeup artist, the you know the horror photographer, which is uh, Joel Sanchez from uh, Enigma Photography Eight One Eight. So he'll be running the horror photo booth. Um, and, uh, you know, I just really wanted to, you know, really have people just come in, take a look, see the, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, the makeup being put in, put on, on the monsters. And then, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, having to see that from transition from, you know, step one all the way down to taking the picture with them. They got to see all this created right in front of their eyes. So uh, it's definitely an artist show uh, dedicated to artists and um, as well as art, art as well, horror art. That sounds cool. Really cool. Um I know that we're signed up to, to possibly then there, assuming yeah. it's safe, and I'm hoping it is, because yeah. I want to get out and see people again. Uh, <laughs> who are your other events planned? Uh, so what was that? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Couldn't tell tell me some of the other vendors that are that you have lined up as oh, of so, right now. So I got, uh, of course, uh, Midsummer on there. So some of the vendors are uh, myself, Zombie Killer Clothing. I got Mary, Contrary Dame. She sells jewelry. It's goth, uh, all goth. Got jewelry. Uh, we got Rags to Riches. Uh, Rags to Witches, which is uh, also Ben's at Midsummer as well. Yeah, we got Funk, Desiree. We got, yeah, yeah, she's uh, that's a good. She got some good stuff out there. We got Funk and Pop You. We got Jane's Earful Creations. We got uh, Dreadfully Cute Designs. 
Uh, we got uh, After Hours Fun. We got MBO Grave. We got Two Two Cute Two Spook Boutique. Uh, we got Goth on the Budget. Uh, you know, a lot of jewelry. Um, oh, another one we got is uh, uh, Black House Creations. He does uh, like lighter sleeves and um, um, uh, horror phone cases and stuff like that. He's got some cool sculpting stuff. Uh, he's a sculptor, so he's got, he's got some cool um, uh, horror uh, phone cases and stuff like that. And, um, and for people. For people to find out about the event, where do they go? Uh, they would go to Living the Scream, Living the underscore Scream on Instagram, uh, and you could click on actually sell uh, ticket sales. Uh, free tickets go uh, go out on uh, uh, July thirty first. Uh, they'll be available by the time this airs. So, uh, yeah, it's free. The event's free. Um, there's a it's a, all broken down into hours as well. So uh, there are hour shows and. Uh, Every uh, every hour, I have uh, there's 40 tickets available, so it's a really a smaller event. I'm um, trying to keep everything safe. It was 60, but uh, I dropped it down to 40 because uh, of this whole COVID uh, stuff going on, and I just wanted people to be comfortable and you know just enjoy a Halloween event. Right. And what are the dates? One more time. So it's uh, September 26th. Uh, it's from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. and uh, each uh, each uh, from 4 to 5. There'll be hour slots that you can get. Uh, there's 40 tickets available. Uh, to go ahead and then um, uh, attend the show. And then every hour there will be a 20 minute horror show as well. So uh, you can take your picture, uh, get your horror character done. We have a horror character artist going there and, uh, as well. Um, you get your picture done and then you get to see a 20 minute uh, minute. So is, is Dangerous D performing at the event? That's correct, yes he is. <laughs> now. This is a rare pre-recorded segment during Saturday's telethon. And one of the reasons why we have to pre-record this stuff is because Dangerous D wants to perform or we're not sure what we need to censor. So we may wow. need to blur out some stuff. Uh, we, we may need to bleep some things. I'm not sure, but- uh, I'll, try to behave myself. I'll try to behave myself, but you never- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be, be true to yourself. We'll we'll be, we'll be responsible for the uh, for the bleeping. I can't get. But that was great. But, uh, I can show you something a little while. I'm gonna give you a little taste, a little taste of what we're gonna do. My name is Dangerous D. I'm gonna break out all the stops, but I'm gonna show you a taste. You can see here I have in my hand. It is a real nail. Doesn't bend, fold, or retract in any way. And I'm gonna show you something called the human blockhead. And you have to be a real blockhead to do this. <laughs> it's a real show stunt, but I'm going to show you something here. But before I do, I need to teach you about anatomy. If you draw a line from top to bottom and left to right, where is the center of the skull? Yes, that's right. It's the nose. And if you break through the mucous membrane that runs in between the nasal cavity and the cranium, you can stick just about anything in there. Just like this. You do have to lick it before you stick it. It's the entertainment business. Last week I sneezed, I put a hole in the wall. This is the best part watching it come out. <laughs> oh, it's got some snot in there. I'm about a oh. Oh. Get iron system. Don't okay. worry, though. my father always told me to clean my tools before I put them away. Oh. <laughs> I know that wasn't even necessary. Wasn't even necessary. <laughs> you might think it's fake. Some of you out there think it's fake, but everything is 100% real. You can see right here, these are real. Says, real paper. They work. Guess what else they do? They go in places they shouldn't. Uh, 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 oh. oh, gosh, that's real. Uh, that's uh, real. <laughs> and if you the boys and girls, freaks and geeks, make sure you make it out to living the screen. I'm going to have a full set and do everything that they can't do because they have to censor and bleep on here. Follow me on. Any social media at Darren Malfi, D A R I N, or hashtag Dangerous D, you'll find me. Come haunt me. Come hang out. Living the stream. Huzzah! All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That's awesome. What a great way to, to wrap that one out.
All right. Well, thanks so much. I do have to hop on to the other thing, but that was perfect. Thanks so much for joining us on that. I appreciate you inviting me and stuff like that, David. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thanks all for all your support, guys. Dangerous. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you there. Huzzah. All right. <laughs> have a good one, guys. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Midsummer Scream. I'm Justin Castillo. I'm the host and producer of the Tsunami Healing Podcast. I'm also your official second stage announcer for Midsummer Scream. Uh, and as you can see, I have the owner and founder of Boneyard Effects with me, Mr. Larry Bones. Larry, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me in today. It's awesome. Absolutely. Um, so I just want to jump right into it. Um, so last haunt season, a lot of things got moved around for you. Um, it was a crazy time, uh, but this amazing project just kind of landed in your lap, uh, the feature film Horvelt. Uh, so yeah. tell us a little bit about um, what, how did you decide to pursue this project? It was actually in 2017. Uh, we did a our independent haunt into, into the black and what we wanted to do with that is to shoot a short film that ties into that. So it actually allowed me to get into the director's seat for the first time. And I really, really enjoyed that. And But we did Into the Black for a couple of years. And uh, it, eventually, our last year in 2019, we were not able to open. And I just think I had to do something very creative. It's just been my nature. So here was this perfect opportunity to shoot a film. So I sat down and wrote and got that we go with this new feature, feature film called Horror Velt. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love it. Now, from what I understand, uh, this is not your typical vampire story. It's a little bit different. So tell us a little bit about what people can expect and uh, how uh, it's different from all the rest. Well, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something new and creative. So I started looking at European mythology and folklore. And I started seeing, like in Germany, they had not one, but two different types of vampires. I'm thinking, well, everyone loves a good vampire. But, you know, there were things they had the Blutsauger, the Bloodsuckers, and then the Noxier, which were the Night Eaters. And so I really kind of want to base this on something that was a much more re realistic world. So these were humans. They were, they were born from the Black Death. You know, they, be had, they became of these Bloodsuckers. But they didn't, like your typical vampire films, you know, they don't burn in the sun. They don't turn into bats. You know, all of these things. They don't have superhuman strength and things along those lines. So I kind of wanted to base this on something much more real. And also bring to the world, you know, 25 years of Boneyard effects and all the special effects, practical special effects to this project. Awesome. Very, very cool. And uh, if people want to opt in, if they want to support, uh, uh, be a part of the process along the way, um, how can they find the film? How can they support? Um, how can they join the Legion? Well, our mother trip is going to be horrorvelt.com. It's actually horrorwelt, so it's H O R R O R W E L T. It's pronounced horrorvelt, but that's that. But you can find us on all the social media platforms Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those. We're on all those as well. Awesome. Make sure you go check it out, folks. And uh, real quick, Larry, before I let you go, dare I say, um, how has this project been healing, fun, empowering, exciting for you? It's, it's the creative process, and it's really the creative process of creating something out of nothing and getting together with a group of people of the same like mind. So you're working with all of these creative people trying to create something fantastic, and I think that's ultimately it is, it's the creative process. I love it. Larry, it's always a pleasure working with you. Folks, go check it out, Um, If you want to go check out some of the more interviews um, on the Tsunami Healing Podcast, we had a chance to interview a lot of the crew um, and a lot of the members of the cast. So uh, thank you so much. Midsummer Scream, we love you. We're out of here. Hello and welcome to Creepy Kingdom Presents Horror is the New Black. We're really excited to discuss the things we're going to discuss today. But before we do that, I must introduce myself. My name is James H. Carter II. I am the founder of Creepy Kingdom. We are a media outlet and film production company that is covering, creating all things creepy. And I'm joined today by two other members of the creepy cult. First of all, I'd like to introduce Michelle Halloween. Hello and greetings everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and we're also joined by Tanisha. What's up? Who has no last name. She is like Madonna. 
That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we are excited and pumped and all the great adjectives to here to talk about. <laughs> Horror is the new black. It is, we're going to be diving into the black perspective being shown in mainstream horror, finally, <laughs> I guess, question mark. Um, has it always been there? Is this the first time? I Let's, let's jump into it. I, I think before anything, as far as the black perspective in horror, um, I think we've always been there. The presence has been there, but the problem yeah. is we haven't been listened to. And now we're being listened to, so we're going to just roll with it and educate and inform and entertain as we would have been this whole entire time. So we appreciate everyone listening and giving us a watch. And I'm not talking about me because I don't act. I just like I was like, we're oh, looking forward to them. your films that are coming out, Michelle. What do you, you got on the docket? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't record. I mean, this is good enough for you guys, right? But no, sure. seriously, in all seriousness, it is nice to actually see and be so welcomed into all the um, outlets, you know, as far as the horror industry goes, not just Hollywood, but conventions, film, uh, film awards, independent yeah. filmmaking. And of course, big budget films are always a really, really good gateway to look at the black perspective. So, right. especially in the horror. Yeah. That's kind of <laughs> what we're talking about here. Definitely a uh, mainstream. I mean, there's obviously been black films from the black perspective and independent in horror and other sub genres, but it's, uh, this is kind of a new frontier, seeing it in the mainstream, which is pretty exciting. So we're going to talk about the uh, upcoming releases. We've got Lovecraft Country, a series coming to HBO. we got Antebellum and Candyman. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so uh, let's take a peek at some of these trailers. What's that book you've been reading about? It's about heroes who get to go on adventures, defeat the monsters, and save the day. the back say watching all of those uh or clips from those trailers back to back all at once really hits me uh right in the feels just seeing uh first of all they're all beautiful the cinematography in all of these trailers is just mind-blowingly beautiful but just seeing the black perspective um and the fourth is just i just said it hits me in the feels you know, for lack of a better phrase, um, but the main thing that I that I take away from uh, from seeing all of these trailers at once is that these films, the the subject matter in these films, are actually scary to me <laughs> because I know I may it may it may not be everyone feels this way, but I I don't get scared by horror movies. Uh, you know, I was. A, drawn to horror movies for the creepy aesthetic, but mostly uh, I see horror movies as empowering, as a release from the real life horrors of the world. Um, and and the, the predicaments that a lot of people find themselves in horror movies uh, are not really relatable to my life. But watching the trailer like Antebellum, where a, a black woman is just living her carefree life, successful even, just killing it at life and it's just like nope you're a slave again <laughs> i mean that's got to be the worst fear for black americans <laughs> you know um tanisha what what, what 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 was your emotions 
with all these I'm, trailers. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, um, I think more than just sort of like the black perspective on horror films, but seeing real life black experiences shown in their, that are sort of rooted in their real life horrors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's something I've told you both before in the past, you know, whenever people we're talking, we're talking about horror movies and whenever people ask me like, oh, what was the first horror movie that gave you nightmares? And my answer is always like Mississippi Burning mm -hmm. because, you know, that was the first movie I remember watching and then having vivid nightmares about my family being attacked or hurt or harmed. You know, my dad grew up in Jim Crow South in Mississippi. And so these horror stories are part of my family's history. Like these stories yeah. have been passed down. And so to see them in movie form and, you know, hopefully other folks kind of see that um, they're sort of core rooted in history and real life situations. So. Oh, definitely. So Michelle, um, what how do you I feel find... watching this stuff? What I'm, what I was paying attention to a lot, especially when um, reading Lovecraft Country and the original Candyman and the trailers for Annabella Candyman and Lovecraft Country was the rage that I saw that, you know, between all three stories, the rage, the fury and the pushback, the defense mechanism that when we are pushed to a certain level, either we're going to come back fighting, we're going to get up, you're going to knock us down, we're going to get back up and we're going to start fighting for basically our right to just live just to like exist you were saying, yeah just to exist <laughs> like you were saying in all three of these films um you have you know um you have atticus just going on about his life trying to take care of his father you have uh the gentleman in Candyman who's basically just being hounded by you know the spirit you can't help it it's like he's possessed by this anger and this fury from the spirit you know from this man that's haunting cabrini green cabrini green um, and with Annabellum, I've even had, and again, this is just a perspective that I've had, uh, her going back, she's doing her thing. She's successful. She has a nice family and you see her, you know, going back, she's in, you know, slave times again, and you see her on the horse charging forward and just going, you know, leading the way to freedom, even yeah. though she already knows it. So she, it's kind of interesting, especially if you're kind of into spirituality and you're looking at. Um, you're, you're praying or you're asking for help when you're in these situations, even in real life. But what happens is we, we get enveloped and we get possessed by this rage and fury where we just want to be left alone or, and we just want the same opportunities. We want to move through our own life, but you keep knocking us down. You keep taunting us. You humiliate us. You're murdering us. So what do you expect us to do? You know, yeah, we're going to fight we're, back. And it, yeah. yeah, and it gives we're us fighting really for good... equality. Yeah, right. that's, that's, like uh, yeah. that's, and it's, it's interesting seeing this played out in mainstream cinema <laughs> and it, uh, for the first time, uh, but well, not really for the first time, but just, you know, it's seemingly, but taking a, a few years back, let's actually take a look back at uh, Get Out. Um, all these films that we're discussing have Jordan Peele's touch in it. And who knew that the silly guy from Key and Peele was gonna lead a horror, uh, Black Revolution. <laughs> five right? years later, <laughs> I had no idea when I found out he was making a horror film. I was like, or he was involved in a horror like, film. Like, we can do anything. <laughs> it goes to show we can do any damn thing. We can change our mind. But it's it's that resilience that you know, sure. um, the, you know, human beings have. But you know, Black Americans have a resilience that you know we. It's just. Sometimes it's empowering. Sometimes, it, most of the time, it's devastating and it's horrifying. But I love the empowerment that comes with it. And then we could put it into films because people, some people just they they exist by film only. They only know films. That's all they grew up on. They idolize filmmakers. They idolize the actors. Yeah. So when you're giving them the story, you sometimes you go, hmm, how many times do you watch a movie or a horror movie, and you're just like, I can relate to this situation. You know, and what would you do in this situation? So I'm hoping that what these films do is Maybe. inspire non-people of color to go, huh, this sucks and it's well, scary. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> the thing. I think uh, showing a different perspective helps. Representation in film is huge. And not just representation for the sake of being there, but having re a representation of a different perspective, I think is pretty impactful. Uh, but my question is, uh, now, um, 
was kind of a, a big slap in the face to a lot of people. Kind of a little bit of a wake up call was so uh, in your face <laughs> with its uh, uh, with its uh, message, and but yet yeah, was very successful. Um, do we think that this led the way for this new wave of films? I'll let you take that, Tanisha. Yeah, Tanisha, um, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, put me on the spot. Um, I mean, I think so. I, I think that the biggest thing with film, right, and the reason we're all fans of film is because we're seeking to feel something, right? We're, like, make sure, me feel something, connection. hit me yeah. somewhere in an emotional place where I have some kind of reaction, whether it's to laugh, to scream, to cry, what have you. Um, and so I think, you know, even though, yes, it's... It, it, it's very heavy handed with what the sort of theming and the messaging is. Um, I think it's sort of showing like we can tell these stories that hopefully are, are a gut punch to folks um, that sort of strike a nerve and make you feel something, whether you feel uncomfortable, whether you feel disgusted, whether you feel horrified, whether, you know, and, and um, with film, we're seeking to feel something. Right, we're we're yeah. looking for something to strike a nerve in us. Whether you know it's going to make us laugh, it's going to make us cry, it's going to make us scared or scream or whatever. Um, and I think with Get Out, it sort of struck a chord of making people people feel uncomfortable, making people feel uneasy, maybe pe making people feel a little bit disgusted. Or, and I think what came with it, not only you know obviously it was a huge success, but it struck a lot of conversations and a lot of dialogue, which great art does, right? It gets us yeah. talking, analyzing, thinking about it. And so I think, you know, it sort of showed like you can have these conversations in a big budget blockbuster horror film, television series, what have you. Um, and that it's gonna get folks talking, it's gonna engage people, um, hopefully on a deeper level, so. Well, let's hope so. Um, so real quick, which one of these three are, are are you guys looking forward to the most? Oh, man, I'd have to say I'm looking forward to all three of them. Um, but oh, yeah, obviously. Candyman <laughs> definitely is number one. I hate being put on the spot when asked, which one are you looking forward to the no, most? Well, that's so what I, I did. can do an so order, take I it. know, James. <laughs> You're always bossing me around. <laughs> All right, boss, you get, right. Yeah. you get three answers. Number one, Candyman. No, I don't want three answers. You said your answer. You said Candyman. <laughs> Moving on, Tanisha. Oh, how can you make me choose? Okay, I think for me, because I'm biased and it's a female protagonist, I'm, I'm really stoked for Antebellum. All right, and I'm going to pick Lovecraft Country. So we are all equally excited that, but uh, that's because I've started reading the book. Um, I know that you started it. I know that Michelle has read it all. It's good, and, uh, huh? And I'm, re I'm really excited to see it all play out. Okay. So um, we have a lot more to say about these films. And so we decided we're gonna take a deeper dive on one of our podcasts, the Creepy Kingdom Movie Crypt podcast, which you can find by searching um, Creepy Kingdom in any podcatcher. So check that out. And also, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up the fundraiser here. Cre uh, Team Creepy Kingdom has been raising money <laughs> um, for all the great causes. I, I'm proud of all of our team members that have been going hard raising money. And, uh, you know, when you, we, it's, it's still time for you to donate. Get in there. Pick Team Creepy Kingdom and let's bring it home. And lastly, I have a huge announcement that we we're really excited to use. Uh, Midsummer Scream is letting us announce it on this platform is that Creepy Kingdom has a two-month Halloween celebration filled with original content, interactive activities, and two live streaming events. It's called Creepy Kingdom's Halloween at Home. We're going to be kicking it off live August 30th. We're going to be doing live Halloween night with so much fun stuff. But we're going to break out everything that's going to happen in that live stream at the end of the month. Uh, so let's throw it. To that, but actually, before we throw it to our, our little promo trailer, any, any last words? And you have 10 seconds. <laughs> creepy Kingdom rules. Yes, keep it creepy. <laughs> All right, let's go. Are you sad that Halloween is canceled? Angry that you don't get to celebrate like the years past? Scared that this year won't be any fun? Well, boys and ghouls, turn that pumpkin frown upside down. 
Creepy Kingdom is bringing Halloween to you. Prepare yourself for the most spooktacular social distanced event ever. Creepy Kingdom's Halloween at Home. The celebration kicks off on August 30th with a live streamed event showcasing some of the tricks and or treats we have in store. Our celebration concludes with a live streamed party on Halloween night. We will be bringing you two dark months of ghoulishly good times. Follow Creepy Kingdom on social media to make sure you don't miss out on any of the spooky fun. Hey, welcome back everybody to another Haunter Preview. Thank you for being there with us in spirit. And look who's here with us in spirit, Desert Decay Manners in the house. How are you guys? We're good. We're good, we're good. Wait, waiting, anticipating for the hopes that we do get to do something great. I mean, it's uh, crazy this this with this whole epidemic, but you know what? Uh, we're gonna try to do our best to make sure it happens because we're, we're, we're about saving Halloween. Hashtag Absolutely. save Halloween. And Absolutely. next year, this summer's going to be best. Well, yeah, thank you guys. And you guys have always been such great supporters, and, and we love you, and, and, and just heartbreaking not to be with you guys in the Hall of Shadows right now. So yeah. tell tell the kids at home where they're going to be able to find you at Halloween, and uh, hopefully it's a little bit cooler on Halloween than it is now. I imagine it's nice and chilly outside mm -hmm. right now, right? <laughs> yeah, it's about a, it was 108 today. No, 113 today. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice. so it was hot. <laughs> well, nice but that was cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> but so they can, what you guys are going to do and, and, and where everybody can find you this year. Okay. Well, Go ahead. yeah, basically we're going to do the, the, if everything works out, I mean, we are going to do a walkthrough with basically no drop cloths hanging in front of you, no, no doors to push on. I mean, we're going to sanitize everything and, I mean, send one party in at a time through the whole hunt. So that way there's no... um chances but no no scream scares it's gonna be hidden scares um the the air blasters and stuff like that where we're uh, we don't have to worry about no transmission of any type of um of any germ of, of any type so that's we're just gonna try to play as safe as possible and um in just small parties but they must wear a mask if they come through if if that's the case if, it, if all works out fingers crossed i mean um other than that that's that's pretty much uh what we're looking at doing i mean and right. we're also, yeah, we're also known as the creepiest haunted house. So in the desert, so we're going to, like you said, we're not going to have the live actors, but we will be creepy. So we will yeah. continue to be creepy. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And how many nights are you guys going to be creepy for? We're going to try for a total of four. Okay. A total of four, and um, we will do for the the ones that have haunted houses, the hunters' night as well. Okay. So, but th that will be behind the scenes for for the hunters. And so, um, but other than that, yeah, exactly. I mean, other than that, that's pretty much uh, what we're, we're hoping to do. I mean, we're like I said, we're keeping our, our fingers crossed and hopefully everybody keeps their masks on. I mean, plays it safe out there so we can save Halloween. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I mean, that's that's the goal. And I mean, everybody can find us at, on Instagram at um, Instagram slash There's a Game Manor. Um, also on Facebook, Dead Decay Manor, and you can always get links directly from uh, DeadDecayManor.com. That's perfect. Well, thank you guys for stopping by and hanging out with us for a little bit. Again, well, I'm sorry we're not together in Long Beach, but uh, mm -hmm. next year, next year will be bigger and better for us, mm -hmm. and everybody will be happy and healthy, hopefully, uh, at that point, and uh, we'll have a hell of a party. And uh, listen, I want to thank you guys. In the weeks ahead, we are going to keep doing like updates, so we're not yeah. just do this little live kit or whatever and then just say well find out in october you know as yeah. we get closer yeah. to the season we're going to just stay, stay you guys just stay posted everybody to social media and just check out our feeds because we're going to start updating as the the weeks progress i mean september we're really going to be throwing updates out there so Perfect. we're watching what the governor says what what the guidelines are in the county because yeah. we are in riverside county so we're going to play it safe definitely we're going to take care of people so good that's the plan Good. Well, much love to the team there, and uh, keep you. keep sane, keep healthy, and try to keep cool out there in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Guys. Doing okay? Oh yeah, everything everything's good. Other than I mean, just this whole lockdown. I mean, it's it's frustrating. It really is. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I need to go do some Halloween things, and you're stuck just inside, cooped up. Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys. We'll talk to you very soon. All right, Rick. Thank, thank you. Bye. Yeah. Hey, one of the fun parts about pulling this together is uh, asking people to do some crazy videos. And uh, two people who are totally game were Anna Mabramati and Larry Raymond Duncan, uh, who I've known for a few years. You may recognize them from being at the Shine On Collective booth at Midsummer Scream, uh, doing some immersives that are produced by Marla Marley Delia, I believe is her name. Um, and uh, Here's the introduction we wrote up. In addition to being published writers and lifelong horror fans, Larry and Anna are self-professed board game geeks. And they put together this video detailing five of their top horror-themed tabletop games to play during the quarantine. So check it out. Hi, I'm Anna. And I'm Larry. We both love horror and we love board games. And we found tabletop gaming is an awesome way to pass the time during the lockdown and the quarantine. You can hang out with whoever you happen to be quarantining with and bring a little spookiness into your home. So we put together five of our favorite horror themed games to share with you. Let's get started. We're going to start with a game that came out last year. This is Horrified, a Universal Monsters themed game. In this game, you battle against these classic movie monsters that are plaguing your village. So you'll be fighting against characters like Frankenstein, Dracula, the creature from the Black Lagoon, the Invisible Man, etc. This is also one of the few games on our list today that we think we'd recommend for families. Um, as you can maybe see, um, we're starting a family ourselves and uh, this would be a game that we think kids might enjoy and have fun with. The the horror aspect is no scarier than any Universal movie, so it's totally up to you if you want to try it with a younger kid. Next we switch gears from one of the newest games on our list, one released in 1981. Call of Cthulhu is a role-playing game, much like Dungeons and Dragons. But unlike Dungeons and Dragons, which draws its influence from the tropes of sword and sorcery and high fantasy, Call of Cthulhu draws on the cosmic horror of authors like H.P. Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, and Robert Block. As with most tabletop role-playing games, someone's going to have to serve as the Game Master, referred to as the Keeper. The Keeper describes the game world to the players, takes on the role of other characters in the story, and presents the players with the clues and challenges which will make up the bulk of gameplay. Tabletop role-playing games, in general, are great for playing when you can't get together safely in groups. It's easy to adapt these games for play over Zoom or Google Hangouts. In modern gaming, there are plenty of online platforms to facilitate gameplay like Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds. If you're looking to play something in between a traditional board game and an RPG, Betrayal Legacy might be the game for you. This is based on the board game Betrayal at House on the Hill, but in this game, Players will create the history of their own haunted house. Taking place over 13 different gaming sessions, players will play subsequent members in their family line who are discovering new mysteries and horrors about the house. Once the legacy portion of this game is over, there's still a lot of gameplay to be had from this. It basically reverts into a clone of Betrayal at House on the Hill, which is a game already known for its replayability and a lot of different varying haunted house scenarios that you can play through. So if you find yourself quarantined with a group of four to five players who are looking for a little bit more than the traditional board game experience, this could be a great choice. For our next selection, we return to the world of H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos for Arkham Horror, the card game. This game is produced by Fantasy Flight Games who also produced the legendary board game of the same name. The card game boils down the dread and cosmic horror of Arkham Horror, the board game, into a variation of a collectible card game. The game's design creates an incredibly tense atmosphere. You'll feel more sense of dread than you thought was possible just playing a hand of cards. The core set claims that you can play with up to four players. But if you want to play with that number of people, you're going to have to have two core sets because there just simply is not enough cards for four people to build a, a viable deck with the cards provided in the set. That being said, 
There's no shortage of expansions, and they are releasing new ones at an unbelievable clip. You can slowly order the expansions and fill your nights with dread for the foreseeable future. We're gonna end this list with a personal favorite of ours, Mixtape Massacre. So some of the other games on this list, with the exception of Horrified, might be a little intense or overwhelming for a newer, casual, or less experienced player. But Mixtape Massacre is just for when you want to sit down and have a bloody fun time. There are many different modes of play in this game, but the primary ones see players take on the guise of 80s horror movie icons. The killers make their way across the board and they attempt to murder victims, mostly inebriated teenagers. Killers will encounter scenes from 80s movies, 80s television, and even 80s professional wrestling. So this game is not geared towards kids. There are drugs, sex, and alcohol references in it, but for an age-appropriate group, it can be really fun for horror fans. There is one caveat I will add before you go ahead and purchase Mixtape Massacre, and that is if you're going to pick this one up, make sure you also pick up the Black Max expansion. We think Black Mask fixes some lingering issues with the game and really is a must-have. There are also a lot of other expansions for Mixtape Massacre, including Invasion, which adds an alien element into the mix, and the current events appropriate Lockdown expansion. So those are our suggestions, but as you can see, there are tons of choices when it comes to playing horror board games. So if we can't cover all the games that we love, we just don't have enough time. But uh, get out there and do some research for yourself, and I'm sure you can find a game that suits your horror needs. Uh, with that being said, play games, have fun, and be safe. Hey guys, welcome back to The Screaming Room. Uh, we're going to be getting a little bit international this time uh, with a filmmaker. Oh God, I know I'm going to slaughter his name. It's it's uh, Van Karapetian. He's from uh, Greece. He's an Armenian living in Greece. And it just goes to show you that horror is an international language that we all speak and we all love as horror fans. Uh, he wasn't able to record a message, but he did want me to share his very sincere gratitude to the uh, producers of Midsummer Screen for selecting uh, the piece and uh, for sharing it with you guys. That was his message, and he also wants you to follow him on Facebook, uh, Darkstream Entertainment. Okay, so with that, we are showing you a short film called Wicca Book Chapter One. It's a series, and if you like it, go to his Facebook page and follow him for the rest of the stories. All right, here we go.
Hey, Deep Cuts. Hey, Little Pumpkin. Hey, Norman Crates. Hey, Little Pumpkin. Our next story begins when Bobby Pickett returns home from the Korean War and moves to California to be an actor. To make some money and put himself on stage in California, Bobby began performing doo-wop tunes with a band called The Cordials. I heard that one night Bobby decided to perform the monologue from a legendary song called Little Darling in a Boris Karloff accent. And you wanna know what? The audience loved it. Lenny Capizzi in the band was obsessed with horror movies and suggested to Bobby that they record a demo. He famously said, you know, we ought to do a novelty record. They do very well. Isn't that great when novelty Halloween records do very well? I also heard that they wrote the Monster Mash in less than an hour and it was a huge graveyard smash. Pickett went on to make many other horror-themed tunes, such as a parody of Alley Oop called Wolfbane, the Blood Bank Blues about a vampire who was down on his luck, and Scully Gully, a catchy, rocking tune about all the different monsters in the movies. And, you know, he had other songs too, like Me and My Mummy and the Transylvania Twist, which is inspired by the Monster Mash. Yeah, okay, take it easy, Bobby. My personal favorite is Monster Rap. I have a fun fact about the voices that sing the female doo-wop harmonies on the song. Included in those background voices was Darlene Loves. Darlene is legendary in her own right for singing on the Ronettes' Be My Baby and Frank Sinatra's That's Life and Christmas' Baby Please Come Home and literally countless others. What? What? I once saw a thriller monster mashup on YouTube. Monster Mash made some serious monster cash. All this talk about the Monster Mash makes me want to listen to Skeleton Sam from our first album, This Is Halloween Music, Volume 1. Okay, Deep Cuts. Hit it. Hit the mash. Hit the monster. The monster mash. Hit the mash. Barry recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet. Boy, do I love me some low-budget films. That's why I love the movie where the old dude shows his balls to a bunch of young people in a mortuary. What? What's that? No, I'm talking about Phantasm. What movie are you talking about? Oh, Barry. Uh, up next, one, I think we have one or two more. No, I think it's the final one for the uh, Older Guys and Paramore's fashion show. We're going to miss these. Let's see one. Hot air hangs like a dead man from a white oak tree. People sitting on porches. Thinking how things used to be Dark night Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for joining us to the virtual festivities of Midsummer Scream. My name is Ava Ziegfeld and I am your ghost hostess with the mostess. I hope you're all staying safe at home wearing your Halloween masks. All day long, you are going to have the delectable treasure of being able to watch four frightful fashion shows by Poltergeist and Paramours, as designed by its CEO and founder, Amalia. We are delighted to have a sneak preview of Sean Keller's upcoming album, Killer Sounds of Halloween 2. So nice he had to do it twice. So stay tuned and enjoy the frightful fashions of Poltergeist and Paramours. Madness would destroy my mind 
Welcome back to another Haunter Preview. Thank you for being there with us in spirit. We have Realm of Shadow in the house. How are you doing, guys? Hey, hey Rick. Great. Doing We're great. Hello. We're good. We're good. Good, good. Well, thank you for being here with us. Uh, really, really sorry that you're not with us in Long Beach, I'm telling you. Yeah, I but, saw, that in, saw that Instagram post this morning, and a tear came to my eye. Man, this is a <laughs> really so weird, weird, weird weekend that we're not, like, just killing it in Long Beach. So, But, uh, hey, next year, bigger and better than anybody can even anticipate, right? Oh, we're so Absolutely. looking forward to it, Absolutely. yeah. So let's yeah. talk about what's going on now. Obviously, we're all COVID-challenged, and uh, the Halloween season is rapidly approaching. So what are you guys going to do? I mean – We've had cancellations from major theme parks and major events. So really, here in Southern California and pretty much the rest of the United States and world, people are going to be getting their Halloween fix from Home Haunters. So we're yeah. to you now. Uh, what, what are you guys planning on doing this Halloween season? Well, um, you know, with everybody else, we're keeping, you know, a, an eye and ear open, of course, and following everything that's going on. But um you know, with, with where we work um, and, uh, you know, they're a church, we've actually had to do uh, a lot of work dealing with uh, large groups and how do we make that safe and how do we uh, keep everything sanitary? How do you control your crowd and things like that? And, you know, thankfully, we think we're going to be able to apply a lot of that to uh, our haunt. So um, we're actually going to move forward 100%. We're doing our walkthrough haunt uh, at our new property in Bellflower, and um, we're just incorporating every single COVID safety guideline that the CDC has put out there uh, and making it as, as safe as possible um, and, and moving forward with uh, actually more days this yeah. year than, than prior days. We're going to be doing five days uh, this year. Um, we, it'll be the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, and then the 30th and 31st of October. Um, so it's uh, going to be really interesting. We're, we're rolling forward with um, Hamry Manor, uh, our theme that was going to be at uh, Midsummer, uh, but we just had we had to redesign everything, right? So uh, that that's proving uh, very interesting. <laughs> And has delayed our build uh, quite a bit. So, um, but but Nathan and and Irene here are are in charge of all that. So I have a hundred percent confidence. Yeah, that that's gonna gonna work out. Well, that's awesome. And you know, sounds like you're gonna need those extra nights because people I think are gonna be really hungry for Halloween content this year. And so again, the community is looking to anybody, including yourselves, that are gonna do anything. For Halloween. So it's really exciting that you're pushing forward. And real quick, I heard you say new location. Do tell. Yeah, yeah we're actually, um, our, our location last year was uh, was a one shot. And so this year, uh, we're actually going to be, uh, I'll just plug the address if that's okay. Uh, we're going to be at 17230 Palo Verde Avenue in the city of Bellflower. And of course, this address and information is going to be up on our website. It'll be posted on our social media. And uh, but we were just uh, blessed with uh, some friends uh, from our church here that have a, a really insanely large backyard and are just uh, really excited about the haunt, really excited about the season, the outreach we do. And so they've opened up their backyard for us to use as much as we want. And so uh, that's that's where we're going to be. And again, if you go to our website or our Instagram, you'll be able to get that address and uh, the dates and times and all that information as well. That's fantastic. Well, you know, we're going to keep in touch with you guys as the haunt season further approaches, and we're going to keep everybody updated on what you're doing as well. We're going to have more haunt previews and things like that as we get closer. So this is not the last you've heard of, of Realm of Shadow or from me, and we're going to be chatting and, and, and just keeping everybody in tune with you, okay? So in the meantime, you guys stay really safe. Stay secure, and uh, we love you. And again, we're sorry that we're not with you this weekend, uh, but we will see you very soon, okay? All right, Rick. All right, take care. All right, take care. You guys, have a good night. Much love to the whole crew. Yeah, thank you. you. Too. Thanks. Thank you.
Hey, we are here with J.W. Ocker and Danny October. J.W. Uh, is the author of A Season of the Witch, The Magic and Mayhem of Halloween at Salem, Massachusetts, and uh, the website Odd Things I've Seen. Um, he spent a month living in Salem to write that book. And Danny October lives in Sleepy Hollow itself and frequently blogs and posts photos from there um, online at uh, facebook.com forward slash this is Halloween 31 and Instagram.com uh, forward slash Terry Hollow, Hollow Town. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, cool. Real, real quick. Uh, so first question for both of you, uh, you know, you're kind of experts of your individual uh, towns there. Uh, let me know just real quick, what makes uh, JW, I know it's an easy question, but what makes Salem a perfect Halloween season destination? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah this is a really easy question to answer. Right? It's um, for a lot of reasons, I think. There's the time of year, right? The New England Falls are great. They're perfect. The history, you're going back to the 17th century with the history of the witches there. The way the town has embraced Halloween is probably the biggest reason, though, out of all of them. I mean, the place feels like Halloween year round. So it's just it just has everything you want in us in, in celebrating the season all within like whatever, two square blocks. Very cool. And yeah, you said, I mean, it's, you can go there just about any time to experience Halloween. Is that just because it's Salem or do they have things going on throughout the year for for people that are really into Halloween? Yeah, these days, um, these days, there's all kinds of stuff you can do that's Halloween related year round. The museums are still there, the witch museums. Um, the only difference in October is in September these days is a lot more crowded and there's a lot more ad hoc events, a lot more kind of like vendor events and theater events that are specifically Halloween themed. But you can find something spooky to do there any month of the year. Very cool. Danny, tell me about uh, Sleepy Hollow or Terrytown. Yeah, well, Sleepy Hollow and Terrytown are kind of one in the same. Um, it actually used to all be uh, Terrytown. And it wasn't until like the 1990s that it changed. The North Terry, Terrytown changed its name to Sleepy Hollow. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and that was to kind of like bring a lot of tourism in. And I feel like since then, it's really like started the whole Halloween town aspect of Sleepy Hollow. And for the past decade, I have to say, like it's really come into its own and made a name for itself as a Halloween town. There are so many events to do. Um, the Pumpkin Blaze, the Horseman's Hollow, Haunted Houses, Hay Rides. I mean, it's just like an ideal place for October. You can come here any day in October and the air and the energy is just like this electric orange type feel. You know, you just like feel the spirit. And because it's like so much smaller um, than like, say, Salem um, or something like that, it has a more intimate feel. And we have the history too, you know, Washington Irving, put us on the map with the legend of Sleepy Hollow and that's world known, like everyone knows that and everyone wants to come here and look for the Headless Horseman come October. Um, and it's really great because he's often walking around. We have a Headless Horseman uh, that just walks the streets um, of October. Are there multiple, are there multiple yeah. Headless Horsemen or like is somebody known as the Headless Horseman? No, we have, we have our one Headless Horseman um, and he rides through town and I swear to God, one time I even saw him coming out of the supermarket. That was when I first moved here two years ago in October, and I saw the headless horseman coming out of the supermarket. And I was like, I've come home, <laughs> you know? So the people here and the energy is just amazing. They've really, really embraced the legend. Um, this year is actually the bicentennial, so it's the 200th anniversary of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. So this past year, um, you know, aside from the, the virus and all that, um, last October was amazing. Um, more people are coming than ever, just thousands and thousands of people. We're in close proximity to Manhattan. So it just, you know, our streets are just packed in our Halloween parade. So it's it's really amazing all October long. So um, JW, uh, with the next thing I want to ask about is how do these towns promote? I mean, do they need to promote? Do they have is, is there a Salem witch tourism board or there, yeah, there is a tourism board Their Their issue historically, at least for the past, say five, 10 years is they've almost, they've over rotated on Halloween, right? They, they don't need to really PR that too much. So what they've had to do is leaven that a bit with, you know, stuff about their restaurants and stuff about their coast and stuff about their, you know, 
proximity to Boston. So they've actually had to do not an anti Halloween campaign, but they've had to actually put more money into broadening what they're what, what they're kind of pulling in tourists for because the Halloween was automatic. They could pull in tourists on Halloween in October without sending out a single, you know, commercial or whatever. So now now these days they're a lot more balanced. They do a little bit of, of all of it. So I think they've been successful in promoting themselves as a urban destination as a New England destination, as a historic destination, and as a Halloween destination. So I think they, they, their problem has traditionally not been, you know, getting the word out about getting the word out about Halloween in Salem. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Danny, what about with the uh, Harrytown Sleepy Hollow? Is there a tourism board? Um, yeah. So um, visit sleepyhollow.com is pretty much the website to go to if you want to visit um, Sleepy Hollow, they have a section, a calendar section, which is perfect because you can go to any day in October and it'll tell you every single event that's going on, the links. I mean, it's just perfect. I've been using it for like, the whole, you know, a decade probably. Um, but as far as like promotion goes, like we don't, you know, kind of the same with Salem. Like we're getting to a point we don't need to promote that much because it's world known. You know, everyone knows the legend of Sleepy Hollow. We have like our our TV show and the movies and Johnny Depp, like he did it for us, right? So, but what's funny is a lot of people don't even realize Sleepy Hollow is a real place. So when they do realize that they're like, oh my gosh, I have to go there. Um, it's funny, like some people think it's still fictional, which I guess is a little understandable, but now that word's getting out that we're such a Halloween town, um, you know, like I said, last October, there's thousands of people here, thousands of people. So it's, um, we're not having any problem with promotion whatsoever. Um, but also on my website, Terry Hollow Town, I promote like year round and post pictures and, you know, all the happenings. So. Uh, JW with uh, the pandemic happening, do you know how Salem is coping right now? Or what, what does it look like? Out yeah, there? yeah. So, I mean, in Massachusetts, I mean, this changes every week, obviously, for everybody. But in Massachusetts, they've been doing a pretty good job, in New England in general, of, of containing the virus. But it's definitely transformed Salem. So if you go today in August, which generally is a pretty busy time uh, in Salem, uh, you'll see a lot of – everything's open, which is interesting. Everything's open, and open, but all the restaurants all have patios now. So now you're eating outside. Uh, there's a mask ordinance where you have to wear a mask. Even outside, you have to wear a mask downtown. Mm -hmm. um, not all the tourists are you know doing that, but – technically you're supposed to. So it's definitely um, changed. It's a changed place. It's a lot more trepidatious. Obviously, <laughs> the joke is, joke goes around that Salem is used to masks, but this is a whole new kind of different thing for them. So it is definitely a different place. Um, but in some ways, you know, it's still Salem and still full of tourists and everything's open. So we'll see what happens. Have they, have they canceled anything for this year or does everything look like they're still waiting to evaluate? I, I, I think most things are waiting. I think I saw the Salem Horror Fest, which is a big film festival here. It might be going virtual. So I think they're still trepidatious. Um, if you've ever been to a, to a Halloween night in Salem, it's like it's hundreds of thousands, close to a million people. It's it's chaos. Yeah. So I, I think they probably are going to try to avoid that, but nobody's made real announcements yet. I think people feel like they have another maybe month or so to go before they have to. Yeah. Danny, what about with you guys? Yeah, it's pretty much like the same thing. Um so we're just starting, you know, New York, Massachusetts, the whole, you know, Northeast Coast, we're doing okay. Um, but it's early. Like, we're just starting to reopen. So we have outdoor dining. On our main street, we have uh, Friday and Saturdays. All the all the restaurants put their tables outside, which is really nice. Um, I've contacted pretty much everyone. And, you know, they think I'm crazy because it's July. And I'm like, what's going on for October? Um, but they just don't know yet. And they said they'll probably know closer to September. Um, the, the blaze, which is, uh, you know, the great pumpkin blaze at Van Cortland Manor is still going on because that's an outdoor event. And people were always kind of spaced out with that anyway. Um, so that's still going on. So that'll be nice. Things like our parade where thousands of people come and they're all, you know, squished together like Halloween night in Salem. That may not happen. But um, like with Salem, like people are still going to come. You know, it's October. They're still going to come. You have to wear a mask, of course. Um, but we do have indoor shopping and outdoor dining, which is good. So I'm just hoping the closer we get to October, the better things get, you know. And we have to see. It's kind of too early to tell. But um, on visitsleepyhollow.com, they're going to keep you updated. And on, on my site as well, 
constantly keep people updated. That's great. Hey, yeah. tell, tell me a little bit more about the blaze. What is that? That sounds like that's the big, beautiful that's the so, thing. Uh, it's a it's a little bit away. It's like twenty minutes away, but it's Van Cortlandt Manor, um, which uh, is a beautiful old uh, old house, and they have about five thousand pumpkins outside carved. And there's like there's dinosaurs, there's trains, uh, there's a whole spider web. I mean, it's, if you Google any of the images, you'll just be blown away. It's absolutely gorgeous, and it's such a, a great experience. So it and it takes about an hour to walk through. It's not small. It's a it's a big event, um, and people come from all over to go. Um, and it's what's great is they have it even going into November now because it's become so big. October just isn't enough, which is a dream come true for me. I always said we need to extend October right <laughs> into November. Right. Um, so that's what they started doing with a couple of events here, a couple of shows, and the pumpkin blaze. We're extending into November now. So and and I, you know, when I went to Sleepy Hollow, I wasn't sure what would be there, but um, uh, what struck me was that it definitely is a very perfect New England spooky. And you guys have, the, I mean, it's just the neatest cemetery um, yeah. that's there yeah. by the bridges. Yeah. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about those? And you know, how, they go back to what, like even pre-revolutionary war. It is. So when the, the Dutch settlers first came in, um, it was like the early 1600s. Um, yeah, this was pre-revolutionary days. Um, Phillips Manor started the old Dutch church. Um, so that's been there since I think it's like 1630 uh, something, maybe 1640 something. Um, and that's the spot that Washington Irving wrote where the headless horseman's bones lay in that graveyard. So it's a beautiful, beautiful ancient burying ground. The original bridge isn't there. Um, it's rotted away, whatever was left. Um, but if you go to the side of the river, and I have it in one of my videos, actually, you can see some stones of a remnant of like where a bridge used to be spanning the Bocantico River, which goes right by there. Um, and what's pretty cool about the old Dutch burying ground too is um, they just added a gravestone last year, I don't know if you guys know about this, of what was known as the Witch of Sleepy Hollow. Um, it's a legend called Mother Hulda. Um, and she actually took up arms in the Revolutionary War and fought defending um, Sleepy mm -hmm. Hollow and she died. And But she was a, a Bohemian woman, you know, into medicine and herbs. So she was our town witch and she was killed in the Revolutionary War. Um, they put her in the burying ground, but they never gave her a proper burial until last year where they actually added a tombstone for her. So we have that. We have um, a new legend and lore marker that was just added that literally says this is where the Headless Horseman, you know, rests at night. And this is where he's known to gallop to and fro, you know, with his horse, um, which is really amazing because we never had that before. So those two things are new. They'll be I think pretty big draws this year for this October. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, yeah it is cool. <laughs> so JW, uh, you spent a month living in Salem uh, to write your book. Uh, what uh, what's like the from there from the book? What would you say is the one thing uh, people can't miss or that surprised you from writing the book? Yeah, I think what I always so I get the email a lot from people saying, hey. Obviously, we're not going to be spending a month in Salem ourselves. What is, what is the one or two things we have to do if we have a few hours there? And it's an easy answer for me. Um, I always tell them, do the Essex Street Pedestrian Mall. So the Essex Street Pedestrian Mall is a cobblestone walkway just for pedestrians that goes you know, right down the center of the city, a few blocks. They actually extend it a little bit during October. And on that pedestrian uh, strip is everything you need to know to do Salem. I mean, that's where you're going to see the shops. You're going to see the, witch, the witchcraft houses. You're going to see haunted houses. You're going to see the... Um, the street performers. You're going to see people wearing costumes. It's where they congregate. There's restaurants there. There's history there. It is um, Salem all in one street. So I always encourage people to go there. And then from that street, everything is easy to get to. Like the the statue of uh, Samantha from Bewitch is right there. The graveyard, the old burial ground is just, you know, a block away. But I always tell people, just walk that strip and you could say for the rest of your life that you did Salem. So I'm always trying to get people to just like hang out there and just enjoy themselves there. JW, also tell us some other Halloween related tourist destinations that you've been to that uh, like is Baltimore a good place for to, for people who are into Poe? <laughs> for people who are into Poe, Baltimore is a great place. I mean, you're going to go see the place where he's buried. Like 
to me, that's the there's a lot of post sites on the East Coast and in London uh, where he where he grew up. Um, but Baltimore is where you want to go to see his bones. I mean, that's his grave site. There's a lot of good stories around his grave. There's an amazing statue in the area as well, the Ezekiel Moses statue of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, it's a cool city. Obviously, Richmond is where you go to really see Poe. That's where he grew up. That's where the, the Richmond Poe Museum is, which is an amazing museum. But, you know, if if <laughs> you know, you're know you a Poe fan, you got to go see his grave. And, of course, he has a house in Boston or yeah. in uh, Baltimore as well that you can go see. Any other uh, destinations you can think of that should be on this list? Obviously, New Orleans. Uh, but anything, I, I I always argue LA is the greatest Halloween destination for LA. I mean, that's why we do Midsummer Scream here. But, yeah, um, yeah. The ones I would say, I always when I tell people, I say Salem obviously for obvious reasons. Sleepy Hollow, I'm a big booster of as well. I love Sleepy Hollow for pretty much almost all the same reasons. Um, New Orleans is great; it has its own flavor of Halloween. Obviously, uh, I always point people to LA is a great one too because again, you guys are doing so much huge events there, and of course, the horror movie industry there has a huge history. I always tell people, also tell people like Orlando. I mean, you go down to do Dis Disney and Universal have made a version of Halloween that's unparalleled anywhere on the planet. So I'm always telling people it's hot down there. It's not, it doesn't have like the feel of, you know, uh, New York or New England, but man, it is so Halloween down there. It's un unbelievable. And then obviously I also try, try to tell you to go to Ireland because there's a few places in Ireland that are starting to pick up this as well. Cause that's where Halloween started is over there. And they're starting to pick up that idea like, oh, we are the birthplace of Halloween. We can actually kind of, turn that into an event. So those are usually the ones I always throw out when people are asking about Halloween. Dust oh, also, um, Anoka, Minnesota, there, that's a big Halloween destination as well. They were the first one to throw a civic parade, uh, for Halloween back, whatever, 80 years, 60, 50, 80 years ago. Everything's a, everything is the same amount of time for me, but they also have a big kind of Halloween destination as well. They painted on the sides of their buildings. So there's a lot of cool Halloween destinations enough to go around. I think. Danny, do you have, uh, any of favorites from that or anything that JW missed? Um, you know, I've, I don't know if you guys know, I've, I'm a ghost hunter woo, as well. Um, so I've been doing that for many, many years. And I have to say, if you want to go and be terrified, spend a night at the Lizzie Borden house, because I did that. And of all, I've ghost hunted in New Orleans, Gettysburg, Salem, Sleepy Hollow, you know, pretty much everywhere on the East Coast. Um, and I've never been so scared in my entire life. So that's one of the things that I love about New England. Like we seem to have this, you know, haunting aspect, especially in the fall. It's just beautiful. The trees are gorgeous and there's just ghosts everywhere. If you look up, you know, this haunted inn, this haunted bed and breakfast, you can find so many, you can go almost anywhere and um, you'll have like a spooky time in these nice New England towns. But Fall River and the whole Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast, I highly, highly recommend. Very cool. Um, yeah. yeah. So JW, you have a new book coming out called Cursed Objects. Give I do, I do. It's street. Uh, I'll give you the pitch. Yeah, uh, it, it streets uh, mid September, September fifteenth, and it is it's nonfiction, and it's I write about probably the most infamous cursed objects on the planet. I try to assemble like a really comprehensive list, and it ended up being about fifty of the most interesting and the most you know seemingly cursed objects that in history. For, and it's a global book, U.S. Uh, all, all the way over to Asia and Europe, of course. And for the book, I write about them and research them. Some of them are lost to history. So, but other ones I, I visit, I talk about, I buy some cursed objects. So in some ways it's a, it's like an encyclopedia of cursed objects, but in other ways it's also a travel log, which is, you know, kind of my, my uh, genre of nonfiction. So it's a little bit of everything. Very cool. We, we'll be looking out for that one. Um, and Danny, anything you have coming up? Uh, you want to um. Well, you know, last, so last year um, I did, I did, I do a costume drive every year for children in need. And last year was amazing. I raised like 200 costumes for um, homeless, you know, children in need and homeless children. Um, I also started last year. So Main Street um, always has like white lights and I made them all put orange lights last year for <laughs> October. So um, I was just annoying to the point that they did it um, and it looked really beautiful. So they're into that. This year, it's going to be a little tricky, but you know what? I feel like with the virus going on, we need to like step up our Halloween game and go above and beyond and make it even mm -hmm. more special um, than it ever was. Because it was easy before, right? Like everything was there and it was just done. Now we have to start getting creative and thinking of like, well, what can we do to make this special? So we don't look back on this as like, oh, the year the virus ruined Halloween. Like I'm not having that. So um have to think of some things you know in the works um but i'm sure we'll come up with some good stuff 
Well, I think that's a good message to add this on. We have to, you know, I think that's part of the, what, why we're doing today as well to say, you know, Halloween can't stop, you know, we, we have to make it happen however we can. And uh, thanks guys for being here and uh, being such champions mm -hmm. for the Halloween spirit um, yeah. representatives of, of, you know, where you guys are from and uh, we'll see you guys soon. Okay, All right, thanks so much, thanks David. This Halloween season, dare to be scared in a whole new way. Three shows, drive through immersive sets, terrifying live performances, original special effects, all while trapped in the seat of your own car. See your favorite and scariest urban legends of Southern California come to life to scare you to death. <laughs> Your Halloween is saved. Buckle up. <laughs>we have sean keller a composer and screenwriter he wrote all that we destroy which you can see on hulu he's also the composer and creator of slash the musical and the creator of one of my favorite albums from last year the killer sounds of halloween right now he's going to perform an acoustic set with the misfit skulls and the ramones pet cemetery Hey, Midsummer Screamers, Sean Keller here, composer of The Killer Sounds of Halloween and the upcoming Revenge of The Killer Sounds of Halloween, available on Bandcamp September 22nd. Check it out. I am honored to be a part of Midsummer Scream's There in Spirit event. Uh, I know things may suck right now, but they will get better. And next Halloween, ugh, is going to be something else. I was going to play you a couple songs from my new album, but because I'm out here in the country, I decided, oh, you can hear it. Horse is going by. I'm out here in the country. Uh, I figured I would play you a couple of haunted country versions of some of my favorite horror rock tunes. So, uh, grab some moonshine, sit back and enjoy. Under the ark of weather stained boards, ancient goblins and wolves. Not making a sound The smell of death is all around And at night when the cold wind blows No one cares, nobody
Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Make sure to check out the Poltergeist and Paramours fashion show if you want to hear a couple of teases from the Revenge of the Killer Sounds of Halloween. amalia has got a hell of a fashion show lined up for you and four original songs from me. <laughs>
If you're in the mood for an uplifting tale about medical science, I recommend The Human Centipede. It's about a small town doctor that takes three people from all different walks of life and brings them closer together. It's really heartfelt and sweet. Anyway, enjoy lunch! Alright guys, welcome back to my kitchen. I am brewing up a little mad science now, because what's the pumpkin patch without a little fun? So, this is another super easy project. You can just do it with things that you have at home even. So, first, you just need some vegetable oil. Nice and simple. So all this really takes is vegetable oil, water, and some Alka-Seltzer tablets, and food coloring if you have it. Don't worry, I'm walking you through that all again. So, first, we're gonna pour in our oil into whatever you're using. You want to put it about there. Just like a little bit more than like two thirds of the way full. Next, we are going to pour in some water. I like to do this slowly because you're going to see the water kind. Can you see it in there? Yeah, you can. The water is going to slowly separate and land down at the bottom. So next, you can either use some food coloring added into a little bit more water. Nice and simple if you want. Just a couple of drops. Or, personally, I am just going to use, I have a um, liquid watercolor. It's basically the same thing as this. But I already have some of it ready to go. Let's see. So I have some black dye. The eyedropper is super fun to use to put, fill this up. Because you can just kind of watch it all settle in. So as, can you see that? Yeah, you can still, all right. Cool, so you'll watch them all kind of land down at the bottom. I'm gonna add a little bit of green to my concoction too. All the fun. So, uh, let's see, can you see in my bowl? Yeah, there it all is. You can add way more than what I'm doing, you can add less. But now is the fun part where we are going to take our Alka-Seltzer tablets or any, you wanna make sure that it's fizzing. This is the fun part. Break them up into a bunch of little pieces. Big pieces, little pieces, mix it all in. And now, just pop it in our creation and it's gonna start it's a bubble. Can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. Let's go. So as you add more tablets, you're gonna get a more bubbly, bubbly brew as it all hits the water. I love it, it's so cool. So you can also add in other things to see if they're going to float or how that's gonna happen. So I always love me as Maybe if some of you guys know, I love googly eyes. They're my favorite thing. I even have myself emergency googly eyes, which I am using here today. <laughs> so the trick with the googly eyes is you're gonna wanna cut holes in them and then put them in the water, in water to submerge them so they sink down to the bottom. Can you see that? Maybe a little bit. So then you're just gonna dig in with your hands and toss them in your creation. And then I also have some of these water orbs. They come either pre-done up or I also sell them in these teeny, can you even see those? Teeny, 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 tiny little balls that you just add water to, which is what I did in this pumpkin. So now I can add my googly eyes in. We can add in some of these bubbles. And then all you gotta do Add in some more tablets. I'm gonna watch as everything takes off. Yeah. Keep it going by adding more. Eventually, your magic potion will fizz itself out once it gets too much fizz in it. 
but you can see our bubbly creations as everything comes to the top and back down to the bottom. Eww, it looks so gross. I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. You can add um, colors in, you can add more like different types of toys to see how they come up and go. This is our ad scientist brew. Woo! Come see it? Yeah! Look at them go. It's gross. It's fun. Ugh. Science. <laughs> All right. Now you guys can say that I taught you something today. We'll see you again soon. Paranormal Pixie out. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Screaming Room. Uh, we have another really good short film for you today, and uh, I I don't know how they pulled this off, and I, I would love to meet these guys and party with them. They seem like so much fun. So uh, without any further ado, please enjoy Sesame, uh, uh, <laughs> A Nightmare on Sesame Street. Hey! Yeah. hey. What up? Um, hope everyone's doing well and safe out there. Um, I'm Matthew Rodriguez, and I just want to say that we're super thankful of A Midsummer Scream and The Scream Room presented by Horror Buzz for uh, selecting our short film. Um, truly honored and blessed. Uh, I'm a part of Gargo Media, which is this team right here. Um, we have Clarence Williams. Producer, glad to be here. And then we also have Steve Deering. Hello, I'm the writer and I have a Midsummer Scream t-shirt. And then here we have Lauren Buxton. This is a makeup artist, so it's really fun to work on this film. Thank you for having us. And last but not least, we have Joaquin Silva. Hello, um, I'm sort of jack of all trades. Uh, for this short, uh, I was assistant to the makeup artist. Um, I also help with the camera work and I try to focus on the lights and also on the sort of stage a little bit. He literally was a jack of all trades. Um, we're truly appreciative. Uh, a little bit about this short. So Steve Deering got a Sesame Street puppet and he coerced me into getting one as well. So I got an Elmo puppet. And two years ago, I took Elmo and I dressed him up as Freddy Krueger to Midsummer Scream two years ago. And he was a big hit and everyone loved it. Everyone took pictures with him and it was just great to just walk around with him. And Steve decided like, we can't just let this go for one time thing. We gotta make a short out of this. So he wrote this amazing, funny, awesome script. And we came together and we uh, filmed it in a couple days and it was just an awesome experience. It was just super fun uh, to mix the elements of puppetry and live action and it was just great and it was awesome. And so we hope you guys enjoy it as much as we did as well. If you want, uh, check us out on YouTube and Instagram, Gargoyle Media. Uh, we have a lot more content, but without further ado, please enjoy A Nightmare on Sesame Street. Cut the check.
I'm in a dream. I'm asleep. Somebody wake me up! Teenagers over by the lake. Let's go fuck them up. Yay! Today's murder was brought to you by the number one, the color red, and by victims like you. recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet. If you love traveling to exotic locations, then you're gonna love The Thing. If you haven't seen it, it's about a group of scientists at the North Pole who take turns keeping a visitor warm while it tries to go home. It's really sweet, actually. Alrighty, folks, we're back with Mr. David Kirshner, and a little earlier you saw him talking about his masterpiece, Hocus Pocus. But one thing that maybe a lot of people don't know is this man is one of the mega producers behind the Child's Play and Chucky films. David, welcome back. And my goodness, you have a new, exciting Chucky project on the horizon, which I saw the teaser for, and I'm excited. So can you tell us a bit about it and how it came about? Sure. Uh, my partner and I, Don Mancini, um, who we've been partners on Chucky for 33 years, and um, there was an opportunity through Sci-Fi and USA uh, to make a television series. And the idea of an eight-hour continuous story was incredibly exciting to us. 
We have an amazing budget to be able to pull off what we want to do. And, uh, but, you know, we we've unfortunately had to postpone it by a couple months because of, of the virus. So as opposed to going up in August, uh, the team will go up uh, the beginning of the year now uh, to uh, Toronto. So we're, we're really, really excited about it. And uh, Brad Dourif is, is joining us uh, again, uh, as he has for 33 years. And, uh, and his daughter, Fiona Dourif, of course, uh, who's been in the last two that, uh, that Don directed and, and wrote. So we're, we're really, really excited about it. And the fans seem incredibly excited about it, more importantly. And there's double the chance to see it because it's going to be on USA and Sci-Fi, I believe. And as you mentioned, it is the production's delayed. But do you have? Is there any sort of release date or season in mind at the moment? I think we're looking at uh, fall of uh, Halloween of next year. So, David, you said you've been working and playing with Chucky for 33 years now. I actually don't even know the story. How did you first get involved? Was this a script you found, or you know, how did it start? Don had written. Uh, his original script was titled Blood Buddy, and I read it and really liked the idea of it. And um, and then I started to do my drawings of Chucky, and we went out to studios, and it was exciting. We, we had five studios that were bidding for it. Wow. I didn't realize that. And you, that's yeah. right. You said you started drawing Chucky. You are, what's, are you the designer of that creepy doll that everybody's yes. scared of? I am, I am that. And, you know, there have been brilliant uh, puppeteers, the likes of Kevin Yeager originally and, and uh, Tony Gardner, who worked with us on Hocus Pocus, uh, that have continued that and bring Chucky to life with their brilliant engineering and animatronics and puppet skills. And this is, you know, Chuck, this is the first time Chucky has his own TV series, right? It's always been movies up to this point. It's always been movies, and, and we've signed a deal for two more films. Uh, one day when we finish the show, hopefully the show will go on for... Uh, few years but um but yeah sci-fi has been uh, amazing about it and uh, and universal has just been so supportive and it's it's really it's really exciting just to see this and plan in a, in a different way than a film as to how you're going to do this yeah and of course a lot of the people watching today are huge halloween horror nights fans at the universal studios parks and over the years we've had chucky uh, to entertain us at those events have you ever had a chance to check those out in person i have not it scares oh. me too much <laughs> i know that sounds <laughs> crazy and that's probably like the shoe cobbler saying i shoes scare me but i uh no i my wife and i were there once and it was it was too much for us so uh, <laughs> We send our daughters and, and they go and scream and then they don't have a voice for a couple of weeks. <laughs> That's fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David. We're all very excited about the new Chucky series coming to USA and Sci-Fi in 2021 for a Halloween season. And good luck with production and everything. And thanks so much for joining us once again today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being so supportive. Hey everyone, uh, we are just about into our final hour of the telethon. Again, please go to Midsummer Scream forward slash live and uh, donate some money. We're giving to some good causes, uh, helping people out because of the pandemic. Um, please, if you can throw in a buck, throw in five bucks, whatever you can do. Uh, and if you can't, we totally understand. Um, coming up in the next hour, just a quick rundown of what we have going on. Um, we have our final film from Horror Buzz. Uh, we're going to be going live to Knott's Berry Farm, uh, and we have Zombie Joe and um, talking about urban death. Um, and right now we have our final haunt preview of the show. So let's take that away. Hey, everybody. Thank you for being there with us in spirit. Midsummer Scream, happy August 1st. Hey, we have Diane and Preston in the studio with us. Rotten Apple, ladies and gentlemen, cow haunts. They're legends. They're legends here in Southern California. We love these guys. How are you? How are you guys doing? We're doing good. Good, good. Doesn't look like you're in Burbank right now. Not right now, no. All right. With all this extra free time, we went to Big Bear. So well, you're social distancing. You yeah, right. That's it, right? Yep. So, well, 
Halloween season is creening down on us like a runaway train. And uh, the theme parks still are not open. Theme park events are canceling. So now we kind of turn to our home haunters to be kind of the leaders in, in this mess. What, what, what are your plans as they stand right now? Of course, everything is subject to change. It could change any time. What are you guys up to for Halloween? We've decided that we're just going to do a yard display. Okay. It would be our 30th anniversary for walkthroughs. Okay. But we worried about the big long lines and whether we went through, we had this real elaborate thing planned for our 30th anniversary. And then we thought, well, what if the city comes through and closes us down? We've done all this work and, you know, and stuff. And we didn't want our actors to get sick and everybody else that comes through. Of course. And a haunt is so enclosed and confined and everybody's screaming and yelling and, you know, it just doesn't sound right. No. So we decided to go with the yard display. But, you know, of course, we want to kind of do a big yard display because it's, uh, you know, you know us. (laughs) You. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. And so then will we kind of do like Midsummer did where we, we, we froze time and we said that the fifth anniversary will be next year. So 30th yeah. anniversary next year for you. Yes. We're, yes. yes. Because it's 30, 30th anniversary of walkthrough haunts. Before yeah. the walkthrough, we actually did yard displays. Okay. Okay. So great. In theory, it's it, we can move it to next year. Well, tell us about what the yard display is going to be like. Well, knowing us, we started off small and decided that that wasn't us. And so now we've gotten probably bigger than we should, but that's, is us. Um, I love you. Yeah. It, it's kind of a takeoff on. A haunted mansion. Yeah. Haunted mansion. Uh, yeah. We're trying to do a little bit different though, because we got to do our take on it. Yeah. Sure. And so we're trying to incorporate the haunted mansion and, um, the outside of it is more the look of Phantom Matter in Paris. Nice. And um, and then we wanted to incorporate some of the Museum of the Weird. So, okay. so we're doing some of those things and bringing them in. Plus, you know, changing it up so it yeah. will be us. And we, and we have to throw in our extra little things like every, you know, like some years, like the when we had the flood, we had the bees that, you know, uh, we put in there. Well, this year at the cabin, we've had... Uh, moth infestation and tons of moths, like hundreds of them. And big moths, not yeah. just little big and, ones. Invaded inside the house. And wow. and so you're not doing a Godzilla theme. You could be like Monster Island and Mothra could be well, yeah, Mothman. So you know, we're going moths have to be someplace in in the <laughs> in the mansion this year because of all the moths that we've had. So nice. nice. Well that's great. And you guys are are safe and healthy. Everybody on the crew good? So far. Yes, yeah, so far, so good. And um, we're, we're starting to work on this stuff. So, and thankfully, most of our crew has been hunkered down. Okay. The That's whole time. Great. Well, and, we're excited uh, to see what you guys do with your yard display. And while I have you guys, I want to just get a kind of a general update also on, on, the, on the feel of Cal Haunts. How, how is the Cal Haunts community doing? The Cal, Cal Haunts community is doing okay. They're they're in mourning because they can't do Midsummer this year. So wow. it's like every day we all have our stuff on Facebook that comes up with all the different years that we've done in Midsummer, and so we're all going yeah. oh, and we're all going through serious withdrawals, missing each other. So we can hardly wait. We're hoping maybe we might be able to do a park get together or something in September, but it's a wait and see what happens. Of course. Of course it is. Well, great. We will continue to update all the fans as we get closer to the Halloween season. This will be the first of many more Haunter updates to come. And I want to thank you guys for stopping in with us today. Uh, it's nothing like having you there in the flesh in Long Beach. Yeah, but, we, miss it. Yeah, we love you guys and uh, look forward to seeing what you can do uh, for the Halloween season. We, we look to you guys and, and, and love you and Keep safe, okay? You too. Thank you. All right. Take care, guys. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. Real quick, I uh, wanted to show you uh, a shirt that you can that is available. Limited edition by Tino Evil. They made this just for today's Their in Spirit event. Um, it's available on their site at tinoevil.com and $5 from every purchase is going to go to our uh, fundraising event. 
So again, thanks to uh, Tino Evil for making that. It's been a tradition every year they've been making a, a shirt just for us. Um, and that's the one for this year. Um, now we are going to, through magic, Rick West has transported himself all the way to Buena Park to the Cauldron. Rick, how's it going in Buena Park? Well, here we are. We are at the Cauldron. It's been, it seems like forever since I've been here. And anybody that knows me knows this is like my favorite bar in the world. And I'm here with the boss. I'm here with Laura Hanneman. Here we go. And we're, we're, we're kind of social distancing, but we, <laughs> but we have the masks on. So it feels like we're being waterboarded here in Buena Park. Um, so, but I just wanted to come down because obviously uh, the cauldron is very near and dear to our hearts. And uh, this is obviously not an easy time for anybody. So we wanted to just talk with Laura and see what we're doing as far as like seating and that type of thing, because the business is open, you guys. And uh, Laura also has some cool ideas for the Halloween season. So uh, why don't you share with us? Well, we do have a patio right now and we opened up our patio in the back as well. So we have two patios right now. And then during Halloween, I'm planning some evil uh, events that we can yes. have like a uh, week of uh, different themed events, um, themed costume contests, um, week long and then a, a tarot reader things like that so we'll have stuff to do and you know always our great cocktails and food to do yes absolutely i'm having some of that right now yeah. <laughs> yes or i'm about to actually anyway well let's take a walk we'll, we'll walk outside and so laura obviously this is a tough time yeah so what's what what have you guys done to kind of uh shift shift gears into the covid mode well, we're obviously uh, have to, you know, kind of go away from our indoor atmosphere of yes. outdoors. So I did build a new patio here so you can see, um, you know, things that are happening out here, uh, a little more a shade structure, things yep. like that. Um, and then we're going to have right over there maybe a uh, nice photo up during Halloween. Nice. Well, you know, as you guys can see, I, it's the first time in a long time we can say smoking or not. So well, yes, right? Okay, yeah. There, and then the back is, There's the smoking, the, the smoking kids back there. So look, so I tried to switch the. So this is the first time that I've been on my phone for this whole stream, and I'm blowing it nicely. So I'm gonna just, we're just gonna kind of like turn the camera that way, so you guys can see. I don't want to mess with moving the camera around anymore. But as you can see, everybody is really nice, spaced out, and uh, totally feels safe here. And uh, let's take a walk around and see where the other other seating is over here. So there you go. She set up also a really nice area on the back side here. This is where where kids can come and smoke if they want to smoke. And uh, regardless, yeah, dogs are welcome. and dogs are welcome. So it's dog friendly kids. So uh, it's socially uh, appropriate and dogs are welcome. What else could you ask for, right? Except maybe cats, black cats. <laughs> yeah, I love cats. You have a new black cat. I do. You Chloe. Yes, she's awesome. That's perfect. So really that's, uh, that's what's going on here at the Cauldron. And, and Laura has some really good ideas for Halloween. And uh, looks like, uh, you know, they're, the big events are kind of canceling and out. Check our website and our, and our uh, Instagram, our, yeah. our Facebook for specials every week. Okay, we perfect. We do different things all the time. Um, and it's, you know, it's a really chill place to go. I know it's it's hard to find right now because uh, everybody is, is scrambling to, to, to find that place to go and yeah. hang out. Yeah. But we're still the same vibe um, just outside. Yeah, absolutely. This is it, guys. This is like the best place to be. So uh, if you have a hankering for some some liquor and, and want to come get something really good to eat, Cauldron is absolutely open. But definitely check our website, check our socials also, and uh, come out there and show some love. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We're going to go right oh, into the, There we go. Come out here. Yes, Laura misses you. That's right. <laughs> so I think what we're going to do now, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. What we're going to do now is I think we're going to go right into, I have, uh, I think, an interview with Zombie Joe. But first, we have a slideshow from them we're going to check out.
right. All right. Oh, man, I miss some zombie Joes. We got to get some zombie Joes in here. Is there any zombie in the house? What's up, Request? Oh, my God. It's zombie What's Joe. How are Check you, brother? Out. Check Look it out, man. You. Limited edition. Man. Love it. And you're rocking the hat. That's awesome, my brother. Is Jana Weimer here with us? Jana, is Jana here? If Jana's here, bring her up there. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Now we got the whole crew in the house. I miss you guys. We miss oh, my you God. Too. Dude, are no, you guys, I, first of all, everybody safe and sound? Everybody cool? Yep. Rarely leave my house. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Zombie, how about you? You staying You staying at home and guarding your Star Wars collection? I am, man. It's tough. Here, check it out. Mandalorian. Or no, it's, this is actually the holiday special uh, Boba Fett. I wanted to show you like a uh, figure from the holiday special. <laughs> I love, I love that you just like randomly have that right in front of you to grab. And that's awesome. So you guys, what, obviously the world is different right now and we're all adapting. What, uh, what are the plans for zombie Joe's and definitely what are you guys going to be doing come Halloween time when it's, uh, you know, the tour of terror. Um, Jana, you want to tell them a little bit about it, what we're doing? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we're working on a COVID friendly experience. Um, okay. You know, the goal will to be that, you know, people can walk, show up with their hands in their pockets and never take them out. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, but it just depends on if we can even do that. So, uh, you know, but it's as soon as it's safe to do something, we'll be there. We'll, we'll be doing something. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And zombie, how's, how's like, how's the theater group doing? Like just collectively, how's everything going? Um, going pretty good. Um, we could always be doing more because I feel, um, our, our beloved group is very hungry and really rearing to, to, you know, stay active and stay busy. Um, so yeah, we had a big project last month. Um, our Astroglide streaming project that was for 18 nights straight from Got the it, theater right. um and then um we're in development for a, a couple new projects and yeah the season's coming up so yeah. i know that's that's on everybody's sites and um and you know i gotta say too man this this event this all-day event has been so awesome man it's been so great i've been following it it's Thank been you. it's i mean it's not quite you know like being at the convention center of and, course and, yeah and, you know, hugging everybody and, and you know, yeah. like high fiving every, you know, all of our friends. But but um, it's I'm so grateful you guys did this because this has been a real educational and it's been a real it's been great all day. Perfect. Yeah, it's been crazy. And, you know, hats off to David Marklin. This is really his baby. And uh, he's awesome. done a hell of a job putting everything together. And of course, all of our team, you know, behind the scenes at the master controls, all of our guests that have been on the show, all the haunters. And, dude, above all, like, the fans, right, the community, everybody's watching this, and it's been really a phenomenal, phenomenal event, and we just hope that everybody watching has been just enjoying it and, and, and educated, and, you know, it's been, a, it's been a hell of a thing, and we do miss everybody, and we're very sorry that we're not with you guys right now in Long Beach, you know, partying down, but uh, it is what it is, and I think that uh, this community, no matter what, comes together. And we always just show up. And that's, I think, what everybody's done today. And I'm glad you guys are my last interview for the day. So I, I'm, I'm glad that I get to end on a high note with you guys. And uh, it's good to see your faces. I miss you guys and, and love the entire team. And please, just on behalf of the entire Midsummer team, tell everybody at Zombie Joe's that we miss them and we can't wait to be back in the black box with you guys. Hey, who are you calling a black box? <laughs> I love you, man. You're a nut. I love you so much. <laughs> yeah, man. So um, we're looking forward to it's really exciting to see. Um, I know a lot of uh, there's a lot of question marks about the uh, about the upcoming season, but it's so yes. good to see that everyone's rearing to go and ready to go to plan B if necessary. And so we're yeah. uh, for, you know, for urban death uh, for Jana and myself. We're right in that boat. We're we're in development, yep. and um, yep. you know there probably won't be a whole lot of notice if if we're gonna you know when we open something. But uh, when yeah. it's safe and when it's legal, 
uh, and everybody feels safe so they can totally enjoy the experience. Um, right. We're going to, we're going to unleash it on, uh, on this town, baby. We're going to do it. And it's only, you know, um, you know, the Midsummer Scream, this event is like, you know, brought everybody together. It's brought the whole community together once again over this streaming. I was like, how are these guys going to do that? And like, how many people can they possibly talk to? But it's unbelievable the, the programming that you guys did today, like a little bit of everything and coming back to stuff. And so um, we're proud to be a part of it. We're proud to be part of the honk community. Um, Urban Death is, is here to stay. And um, we're really super excited for Midsummer Scream is here to stay. Next year, it's, I mean, Dude, in 21, I mean, oh, it's yeah. going to be, it's going to take, oh, it, I mean, it's already taken over, but <laughs> it's going to take over, baby. Woo! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can't wait That's to have how you we guys party. with us. You bet. Thank you so much, you guys. <laughs> Thank Good seeing you. And we will be talking to you very soon in the weeks ahead, keeping everybody posted as to what you guys are doing for Halloween. We're going to keep everybody in the loop. Awesome. Thank right you. On. All right, guys. And All right, Rick, Rick yes. one more thing. You're very, yes. very good looking. You should consider not covering up your face oh with uh, my with God. <laughs> You're a madman. I love you guys. Thank you and have a good night, you guys. Stay safe. Bye. 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 <laughs> book horror come alive. Capture Aural Fantasy Theater presents Captivity, a mind-boggling explosion of classic horror sensations. Captivity is Captured Aural Fantasy Theater's exclusive visual performance series that brings vintage horror comics like this to life on your screen. Vintage horror comics have influenced generations from the gruesome to the spooky. Captured Aural Fantasy Theater's team of voice and visual artists create an aural and video experience of terror. Captured Aural Fantasy Theater is the original and premier comic book performing troupe. We give old comics a modern voice. See Captivity online at capturedaralfantasy.com and at CaptLA on social media. The end, if you dare. Hey, uh, up next we have a, uh, a recipe to make a tiki cocktail just in time for Halloween. Go for it, guys. For those that have explored the horrors of the exotic with me at past Midsummer Screams, know that for every map that contains warning of monsters, there are also sanctuaries that lie at the edges of the mysterious unknown. Here, dangers only the bravest explorers have witnessed are reinterpreted as stories, music, and celebration. These sanctums are known as tiki bars, and this drink is one such addition to their lore. Who's ready to scream? Today, we're going to learn how to make a Midsummer Cinnamon Screamer. Into a pre-ice-filled cocktail shaker. Half an ounce of cinnamon syrup. Getting the spices start right off. Half an ounce of non-alcoholic falernum, getting it even spicier and sweeter. You're gonna want some pog, two ounces, also known as pineapple orange guava juice. Some freshly squeezed lime juice, you're gonna want an ounce of that. 
couple dashes of sweet vermouth, pink, pink, and an ounce of pineapple rum. Three quarters of an ounce of Chambord, which is a black raspberry liqueur. Representing Surf and Turf Mythical Beasts, we have one ounce of Kraken Rum, portraying the horrors of the sea. Taking it back to dry land to slay some personal dragons, a quarter ounce of the St. George Absinthe Vert. Feel free to substitute with anything else that tastes like licorice because I, this can cost a pirate's booty. Stir everything well, do not shake. When mixing this drink, air towards the nautical. Think maelstrom, not earthquakes. Choose an appropriately horrific drinking vessel filled with ice and pour. And in honor of our tentacle-faced Lord Cthulhu, decorate with lime twist curls and any other final preparations. In the spirit of the Flying Dutchman, now add a pre-frozen lime boat and fill that with 151 rum. Light on fire. And like the falling ash of an angry volcano, sizzle it up with some sprinkled cinnamon. Always remember, safety first. Are you ready to scream? Let's find out. Norm. Hey, Norm. Norm. There you are. We're not done yet. We have one more movie to show. Hey, how are you guys? Sorry, I was given a, a I was, anyway, the point is, uh, here we are, the final, the, the very final uh, entry for the screaming room. And uh, this one gets a little bit dark if you stick with it. So without further ado, uh, let's roll the final film. Hi, I'm Paul Diegler, director of uh, Horrorscope. And if you enjoy our short film, you're a bad person. Mrs. Anderson, take a seat. I beg you to be honest, Doctor. I'm afraid your daughter is suffering from quite a rare disease. What disease are we exactly talking about? We call it HMT. It stands for Horror Movie Trailer-itis. What will it do to my baby? The daughter will start feeling things, hearing things. Out of the blue. For no reason whatsoever.
body will start transforming and evolving into something unnatural. Something any human creature would call evil. Where is Beauty Wish Kiss? I can barely see sometimes. Is she losing sight, Doctor? She looks like she's going to faint. Not fainting. But fading. Fading in. Fading out. Fading in. Fading out. Fading in. Fading out. What are we going to do, Doctor? We need to save her. There's only one way. We have to resort to the ancient words. Are you talking about an exorcism? Easier than that. <laughs> Stereotypes. How are you so sure this method will work? I'm actually more than an ordinary, boring doctor. You know, in my spare time and so on. God's sake, woman. I was joking. If you're laughing right now, so am I. That was hilarious. Um, I, I have one more surprise for you. But first, I wanted to remind you uh, that entries for The Screaming Room are still up. They're still. We're still taking them, and uh, we'll we'll be taking them all the way through to next year. Uh, and we really want to see some amazing film. We've already seen some amazing films today, but uh, there's still more out there. So um, we want to support the indie horror film community. We want to support everybody uh, who's creating and creating film, because this is a difficult time for all of us. So just, yeah, let's do this. Now, our final little surprise for you is one of my all-time favorite uh, bits from The Screaming Room, and uh, it's called The Nightmare Cows. So, tell me about these nightmare cows. Well, there's there's different so so there's some have like baby baby nightmare cows that that give you little nightmares and the big ones give you really scary dreams and they have like fish tails and they have a like a smile like like an evil smile so the the one that comes in the morning gets the Purple and white one. The, and the worst come in the in night. The, the blue one is a good one. The yellow one, the spin the one. And the worst are bad. Purple, the purple one is the only, the really early, early morning one. Come on, look it up. So the little ones have little fish tails. They have little evil smiles. It's just the same, same except they're smaller. 
But you just look them up. The only thing to defeat them is cut them in half with a knife. You should look them up. Barry recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet. I really love The Devil's Rejects. It's about a family that takes a road trip together and then they wind up in some sticky situations like with traveling musicians and the police and tutti fruity ice cream. Top secret clone business. <laughs> oh, I love Barry. Okay. Um, so we are going to read our final list of donors that donated to uh, give butter uh, I believe that the donation site will be open for a few more hours, but this will be the last opportunity that we have to uh, say thank you to the donors that have given thus far. You guys have been awesome, all of you. We appreciate you hanging out with us today. So let's get started. I know I'm nowhere near as glamorous as uh, Christy McConnell or Kimberly J. Brown or Kelly Maroney, but you guys will deal. Okay, so we've got thank you to Corey Hench. Allison M. Dubrowski, Jana McDowell, Rick Braithwaite, Michael Sandoval, Don Waxen, Jennifer Tomchak, Ted Doherty, Sarah Nicklin, Sunshine Marie Smith, Pamela Periquet, Mona Neufeld, David Voss, Foss, Nick Mondello, Diana Lopez, Brandon Santoro, Kamali Patterson, Ella Glickman, Jennifer Vasquez, Adam Cohen, Ricardo Calderon, James Markland, Dad and Judy, uh, Courtney Clendenen, Clendenen uh, John Duff, David Alden, Timothy Lyons, Emily Sayex, Reese and Dean Willis, Jeff Gailey Rie, and Isaiah Buccio. Thank you guys all so much. Hey, um, so we're getting, we're now just have 30 minutes left. And uh, so we're getting all getting pretty loopy, but before uh, we get too far into it, I wanna give a big thanks to some of the people who donated products for uh, premium purchases. I think there's a few things left. Go to midsummerscream.org forward slash live, scroll down, look for the link for premiums and anything you buy, all the money goes towards our charities. Um, let me bring this stuff up to the magic of computer technology. Um, so we have uh, Vintage Halloween. These books sold out quickly, but uh, Robert Pandas donated a number of these great books uh, showing all sorts of old Bicel and other vintage Halloween decor, which uh, I don't know if they're available still on Amazon, but if you can get your hands on one of these, it is eye candy for anybody who loves orange and black in the season of Halloween. Um, see here. Abby Bell Folk Art uh, donated a, uh, a figurine. <clears throat> that one sold pretty quick, but you can find more of her stuff on Etsy and online. Derek, <laughs> I, I wish I'd gotten his name first, but Vukasic uh, donated a bunch of paintings and uh, models and figurines uh, that uh, I believe we have a few of those still available. And uh, Hotwire Foam Factory donated uh, very generously two kits uh, that you can use to design anything from a, a tombstone to an entire cemetery uh, using foam. Um, these tools are fantastic, and anyone can learn how to use them. And Dark Delicacies, of course, is always who have always been a huge, huge supporter of not just Midsummer Scream, but the entire horror community. They are up in Burbank. If you get a chance, please go and visit them. Uh, they are open, wear a mask, uh, but uh, they have just about anything you could think of they've got a, you know a ton of horror books that's their specialty but they also have um a bunch of uh horror collectibles um sign stuff they have signings all the time so keep an eye on their website um all that said uh barry made a few more videos for us so uh let's show another one do you guys have those queued up barry recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet 
If you love traveling to exotic locations, then you're gonna love The Thing. If you haven't seen it, it's about a group of scientists at the North Pole who take turns keeping a visitor warm while it tries to go home. It's really sweet, actually. That one's great. Um, do we have any others? Let's do another one. Let's just let's just like have a berry marathon right now, unless the commenters say no more berry. Barry recommends horror movies that you definitely haven't seen yet. A passion of mine is travel, and even though I haven't been there yet, the Long Hard State is on my bucket list because of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's about a Texas man with a big heart struggling to deal with the different faces we all put on while struggling to put food on the table for his family. Mmm, mmm, barbecue. And I'm looking into the control room. Do you guys we have we have any more? No, wait. Okay, well then what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna surprise them. I'm gonna bring in Ian and Chris from our control room to say uh hi to them. These are the guys who've been flipping switches behind the scenes all day long. Uh Ian. Hello. Chris. Oh <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. What's up? Uh, how's it going? Uh, oh good. Yeah. How did it feel? Yeah. Have you guys done a eight hour live stream before? Uh, I've done a 24 hour one, but we were taking shifts for that. And okay. I think I like yeah. slept like four hours into it. Right. But, like, well, I learned from that. I drank like two cups of coffee and I'm now drinking Mountain Dew. So all the caffeine is mine. Ian, what have, what have your beverages of choice been today? Uh, I just been drinking water. So out Ian, of a beer glass. Uh, hydration. Ian, for those who, uh, who may have met him, Ian is uh, like our operations master for Hall of Shadows and has been since the very beginning. Um, indispensable with logistics. Um, thank you, Ian, for jumping on board this year, too, just, uh, just to be part of it. I really, really appreciate it. Um, you, you, you are the spirit of Midsummer Scream. Oh, I try. It's, it's a lot of fun to work. Um, and it's just great to see the growth over the years. It's been amazing. Hollow Shadows started in that little tiny corner of a ballroom and has grown into a massive miniature theme park. It's it's awesome. Yeah. And then, and then Chris joined us for the first time last year. And um, it, it was a great addition and helping us. Uh, we stuck him in a production office, but uh, he managed to help us run the show from there. Um, so, Chris, really glad to have you part of the team. It's, it's really fun. I love it. It's great. And I see you're wearing one of our cool shirts. Heck yeah. Yeah. It's so cute. I love the bat cat. Bat cat. Cat bat. Bat cat. Now, it looks like right now, I think we, we have Gary Baker uh, over Gary right Baker right now. And I think and we can bring him to say hi, our executive producer. He's on two cameras, it looks like. Let, let's bring him in. Um, guys, we'll see you in a little bit with our final goodbyes. All righty. Hey, Gary, how's it going? Can you hear me? Oh, hey, how you doing? Good, uh, good. You're, you're a little quiet, but it might be because of the mask. Yeah, probably. I'll try to speak louder. So uh, yeah. we traveled down here to Knott's after our introduction today, and... Uh, I have to say, everything I thought went really well on the podcast today. Um, and uh, all the seminars were just really informative. I'm, I'm so glad that you put this together, and kudos to you and the entire team for making this happen. It was phenomenal. So Thanks, thank Gary. You. Thanks for being part of it and being a, a good lead, a good leader with us as well. Thanks. So we decided to come down here for dinner Um you know, when you think about Halloween, uh, the first thing I think that comes into everybody's mind is Knott's Berry Farm. Um, so I'm here with our two MCs that handle all of the announcing for Midsummer Scream. I have um, Kevin Horton and I have Justin Cast Castillo with us also. Uh, Kevin handles main stage and uh, Justin handles page two, and they've been such a help to us over the years. So I thought I'd kind of just flip the phone and let them talk a little bit about what's going on down here right now. So Sure. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Welcome. Hey, to how's it going? 
Welcome to Midsummer Scream. I, I need to hear that from Kevin, too. Go for it, Kevin. Welcome to Virtual Midsummer Scream. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. So how, how's it going uh, with what's happening down there in Buena Park? Is it crowded or? I always tell people it's like Knott's Berry Farm is going back to its roots because if you look down the street here, they've got benches out, so everything is socially distant and within the last hundred years no one's been able to eat on the street here but if you can see that's what the restaurants are doing so it, it looks, so they're socially distancing everything looks great so you can get your chicken dinner and eat it outside yes can you can you show us yes hang on just a second i'll show you we're, right here. we're gonna flip the camera so okay. you can see okay kind of check right here you can kind of see all the picnic tables back there behind me Justin, you have like the best hair. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you can kind of see, um, there was a line over here earlier, but it's kind of died down. Um, you can go over there and you can get your chicken dinner and then you can eat. Here's kind of a shot down the street. Um, these are all the picnic tables. You can come out. Obviously, you can take it back to your car. You can go or you can stay out here. And then if you see on the other side, like down from those sunflowers, um, they kind of took the notch. Uh, chicken restaurant and kind of just bought it outside. Um, so you have a couple options, which is pretty cool. And oh, uh, we have Rufus the rooster. I don't know if you guys can you guys see him? Not not yet, but yeah, get get closer. Oh, is that a live rooster? That is Rufus the rooster at Knott's Berry Farm. Um, he, he is kind of like the mascot and the head honcho around here. So does he have he an Instagram popular. account? <laughs> so there you have it. I'll take you guys back over to Gary now. <laughs> all right. That sounds good. Um, all right. And uh, let's uh, bring in Rick here. I see Rick's online. Hey, Rick. Hey. Hey, I'm far away from everybody, so I'm not, I'm not being irresponsible. I'm just kind of like my entire face smells like cauldron food. So I didn't want to inflict that on my midsummer bandana. So I'm out here in the middle of the parking lot. Oh, cool. Well, let's start bringing in the team here. Um, we, we still have a, a good 17 minutes to go. So, um, you know, do you have any other thoughts? You, you watched it, Gary, or what, what was a highlight for you? Are you talking to me? I am. Oh, there we go. A little hard to hear out here with the music. Um, That's okay. Was there a highlight for you? Today? Um, yep. I really enjoyed the, uh, the dark ride of all things. Um, yeah. That that was cool seeing that because that's that's so old school. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah it awesome. I agree. So, um, we just had so much great content today. Um, it, it was just like spending August first in Long Beach, and and going to all the different panels down there. That that's what I loved about it. Is but the, no lines. You, yeah, there, even though we couldn't, you know, be there in person. This worked out absolutely perfect. Uh, you guys were all so good. And the tech team that kept this moving was yeah. So thank you to all of them, yeah. too. Absolutely. And, and mass being, you know, socially whatever. So. Claire, what was a highlight for you? Oh, for me, it's been a lot of fun watching all of the commentary and just seeing uh, friends that I can't see in person actually be here and online and virtual. And that's been, you know, that's just been a lot of fun and connecting with people all day. And uh, also not walking 30 miles in a day has been pretty cool and yet still having the opportunity <laughs> to <laughs> participate in Midsummer Scream. Though I have to say that, you know, there is there is a little bit of badge of honor that I that I do get when I get to brag about, yeah, I walked 30 miles in a weekend. Uh, that's not happening this time. I walked from here to the kitchen and back, you know, so. Nice. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the shorts were awesome. It was really fun to get to chat with Christy McConnell and Kelly briefly. Um, yeah, I mean, just it's been it's been a really great and, you know, really shout out to you, David, for having this be something that you thought of and put together in such a short amount of time. You really are a terrific leader. I'm so grateful to get to be a part of this team and yeah. I appreciate that. I'm gonna bring up, uh, take a quick peek here at our leaderboard. So how, how we're doing on donations. There we go. 
It was also really cool to see uh, the little shop of hairdos. I hadn't been there. I think when we were there for the the um, the outdoor event that we did, I forget what it's called. That remember uh, that event? Punk fl punk flea market. Yeah, the punk flea. I didn't. We were too busy, so I didn't have the opportunity to go oh. check it out. Um, and so that was really cool. Like that was, I mean, and honestly, I think I got to see more of the event doing it this way than had we been live in Long Beach. Oh yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> though nothing can replace that, at least yeah. I feel like, I'm like, oh, this is what people get excited about. Okay, cool. <laughs> all throughout today, Claire's been kind of monitoring all the premiums that have been sold and uh, the, donate, the donor lists and everything. How, how much do you think we raised on the premiums alone so far? On the premiums, we have raised at least seven hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. Um, nice. So that's all from the donated, and that's um, we still do have a few items left that will remain up. So if you can't, you know, if you haven't had the opportunity to go today and purchase, you know, those items will still remain on uh, on the Square Shop uh, until we get them sold. And all, like I said, all proceeds, or what's the correct term? Their shipping will be removed from the cost, but other than that, everything's going to go to the three charities split equally. So, and and it, right, yeah, it's a, I was going to say. So right now we are at uh, thirty-eight hundred twenty-seven dollars uh, in donations. Um, oh, that's great. Again, go to midsummer. Sorry, midsummerscream.org forward slash live, and you can donate on here. Um, you can see Timothy Lyons, another one of our great uh, white bats uh, team members. He, he's he donated some money, um, and uh, a big, big thank you to the uh, Creepy Kingdom crew, uh, along with doing that great horror is the new black panel. They raised uh, six hundred ten dollars amongst themselves. Horror Buzz raised three hundred sixty-seven, and our white bath right now we're able to raise two eighty-five. And Lovecraft um, raised two fifty. Um, so we're, awesome. we're doing, we're doing good, but like yeah. I'd love to get that to four thousand by the end of the day, which. Uh, in 12 minutes, if you're watching this, if you're able to comment and you can spare a buck or two, please just, just go in there. Uh, it's, it's going to help out people who are really going to need it. Uh, Cause you know, this year, you know, our, our role is to really try to spread the Halloween spirit, but if we can help out in other ways too, uh, let's do it. I also want to give a shout out to Emily who's here with us. Who's been just my right hand today and over the past couple Days. There she is. Yay. Hey. She's that our uh, she's she's the Claire Wrangler essentially, but she really did. <laughs> she very much helped with all of the merchandising and helping getting the photos together for all of the people that donated. Um, of course, she was able to chat with Kimberly J. Brown as because they're like besties. And uh, yeah, so thanks, I wish. Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a favorite part of the day, Emily? I think, honestly, for me, my favorite part of the day was um, Jeff DePauly's Disney trivia with the villains. I'm a huge Disney nut, and um, I loved his Disney clues and trying to guess the villain. So I think that was one of my favorite parts, aside from, of course, chatting with Kimberly J. Brown. It's always great to chat with her. <laughs> um, Jackie. What about you? Did you have a highlight besides bringing us kittens? <laughs> kittens. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Ooh, highlight. I really love the shorts. I never, I mean, much like everyone here, I never get to see much running around doing the convention. So the shorts were at the Elmo. Oh my gosh. Wow. That was so funny. <laughs> it was really good. Uh, it was fun to be able to hear these panels, see them, and really experience more than what I normally get to do. I miss being there, of course, and I miss playing with all the kitties. But yeah, this was fun. I'm very grateful to help out. Oh, thank you. And then we have uh, Chris and Ian. Um, highlights. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to see how long it would take Claire to see it. Oh, no. Put me away, put me away. No, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. <laughs> oh, he bailed. <laughs> yeah, he came, there we go. So no, um, I've got a, one of my favorite things is when uh, Chris was changing my name last night during the tech rehearsal. <laughs> I think that was Ian. Oh, was it Ian? Uh, well, okay. Look at Ian. No, <laughs> that was Chris, huh? 
Because I do stuff like this. Ooh. <laughs> nice. Um, Ian, your, your highlight? Um, what's the scariest thing you've ever seen? Sorry, I was just reading. I think I might have. Like, I clicked like, that. A question. Oh. Uh, um, my highlight. Um, yeah, I'd say the shorts. Um, the everything that Norm pulled together was just absolutely amazing. Um, screaming room is one of the rooms I can never. I can't even like sneak into the screaming room with how crazy it is because I don't want to distract in the middle of a short like leaving a room because sometimes I can pop into a panel here or there for five or ten minutes, but you don't really want to interrupt that way. So it was great being able to uh, see those. Um, yes, but when you have pipe and drape, that it's okay. Yeah, the door noises. I just, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> and then also, like, I have to be listening to radio. You know, like, I try to avoid performances, too. So, you know, all of a sudden hear somebody calling for me on the radio. <laughs> Um, but, yeah. Poltergeist, yeah, and Poltergeist and Paramours. Oh my gosh, those clips were awesome. It was yes. so great to see all the different Amalia's um, fashions and all the diff the models mm -hmm. that oh everyone was so beautiful and everyone looked so great. And it was it was that was really another highlight for me as well. Uh, if you're watching this on your uh, obviously you are watching this, but if you're watching this live uh, and you want to let us know what your favorite moment from today was, please comment on it. And please leave it as a comment. Norm, uh, good job pulling together some great shorts, but uh, what was your highlight of the day? Well, um, I, honestly, I just I just liked being able to, like, like Claire was saying, uh, just connect and be with my people even though I can't be there physically uh, and just feel that Halloween spirit. Um, you know, everybody, you guys did a great job. I'm I'm just oh, overwhelmed with all the love on Twitter and on at the comments and and another point that I have to uh, bring up is that I I didn't do the screaming room alone. I have an amazing team of Brian Toll, Eric, and Amantha Ryan, Jessica Moreno, Adrian Reese. They're they're all helping screen all of these movies and uh, bringing up the cream of the crop so that we we have these great things to show you. And it's just, yeah. So would not be doing that alone. As far as as far as uh, another highlight, I really like Jeff Poli's uh, interview earlier with the scary Disney lady. Oh yes, that was fun. Yeah, Veris uh, Veris Strange. Yes, yes, Veris Strange the she goes by. But yeah, those books are great and fun. Uh, the Disney Chills books. Um, it we, almost really made me want to look at Disney again. And I, I'm just gonna like we're always we always nerd out to work with the people that come to Midsummer Screen and having Disney Publishing uh, reach out to us to do something um, has been great and, and Rick helped bring them bring them our way so um, yeah it's, that was pretty cool Rick did, did I already ask you what your favorite part was of the day no not yet go I've for been it waiting with bated breath this is like the Brady Bunch <laughs> it this is just like the Brady just like the Brady Bunch right. <laughs> Looking around, um, you know, oh, I, I think hi. that uh, to me, I think that the, the oh, highlight is just knowing that our entire community is intact and that the spirit is alive, no matter what's going on is around us in the world. Um, I really did. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with Gary. I really loved that that old mill dark ride. That's really fantastic. Those well, that was are, great for for a theme park nerd. That's pretty awesome because those are those are like a dying part of of our industry. And so those historical old rides are just a, a joy when you get to see them. And that was really awesome. And uh, no, just, I mean, of course, talking to the hunters, that's, that's right now I'd be in the hall of shadows with them, you know, checking things out and making sure everything was good with, with Ian and Michelle and, and uh, sadly we're not there today, but uh, having everybody online with us was really wonderful. And uh, just being able to do this is, is, is a joy and, um, Next year, we're going to come back bigger and better than anybody is prepared for. We also, can I interject? Richard and Justin have also been helping all day. Hang on, I'm trying to get them in here. Uh, try again. Uh, uh, I will say one highlight is my feet and legs don't hurt nearly as much. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <clears throat> I let, we have a couple of fun comments here. We've got Amanda Mathias. My favorite moment was all of it. 
Um, uh, Isabella Rivas, my favorite moment was everything but to be specific. I really loved the short film of the portrait of a lady and Barry, LOL. Um, I love Samuel Martinez says, I loved all the home haunt updates. Uh, Hendel Thistlehop, love to be able to go back and watch Screaming Room clips again. Yeah. And let's see, Rich Baron, <laughs> Brett Hobel. Oh, he's talking about the hot dark ride. Yeah, we had a lot of thank yous. It was uh, Sam C. Courses. Today was so much fun. And we to see you all in Long Beach next year. And that's exactly how we feel. Yeah. Yeah, anybody want to know my favorite part? Richard, the Justin, hotline. you guys can pop that. What down. is your favorite yeah. part? Richard and Justin come. Well, while we're waiting for Richard and Justin to come on. Oh, here they are. I'm in. I Almost. There hey. they are. Ooh. Hello. Wow. Hey. 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 Has been the show floor manager since we began and has made the show floor oh. a highlight. I think that's why our show floor our vendors are, are, are happy because they're taken care of. Uh, he just sets a good tone for when people show up. Um, so really excited always to work with Richard and Justin who, who work arm in arm to make that happen. Thanks for helping out today as well and kind of moving up and being stage managers uh, behind the scenes. Can you hear us? I think they're on the lag. And they're also very quiet. Technology. <laughs> I mean, honestly, uh, yeah, I can hear you guys. Part. Can you hear us? Yes. yes. Now I can hear you. <laughs> I was just saying nice things about you, Rick and Justin. Uh, but I'm never going <laughs> to. I'm usually quiet. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having us. <laughs> Rick and Justin, what, what, is your, what was your favorite part of today? <laughs> Um, we'll guess. We will guess. But uh, seriously, for me, it, it was putting, I mean, working with you guys is always what I love. I mean, really seeing us. Uh, I think uh, my favorite part would be, and then also juggling everything behind the scenes with the rest of the crew. <laughs> Exactly. Well, that's why we have you there. <laughs> we have about we have about two minutes. Good at it too. But yeah, Midsummer Scream is put together the, by uh, the people you're seeing here and a few others. It, you know, I think that we make an event that looks a lot bigger than it is, but we mostly make it from our homes. Um, only a few of us work on it full time a year, but the rest of it is, is this amazing crew that comes in to help um, just, just make it happen. Um, and uh, I can't thank you guys enough for jumping on board again this year to do something totally different, something none of us, you know, are really trained for um, and made it go, I, I think, pretty good. I had a blast. Um, and uh, thanks, everybody. Oh, for and what about Connor and Buster? Oh, Buster Balloon with his baby. Um, and the crafts, all that glitter. Oh, my gosh. I love her. Yeah, Connor with the always does a kid section uh with buster and then uh jeff DePoli pulled together some cool panels there with uh you know the hocus pocus crew um you know i no matter what we're gonna forget some people um what was that Twitter? somebody's watching so something much feedback <laughs> i know it's kind of funny oh well but uh you know uh let's just give a, a last thank you to everyone i go through i'm gonna go through the top here jackie Give a goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ian, any last comments? Uh, no, stay scary, stay safe. All right. How about you, Chris? I'm good. Bye. <laughs> ready for food? Take us off. <laughs> Keep the floor. Emily? Nothing for me. Chris, I removed you so you can queue up um, the thing. He's going to queue up some stuff. Uh, Gary? Um, all the seats are technically full still. Oh, okay. I'll hang out. Okay. Uh, Norm, any final comments? Yeah, it was you know a great what? day. Uh, really enjoyed Ooh. everything. And uh, thanks. Norm, any final comments? Thank you, Gary.
Norm? Just, uh, again, thank you for putting this together. Uh, my haunt family, my haunt community, I love you guys. And filmmakers and haunters, keep creating. You got this. We're going to see you in 2021. With that, I'm going to make some room in here. Thank so, you, Norm. Bye, you guys. Just, Richard and Justin. Thank you, Norm. Send an email, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> it, we'll read it later. I can't tell if it's stream frozen or anyway. I think, I think uh, their their viewing stream is on a lag. Okay. Uh, Rick. Uh, yeah, Rick, you want to yeah. give a final goodbye? Yeah, just thank you for everybody that's given us your day to hang out with us. Uh, again, we are all missing you like crazy, and sorry we're not in Long Beach with you right now. But next year, bigger and better. And until then, uh, stay safe and just love one another because the world certainly needs a whole lot of that right now. Absolutely. Claire? Yeah, I just want to say thanks again for everybody that participated. We love this creepy crew, and we love all of you guys. We're so excited to get to have this opportunity to kind of hang out and spend some time. And, uh, yeah, keep wearing those masks. I mean, it's Halloween. We wear them anyway. Sorry, I had a little fruit fly. I don't know what's going on. Uh, <laughs> so, it's, yeah, it's not like that. All right. So, anyway, yeah, thank you, guys. All right. And uh, I'm going to do one final look here at... Uh, did we hit uh, get a bit over on Give Butter on our money? But uh, yeah, I can. Let's see where are we at? Yes, we got the over four thousand in the last twenty Woo! minutes. Yes. Yay! <laughs> Donate. Go to midsummerscream. dot org forward slash live. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, everybody, for being part of it and being part of the whole Halloween community. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we hope to see you live in person next year at Midsummer Scream, August, sorry, sorry July 9th to 11th. We're gonna make Halloween earlier next year because I think we really need that. Um, but we will, yes. yep. the Halloween does not die because of quarantine. We will still find ways to celebrate, <clears throat> you know, with all these home haunters and whatever else we do. So thank you for joining us. Have a good night. All right, uh, we're gonna play you off actually. Uh, I got the lyric video for Skeleton Sam by Lovecraft. All right. Thanks for watching the stream, guys. Lovecraft. <laughs> we gather here for this special occasion. One night only in limited engagement. So stomp your feet and clap your hands for Skeleton Sam and his graveyard. Fan. I was just a little ghoul when I heard his name. He's the graveyard legend of the dancing game. Rumor has it he invented how to knock him dead He's the reason that we all say break a leg When the sun goes down, all the ghosts come out Zombies rise up from the ground Monsters come from all the lands Just to see the bones of a skeleton sand Yeah.